because rather, whether this is going to be good for streaming or not, um, it's at least good for uh, Zoom calls, it seems like. And so that should be good enough. Um, what's up, everybody? I'm your host, Dave McCarricker, here at Theory Underground. Today, we are joined by a co-host, uh, Nance. Nance, how you doing, man? Doing great. Beautiful day. Beautiful day. Nice and hot. Nice and hot. So we're going to dive in here to some Rene Descartes, and I want to preface the exegetical reading portion of this with uh, a little little bit of meta-commentary because um, I wouldn't be surprised if a person goes, well, who cares what Descartes has to say? And I wouldn't be surprised... Uh, if, even if you're in the uh, the course for being in time, I would not be surprised if you're thinking, yeah, 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 but we're, we're deconstructing this guy. We're critiquing him. Like, what do we really need to do here? And it's a complicated answer. It's a complicated problem. Um, and I kind of want to just start by saying, Nance, what is your impression of Descartes? Or at least maybe what you said earlier before you were listening to this. So, before I kind of jumped into to the discourse, I was like, "Oh yeah, whatever." You know, he's he's a a silly, silly one of those silly olden timey folks um, who believes that God is, um, you know, in charge of everything, and he's an idealist and blah blah blah. But he also kind of invented this, uh, I guess, this critical method. and whatever. I was just like, yeah, whatever. Descartes' background. Um, and like this morning I was texting you like, yeah, like I, I've definitely, my view has changed um, just on like the 50 pages or whatever I had, had been able to get throughout the time of this. Um, it's not so cut and dry of like, just write him off. Like he kind of does something um, that at the time was new and he did lay a foundation and the people that came after him are resting on that foundation. And at the very least, it's worth like paying homage, if not like doing your own, you know, quick survey of that foundation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and speaking of that survey of the foundation, that foundation is us, it's in us, it's so deep embedded in us that it will not even seem like it's a big deal to read the dis- to read his discourse on method is to basically read a more well elaborated sophisticated and articulated um, version of something that most people already believe um, so that 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 should tell you why why it matters, why we should take him so seriously. Um, fuck. Just realized we have a problem. I think I might have to start the recording over again. Let me double check. So I had to move computers and get set up over here, and it's a huge pain in the butt. Uh, no, we're good. Okay, good. But basically, every time I move the workshop, so to speak, you know, it's, it's like a new space that I'm in. Um, and, and it's not just the new space, it's the new internet speed, uh, irregularities. Um, it's the new everything, everything's different every time. And it, it always throws me for a loop. And so this is the new space. Check it out. Um, I would pick up the camera and show you all around, but it's, this camera is too complicated. I don't want to mess anything up. So for right now, this is a place that is being built. It's obviously not the place that I was building on my channel uh, last year because that place fell through, which is why Anne and I ultimately decided to say, fuck it, we're done with Idaho. We're going to go to Europe and blow all of our savings and then work in Mexico and live super uh, below the radar uh, and below... um, any kinds of means that we're used to living 
God. And we, we, we live cheap already, but, you know, we can live even cheaper in Mexico. And so we were, and it was great. It was a wonderful experience. But all of this embodied stuff um, doesn't really matter for our purposes in the moment, but it's kind of a, a cute little tie into something that we'll be touching on because, you know, one of the points when you're using Heidegger to critique Descartes is to say, like, you know, you read these meditations where he's in solitude, he's sitting with a fire stove, like a wood stove, and he's got a candle on the wood stove, and he's doing, like, this whole, you know, oh, what can I really know, and, and, and stripping away everything that he doesn't know for certain, and then building back up on top of all of that. And it's really easy for philosophers who are already kind of, if not autistic, just way off in their heads, you know, kind of just generally speaking, we are not normies, right? Like no philosopher is a normie and whatever's, I I don't know if I should call it autism or not. Like I, whatever it is, it's, we're in our heads a lot and we, we don't relate socially, um, in all the same ways that normal people do. And we can complicate these terms and think about it in a lot of different ways. I'm just speaking in a, in a sort of simplistic, broad brush way. And that is to say that uh, it's really easy for philosopher types to read the meditations kind of as the point of departure for modern philosophy. So if you don't read almost anything else in a philosophy class, you'll probably get a taste of the meditations. It's probably just going to be an excerpt, if not the entire thing. Lucky, by the way, if you do actually read the entire thing. But None of it's mind-blowing. None of it's, like, uh, totally out of left field. None of it feels, like, um, uh, that far out because, I mean, really, he's speaking the common sense of everybody in that classroom already. And so depending on how it's taught, the chances are uh, you're going to read it and go, well, whenever you actually get what he's saying, you'll go, well, yeah, duh. And then the rest of the time you'll be like, oh, but why is he still trying to make an argument for God, though? Like, I thought he was some kind of celebrator of the sciences, though. And so I, that's why I think that it's really important to spend a little bit of time in a meta conversation talking about his worldhood, right? So if we're going to critique him from this Heideggerian position, we have to think about his worldhood. The fact that he was an embodied human being uh, who actually had to think um, not just about what he was going to write, um, not just trying to think about what is true, but also having to think about if he wasn't careful about how he said things, he might actually get killed or exiled, which back then in an honor-based society would be on the, about on the level of, you know, being sentenced to death. And so Rene Descartes is the father of modern philosophy, but he's also a product of modernity. The printing press was invented in, I'm looking at my notes here, I'm not going to pretend that I'm a historian, but I've got my notes. The printing press was invented in 1450, blew up over the next five years, and then in a rapid amount of time, like a short period of time, basically within 50 years, uh, the printing press made it possible to sell books as a commodity, okay, which meant that they were able to be widely distributed. Luce, Lu, uh, Martin Luther's theses, uh, his 95 theses, I think they were, this is a 95? Yeah, his 95 theses, which kicked off the Protestant Reformation, came basically 67 years after uh, 1450, which was the invention of the printing press. So it took took about 50 years for the printing press to actually set up the book printing industry. And then 17 years after the industry was really going, the Protestant Reformation takes place. Okay, And that's before Descartes. Okay. That's also before Machiavelli. Machiavelli comes along with his prince and his discourses um, in 1532. So uh, basically another uh, 17 or thir- wait, how, many, how many years is this? It doesn't matter. About 15 years after Martin Luther puts up his theses and kicks off the Protestant Reformation comes along Machiavelli 
with his treatise on uh, basically modern political philosophy. He kicks off modern political philosophy, um, which is a sort of self-conscious, sort of cynical, opportunistic approach to power. Now, with Descartes, there is, of course, the suspicious reading that says he's writing under censorship. He's actually wants to expose power and show what it is and so he takes on the I'm on the side of power because he would have never been able to publish otherwise approach. Now this is a hermeneutical method, reading with this kind of suspicion. Um, it's a good thing to assume in a society where people get hung, drawn, and quartered after being tortured for days on end uh, because they did a, a blasphemy or a treason. right? And so Socrates was put to death and then Plato wrote the Republic and so we already have that suspicious reading of the Republic at least we should have that suspicious reading of the Republic that says yeah we're going to we're going to pretend we're honoring the thing while actually unmasking it right so we get that in the Plato's Republic we get that in Machiavelli's The Prince and we should also take that approach to Descartes who was writing only uh, like a hundred years after Machiavelli's The Prince, right? About a hundred years after the Protestant Reformation. So the book industry is, a speci- is, a, is officially like a well-established industry. And when Descartes is writing, um, he's writing at the time of Francis Bacon and uh, a Galilee guy, which is what, Galileo. Yeah, Galilee guy. The Galilee guy. <laughs> um, what was what was Galileo's full name? Do you know off the top of your head? It's messing me up. No, I don't. It's oh, it's Galileo Galilee. So that's why I messed up. <laughs> I was like, the that's Gal- what I thought, but then I second guessed it. I was like, wait, that can't be it. Yeah, it's a really weird name, but uh, Galileo Galilee. Um, he got in trouble for his physics uh, at, at about the time that Descartes and Francis Bacon were really getting going. So these three are the thinkers of, of modern science. Um, obviously, you can say, well, what about Copernicus? What about Isaac Newton? Well, and of course, um, those guys laid the basis for Bacon, Descartes, and uh, Galilee. It's just weird to call him by his last name, I guess. It's kind of weird. Nobody calls him by his last name. Everyone just calls him Galileo. But um, basically, Galileo got canceled, okay? He was – there was obviously a lot of uh, suppression of Protestantism and suppression of any kind of free thought. And everything coming from the sciences was being looked at under a microscope – or a magnifying glass, I guess I should say, for any kind of, well, deviation from what the church was saying. And so Galileo got in a lot of trouble, and Descartes writing at the same time. And Descartes, like everybody else who had more than a P between his ears, was trying to make sense of the fact that it seems to, you know, it, with all the developments of, sci- of science at the time, it seemed beyond a shadow of a doubt, certain that the church was wrong about some things. Um, And so, you know, the question for us is not, was he um, pro-religion or not? It's, it's, the question is, is we, we know for a fact, if we read him, we know for a fact that Descartes wanted church and state to do, to have like a, a, a sort of symbiotic relationship where they both kind of could respect one another. I think the most important question, did I just say we don't have to ask if he's a God-fearing man? Because basically, actually, I I meant the opposite. For me, the the problem really is trying to figure out, does he want religion to kind of take care of, you know, the stupid people and science to be able to do like the its thing over here? Or does he actually believe in his religion and he just thinks, well, the church has got it wrong? Right, so like there's this conflict of the church has it wrong, but yeah, it still seems like God actually set things in order versus the church has got it wrong. God's probably full of shit too, whether he's real or not. Um, And 
It just needs to stop getting in the way of science. All of these questions are questions that we should be asking and thinking about as we read through this because the very end of this this entire this discourse which this this shows is uh, 39 pages it's not they're really really easy pages this is not like reading um, Heidegger or Deleuze in fact this isn't even like reading his meditations this is like reading him talking about how he thinks about things this is more like reading a biography but in the in the in, the, in section six he's basically talking about how he couldn't publish his meditations he couldn't publish his meditations because at about the time that he was getting ready to publish them and he thought oh these are going to be fire everyone's going to love this it's going to be the hot topic and it's going to really help a lot of people figure out what's going on um Galileo Galilei was taken in for the Inquisition or whatever was going on in this situation. Do you know the details about this? I mean, we all we all kind of vaguely know, but do you know any of the details off the top of your head or are you as vague on it as I am? Yeah, I broad strokes. Inquisition. I don't even know if it was a part. I don't think we can call it the Inquisition. What, what was it? Court, judge, what was the... What's the actual issue? I want to read off a piece from the... Uh, I want to read a piece of the controversy because it was such a big deal at the time that it made it so that any scientific thinking person was scared. Was scared of uh, having done to them what happened to Galileo. And Galileo recanted, right? He was for- Yeah, he was forced to forced to recant so he did publicly um but i think he did it with a like a wink of the eye um yeah that's how everyone talks about it yeah yeah and it was it was it was like a big deal so yeah, Galileo was called to Bellarmine's residence and ordered to abandon completely the opinion that the sun stands still at the center of the world and the earth moves, and henceforth not to hold, teach, or defend it in any way whatever, either orally or in writing. The decree of the congregation of the index banned Copernicus's De Revolutionibus and other, the revolutions, and other heliocentric works until correction. Right? So anyway, um, this this meditation is something that was put out, uh, or I, I'm sorry, not the meditation. This this discourse on method was something put out um, anonymously. So Descartes had it circulate before he actually attached his name to it um, because he was living under fear, and he wanted to kind of spread the word that hey, there's a very a very big brained approach to things that can kind of allow the peaceful coexistence of church and science. So it was published in 1637, and then only five years later, four years later, he published the meditations. But that was like right before he died. So he died in 1650. Originally, he wasn't even going to publish the meditations until he was dead, but I think he decided, ah, fuck it. So the fact that he had to really think so hard about publishing at all in the first place uh, and the fact that he was worried about people who do science, people who do philosophy um, being censored means that he is self-censoring throughout this piece as we read it. And so I think that it's just fascinating to read a piece like that, and a piece like this, and keep that in mind. I also think that this is how we should be thinking about writing for ourselves. Because if we don't have to write like this today, the neo-feudal world that we are quickly moving into makes it so that we will have to. Um, maybe not write this way, but we should be thinking about like how how does it apply today? How what 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 might we learn from this that can be brought into our current 
world. So um, I just realized maybe you could, uh, Nance, share the screen if you're able to pull it up. I can share with you the document if that would help. Um, but I, I just realized that's going to be helpful because I'm going to want to go grab a bite to eat at some point in the next hour while we're doing this. Yeah, the PDF I have is a really crappy one. Right, um, let me uh, let me get you the link here. I mean, I could share the one I have, but it's a crappy scan. No, no, no. I've got a great one. It's wonderful. I'm gonna send it out, send it to you on Theory Underground. Theory Underground, man. The fucking app for this is such a pain in the butt. I have to input every one of the courses and every one of the tiers as a separate thing um, on the back end of Apple, on the back end of Android, and on the back end of WordPress. And then I have to link them all up, and they're not even linking up. So I spent all this time trying to get it done. And then I was trying to link them up after I finally got it done. And I was like, oh my god, there's so many things I'd rather be doing right now. And then to, to hear Descartes talking about how he's like talking about the importance of his leisure time so that he's able to do what he does here and, and how he can't be distracted by all these other kinds of things. And I was just thinking, man, <laughs> if he had any idea. All right. I sent it to you on Theory Underground. I'll read the uh, two paragraphs here while you get set up. The cultural turn that symbolically and philosophically separates Aristotle slash medieval views from the modern era can be found in Descartes' writings. Born just before 1600, he witnessed and participated in the beginnings of modern science, especially with its empirical mechanistic description of the motion of the universe in terms of the scientific notion of cause and effect alone. The image of the universe is that of a machine or mechanism that runs according to its construction and cannot deviate from it. And mathematical... This is a terrible... Oh, sorry. I'm going to actually... There's a bunch of brackets throughout this. I'm going to try to... Okay. Okay. So he participated in the beginnings of modern science, especially its empirical, mechanistic, and mathematical undergirding. The discourse on method is, to some extent, an autobiography of an individual's evolution from the old system to the new. This text was formally the first of his publications around mid-1637. However, it shows indications of being written perhaps 10 years earlier. He claims he is not intending to reveal the method, but only to reveal how I have tried to direct my own mind. Much of the method is applied in the meditations, but here it is more historically positioned. It is important to remember that this text contains elements that were highly controversial at the time, views which even contributed to Galileo's house arrest under the Inquisition in 1633. So it was under the Inquisition and it was in 1633. So definitely around the time that he's coming into his own as an intellectual. And I guess the, the last thing I want to say about this hermeneutics of suspicion, you know, this approach that says we're not going to just read it at face value. I think part of the reason everybody reads it at face value in the United States especially is because they're taught to think that worldview curation is what philosophy is all about. They're taught to think that it's about having a set of opinions, right? Um, but if your fundamental task is trying to understand and pursue, understand what the world and the self is, and then pursue truth, it's not the same thing as just curating your opinions, right? And so because people have like this approach, it's like the debate approach. To philosophy, they think, oh, it's just about having opinions. Um, that's how they read them. But you got to remember, this. Oh, it's my opinion. I have the right to believe whatever I want. It's my opinion. It's my opinion. Belief, belief, belief. That's a weird sort of symptom of 
the American situation and this kind of fixation on a very specific uh, definition of freedom, right? Uh, the definition of freedom that says you're entitled to your opinion so that every time you exercise your opinion in front of other people, you feel like you just did a freedom pull up or something like, you know, you just, you just, you know, did a salute and shot a rifle or something, you know, and everyone's like, wow, you have opinions. Great job. But yeah. that's, that's never been what philosophy is. <laughs> It's so funny to think that that's how people read philosophy, though. And that's how I was reading the De Descartes' meditations. When I read Descartes the first time, I was reading him to see, well, is this my guy? Does he lay out the worldview that is more or less going to be my worldview? And that's how I read him. And uh, it's just, it's just, it won't do. And so I'm going to share with you the screen share button here and quit this, just quit my screen share. Hold on, folks. We'll have it set up here in a second. Oh, perfect. Yeah, there we go. So let's see. Boom. Cool. Let's skip the commentary and get straight to it. Straight in. Yeah. I'd rather hear from his elegant self than their little summary. All right. Part one, some thoughts on the sciences. Boom. Oh, hold on. Good sense is mankind's most equitably divided endowment, for everyone thinks that he is so abundantly provided with it that even those most difficult to please in other ways do not usually want more than they have of this. As it is not likely that everyone is mistaken, this evidence shows that the ability to, to judge correctly and to distinguish the true from the false, which is really what is meant by good sense or reason, is the same by nature in all men and that differences of opinion are not due to differences in intelligence, but merely to the fact that we use different approaches and consider different things. For it is not enough to have a good mind, one must use it well. The greatest souls are capable of the greatest vices as well as of the greatest virtues, and those who walk slowly can, if they follow the right path, go much further, farther than those who run rapidly in the wrong direction. As for myself, I have never supposed that my mind was above the ordinary. On the contrary, I have often wished to have as quick a wit or as clear and distinct an imagination or as ready and retentive a memory as another person. And I know of no other qualities which make for a good mind, because as far as reason is concerned, it is the only thing which makes us men and distinguishes us from the animals, and I am therefore satisfied that it is fully present in each one of us. In this I follow the general opinion of philosophers, who say that there are differences in degree only in the accidental qualities and not in the essential qualities or natures of individuals of the same species. But I do not hesitate to claim the good fortune of having stumbled in my youth upon certain paths which led me to certain considerations and maxims from which I formed a method of gradually increasing my knowledge and of improving my abilities as much as the mediocrity of my talents and the shortness of my life will permit. That's for I have yes. already had so so right there everything about oh we've got this equal distribution of good sense and every it's a really rhetorically clever way of opening things because one of the first things people do is like oh my god somebody who's been sitting around doing nothing while we are all doing stuff thinks that he knows so much and so of course he starts off with like something to really like lay to rest people's Disease with the fact that he's made some discoveries. And so he spends the first two paragraphs trying to get people to not get mad at him for saying that he's made some discoveries. He's like, look, everybody has an equal distribution of good sense because if you ever met somebody who thinks that they don't, no. So of course they do. 
<laughs> he's just like <laughs> I like it though like I think um, obviously that's like a like a caveat um, and, and it's kind of like paving the way and apologizing up front which is going to allow him to kind of do a slam dunk later but also I like the idea like at taking that at face value like yeah sure um I'm a fucking moron, and and I know that, but like, um, I think it's nice to be reminded because we all also tend to really believe that we are smart and we do have some special intelligence. And I mm-hmm. I do think it's worth coming coming uh, back to and sitting with the fact that no, we're all fucking morons, um, and we might be onto something, but that doesn't change the fact that. You know, we get carried away sometimes, and I like it. I lo- well, one of the best things about this is that when you read it and you keep these multiple things, even if at any point he is just uh, it, there's nothing rhetorical about it, he's just speaking from his heart. It's it endears me to him, so it's really like I I, I like him more for that and then it's like oh but if he actually is having to do this rhetoric thing because otherwise people are going to be insulted and want to knock him down a notch and he doesn't want that that also endears me to him because he's he's had to think about that and anybody who wants to talk about big ideas has to think about that because ultimately you know you end up rubbing people wrong because they think you're trying to get up on your high horse and say they're dumb right and I, and I think that he's right uh, as far as it goes that, uh, yeah, individuals of the same species share the essential qualities, right? Like we yeah. all share the essential qualities that make us human. Um, and then there's just differences in degree when it comes to other things. And if he's pointing out a person might have a really fast, like inquisitive, intelligent mind – but then still be a complete moron because they don't cultivate their thinking. They don't use a method. And so this is the this is the key to why you need a method is because you can be a complete dumbass, but as long as you've got a great method, you're gonna go you're gonna go a lot further than the person who's a genius but doesn't have any kind of method. And so his he's basically saying he's got no no problem claiming to that to have stumbled by good fortune in his youth upon certain paths that led him to certain considerations and maxims that were the basis for how he formed a method that has helped him gradually increase his knowledge and improve his abilities, right? And so he wants to share that with us. How sweet. And then at the end, actually, at the end in the, in the section six, he'll actually, he'll say that he, he's like, I hope that people will know better than to trust the things that other people say about me because I've learned to know better than to take anybody at their word when they're telling me what somebody else believes or says. And he's like, he's like, even if I tell somebody straightforward like what I believe and, then I, and, and they seem to get it in the moment, they turn around and then tell somebody else what it is that I say. And I can't even, I say, I can't, I can't even take responsibility for this. They're telling something completely, it's different. It's not actually something that I'll own up to because it's not my position. And I think that everyone experiences that. And so because we've all experienced it, um, we should keep in mind the same thing is true of Descartes, right? Um, just because he's one of the big names doesn't mean we should be less sympathetic to him than we are to ourselves considering the fact that, yeah, uh, having a bigger name ultimately just means that people take your name and run around and it's a, sca- it's a can of spray paint they use to do whatever they want to do for the rest of their lives, right? So it's like, yeah. So I, I like it too. Now, with that said, though, I'm going to listen and go make some food while you kind of just keep reading, man, because you're doing a great job at the door here and – Uh, You can stop and comment on it whenever you want, and I'll be back soon. Cool. For I I have already had such results that although in self-judgment, I try to lean rather toward undervaluation than to presumption, I cannot escape a feeling of extreme satisfaction with the progress I believe I have already made in the search for truth. 
in brackets for Descartes, truth is a matter of clear and distinct perceptions. Those ideas that are the product of clear and distinct mental perceptions are true. And although from the philosopher's viewpoint, almost all the activities of men appear to me as vain and useless, yet I conceive such hopes for the future that if some single one of the occupations of men as men should be truly good and important, I dare to believe that it is the one I have chosen. It is always possible that I am wrong and that I am mistaking a bit of copper and glass for gold and diamonds. I, I now... I know both subject how I know how subject we are to making false judgments in things that concern ourselves and how much we ought to mistrust the judgments of our friends when they are in our own favor. But I should be glad to show in this discourse what are the paths I have taken and to present a sketch of my life so that each one can form his own judgment of it. In this way, I may learn from the opinions of those who read it, and thus add another to my methods of progress, which I am accustomed to use. So it is not my intention to present a method which everyone ought to follow in order to think well, but only to show how I have made the attempt myself. Those who counsel others must consider themselves superior to those whom they counsel, and if they fall short in the least detail, they are to blame. I only propose this writing as an autobiography, or if you prefer, as a story in which you may possibly find some examples of conduct which you might see fit to imitate, as well as several others which you would have no reason to follow. I hope that it will prove useful to some, to some without being harmful to any, and that all will take my frankness, frankness kindly. Um, so yeah, it's more... caveats but that's kind of unavoidable and he is kind of saying focus on the method in the army there's this saying slow is smooth smooth is fast um and that kind of again goes to the uh you can be a moron but if you have a standard operating procedure um then you will be more likely to be successful than some brilliant genius who's just freewheeling and and running around and trying to showboat. From my childhood, I lived in a world of books, and since I was taught that by their help I could gain a clear and assured knowledge of everything useful in life, I was eager to learn from them. But as soon as I had finished the course of studies, which usually admits one to the ranks of the learned, I changed my opinion completely. For I have found myself saddled with so many doubts and errors that I seem to have gained nothing in trying to educate myself unless it was to discover more and more fully how ignorant I was. Nevertheless, I had been in one of the most celebrated schools in Europe, where I thought there should be wise men if wise men existed anywhere on earth. I had learned there everything that others learned, and not satisfied with merely the knowledge that was taught, I had perused as many books as I could find which contained more unusual and recondite knowledge. I also knew the opinions of others about myself and that I was in no way judged inferior to my fellow students, even though several of them were preparing to become professors. And finally, it did not seem to me that our own times were less flourishing and fertile than were any of the earlier periods. All this led me to conclude that I could judge others by myself and to decide that there was no such wisdom in the world as I had previously hoped to find. I did not, however, cease to value the disciplines of the schools. I knew what the languages which one learns there are necessary to understand the works of the ancients, and that the delicacy of fiction enlivens the mind, that famous deeds of history ennoble it and, if read with understanding, aid in maturing one's judgment, that the reading of all the great books is like conversing with the best people of earlier times. It is even a studied conversation in which the authors show us only the best of their thoughts, that eloquence has incomparable powers and beauties, that poetry has enchanting delicacy and sweetness, that mathematics has very subtle processes which can serve as much to satisfy the inquiring mind as to aid all the arts and to diminish man's labor, that treatises on morals contain very useful teachings and exhortations to virtue, that theology teaches us how to go to heaven, that philosophy teaches us how to talk with an appearance of truth about all things, and to make ourselves admired by the less learned, that law, medicine, and the other sciences bring honors and wealth to those who pursue them. And finally, that it is desirable to have examined all of them, 
even to the most superstitious and false, in order to recognize their real worth and avoid being deceived thereby. Damn, this is like... Um... very modern um and and also like very relevant contemporaneously to like what's going on right now like all these things are still true um and i'm the the problems that i can infer that he is seeing in his time those problems have only gotten worse gotten more ubiquitous and and fallen further from people's focus and attention um, it's like nobody listened to Descartes. Everybody was just like, oh, look at that fancy French guy. Um, whatever, never mind. Let's go to the opera. Let's go to war. Let's do some opium. And shit just got worse. But I thought that I had already spent enough time on languages and even on reading the works of the ancients and their histories and fiction. For conversing with the ancients, ancients is much like traveling. It is good to know something of the customs of various peoples in order to judge our own more objectively and so that we do not make the mistakes of the untraveled in supposing that everything contrary to our customs is ridiculous and irrational. But when one spends too much time traveling, one becomes at, at last a stranger at home, and those who are too interested in things which occurred in past centuries are often remarkably ignorant of what is going on today. In addition, fiction makes us imagine a number of of events as possible which are really impossible and even the most faithful histories if they do not alter or embroider episodes to make them more worth reading almost always omit the meanest and least illustrious circumstances so that the remainder is distorted thus it happens that those who regulate their behavior by the examples they find in books are apt to fall into the extravagances of the knights of romances and undertake projects which it is beyond their ability to complete complete it's like uh, all the like Marcus Aurelius bo bros who are like, yeah, I, I'm going to be a stoic. This is super cool. And then they all kind of either turn into just ineffectual morons or like toxic dude bros. Um, it's because they're like, oh, let's let's emulate these great historical men. Um, but they're Im they're imitating fiction and they and they don't seem to care about that they're just like or like uh like this idea of chivalry and like um or uh like falling in love with the princess and like oh you're the prince charming and she's you know your one true love and all this shit like we we believe in these s supposedly historical paradigms and um and examples um but all the like record and evidence and histories, um, they take out all the the re the real shit. Like they don't include the the details that that fill out these kind of tropes or whatever and and make them real in their time. Like it's like watching a movie, and if you watched a movie and then try to go act like the characters in the movie, you're gonna fail. I esteemed eloquence highly and loved poetry, but I felt that both were gifts of nature rather than fruits of study. Those who reason most cogently and work over their thoughts to make them clear and intelligible are always the most persuasive, even if they speak only a provincial dialect and have never studied rhetoric. Those who have the most agreeable imaginations and can express their thoughts with the most grace and color cannot fail to be the best poets, even if the poetic art is unknown to them. I was especially pleased with mathematics because of the certainty and self-evidence of its proofs, but I did not yet see its true usefulness and thinking that it was good only for the mechanical arts, I was astonished that nothing more noble had been built on so firm and solid a foundation. On the other hand, I compared the ethical writings of the ancient pagans to very superb and magnificent palaces built only on mud and sand. They laud the virtues and make them appear more desirable than anything else in the world but they give no adequate criterion of virtue, and often what they call by such a name is nothing but apathy, parasite, pride, or despair. I, I 
revered our theology and hoped as much as anyone else to get to heaven. But having learned on great authority that the road was just as open to the most ignorant as to the most learned, and that the truths of revelation which lead thereto are beyond our understanding, I would not, not have dared to submit them to the weakness of my reasonings. I thought that to succeed in their examination, it would be necessary to have some extraordinary assistance from heaven and to be more than a man. I will say nothing of philosophy except that it has been studied for many situations centuries by the most outstanding minds without having produced anything which is not in dispute and consequently doubtful. I did not have enough presumption to hope to succeed better than the others, and when I noticed how many different opinions learned men may hold on the same subject, despite the fact that no more than one of them can ever be right, I resolved to consider almost as false any opinion which was merely plausible. Finally, when it came to the other branches of learning, since they took their cardinal pr principles from philosophy, I judged that nothing solid could have been built on so insecure a foundation. Neither the honor nor the profit to be, to be gained thereby sufficed to make me study them, for I was fortunately not in such a financial condition as to make it necessary to trade upon my learning. And though I was not enough of a cynic to despise fame, I was little concerned with that which I could only obtain on false pretenses. And finally, I thought I knew nothing of the disreputable doctrines. I thought I knew enough of the disreputable disreputable doctrines not to be taken in by the promises of an alchemist, the predictions of an astrologer, the impostures of a magician, or by the tricks and boasts of any of those who profess to know that which they do not know. This is why I, I gave up my studies entirely as soon as I reached the age when I was no longer under the control of my teachers. I resolved to seek no other knowledge than that which I might find within myself, or perhaps in the great book of nature. I spent a few years of my adolescence traveling, seeing courts and armies, living with people of di diverse types and situations of life, acquiring varied experience, testing myself in the episodes which fortune sent me, and above all, thinking about the things around me so that I could derive some profit from them. For it seemed to me that I might find much more of the truth in the cogitations which each man made on things which were important to him, and where he would be the loser if he judged badly than in the cogitations of a man of letters in his study concerned with speculations which produce no effect and which have no consequences to him except perhaps that the farther they are removed from common sense the more they titillate his vanity since then he needs so much more wit and skill to make them seem plausible besides i was always eager to learn to distinguish truth from falsehood so that i could make intelligent decisions about the affairs of this life it is true that while I did nothing but observe the customs of other men, I found nothing there to satisfy me, and I noted just about as much difference of opinion as I had previously remarked among philosophers. The greatest profit to me was, therefore, that I became acquainted with customs generally approved and accepted by other great peoples that would appear extravagant and ridiculous among ourselves. And so I learned not to believe too firmly what I learned only from example and custom. Also, I gradually freed myself from many errors which could obscure the light of nature and make us less capable of correct reasoning. But after spending several years in this, studying the book of nature and acquiring experience, I eventually reached the decision to study my own self and to employ all my abilities to try to choose the right path. This produced much better results in my case, I think, than would have been produced if I had never left my books and my country. Dun dun dun. So yeah. Got any thoughts on first, uh, part one? Um, yeah, I think my, my initial pass through, I was like, whatever, dude. Um, but it's not like whatever, dude. Like he, he really is kind of like prostrating himself before and saying like, no, I, I genuinely believe um, I'm a moron and all this shit is stupid and I don't want to be stupid anymore. Like I, mm. that's, to me, that's what this is. And I've been there so many times. Yeah. Yeah, and what you're calling caveats are these prostrations, right? Mm -hmm. Like, in, in a sort of sense where it's like a caveat almost... I was thinking about that word when I was inside. I was like, a caveat's like a... Like, a, you're adding clarification 
so that people don't get you wrong. So it is caveating that he's doing. But, but caveat is kind of a broader term that can be used for so many things. And it's like what he's doing is like an appeal, an actual explicit appeal where he's like, please don't take me wrong, guys. I really don't want you to hang, draw, and quarter me over this. I really think I really – he wants people to receive him. And it, this is one of the funny things about reading authors from like the sort of Victorian era – which is not quite his era, but like, you know, just like uh, in that era, like a lot of these authors kind of begin by addressing the reader and say, like, dear reader, you know, and, and they kind of, they they all kind of do this thing where they prostrate themselves before their, their readers. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it's kind of cool to see that we really are, are all living in, Descartes' head here. Because I don't think anybody who reads this can just... And now maybe I'll ruin it for the people who are getting it for the first time secondhand through us. But I don't think anybody who just read it on its own walked away from it being like, what a piece of shit. Fuck that guy. Instead, I think people walk away going, that's the picture of a, of a, of a sensible, intelligent humble gentleman, right? A true scholar and man of letters. Like in, in all of these senses, like they just go, oh, that's the picture. That's it right there. The archetype, you know? Yeah, very orthodox. And I don't mean that in a, I don't mean that as a slur, like. Now the other, the two things I want to touch on from this so there is that section where he's going through, he basically says something good about each of the sciences, and then he says why he was frustrated. And obviously, like, nobody's actual life is so cut and dry. He acted as though he graduates and then instantly realized, I'm not satisfied with this. <laughs> he kind of skips the part where he was probably sitting in classes going, the hell are they t teaching us you know what i mean like because the, these the the parts that he then critiques the limitations of all of these fields it's like that that's uh that's probably something he had to sit through and think about a long time before he was able to kind of pull it all together and i imagine that if he's saying something like you know poetry is actually not you're not a better poet because you studied poetry if you are a poet, it's in your nature, right? So he says that about a couple other disciplines as well. Um, I, I have to think that he was just sitting there and he was like, all these people who are nerding out over poetry are writing really bad poetry. All the rules that they keep telling us about how to write poetry aren't actually helping these people write very good poetry. And I'm not going to waste my fucking time outside of this assignment that I have to do. And the fact that he traveled a lot gave, gives him like this sense that, yeah, there are good orators who never studied rhetoric, right? So he's got like this, this sort of world wisdom that comes with having gotten around and, and realizing, yeah, you can be some kind of a provincial, mostly ignorant person who's still a good orator. And here they are teaching oration at the university. Is it even helping these people? Like... So it's cool that he's got like, but he also, he wants to take the positive from it. Then he wants to set up the, his critiques of it to basically say, look, I come from the best school. Uh, and when I was done, I was like, wow, really? Is this the situation? So he's, it's, it's like a, a critique of himself. It's a critique of everybody. Cause it's like, well, is this where the situation is currently at? It's not very good guys. You can take it from me. <clears throat> But of course, he also doesn't use that you can take it from me approach. Rhetorically, that's not there at all. He's very much going to appeal to everybody through reason. Um, now, there's my favorite part from this section, though, on sciences and uh, or the different maths and stuff. Um, it was his takeaway from. I don't. I, we don't have the same page numbers here, but what I'm looking at. It's, it's a paragraph that starts with, I did not, however, cease to value the disciplines of the schools. 
I knew that the languages which one learns there are necessary to understand the works of the ancients, and that the delicacy of fiction enlivens the mind, that famous deeds of history ennoble it, and if read with understanding, aid in maturing one's judgment, that the reading of all great books is like conversing with the best people of earlier times. It is even a studied conversation in which the authors show us only the best of their thoughts, that eloquence has incomparable powers and beauties, that poetry has enchanting delicacy and sweetness, that math and here we go, that mathematics has very subtle processes which can serve as much to satisfy the inquiring mind as to aid all the arts and to diminish man's labor. That was my favorite part. There's... Yeah. Because he's... He's he's seeing things. He's seeing the future. He sees the end of... uh, He sees the end of bath as the end of labor. Right? That's th- that's about as prolific as you can possibly get. Of course there's like the Marxian critique. Oh, well that's not it's the end of la- it's the it's the end of labor for a few more people, uh, but not for most people. And actually the labor for most people is kind of more monotonous and you have less agency, right? But the uh yeah, he's seeing the future, and I want to kind of. Well, we better not get too far ahead of ourselves. We can kind of keep going for now, but the one thing I would really want to drive home here is that the, the 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 fact that there's a quote here about how he thinks that math is ultimately a labor saving device. Um, it's going to get. That, that ties in really well to stuff that happens in parts uh, five and six. He basically talks about the Turing test before Turing, like a few hundred years before Turing. He's talking about how would we know if a machine that we made is actually human or not, if it actually looks like us and could talk like us. And he's like, it's not, he literally says, it's not, un, un, it's not beyond, um, it's not, it's, he's, he says it's not unreasonable that there could be machines that look like us and talk like us, but then he's still trying, at, at this point, this early in, ph- in philosophy, he's sitting here being like, well, but would they be human? How would we know if they're human? Um, you know, how unique are we really? You know, and, and, and uh, so I, I, I say that mostly as a way of hopefully wetting people's appetites for some of the crazy ahead of his time stuff that there is as we get further into it. I'm going to go to the bathroom real quick. All right. And then I will start reading. Yeah. You should have time. Yeah. Part two, the principal rules of the method. All right. So here are the rules. I was then in Germany where I had gone because of the wars, which are still not ended. And while I don't, I don't know what wars were going on in Germany at that time. So maybe we'll have to look that up. And while I was returning to the army from the coronation of the emperor, I was caught by the onset of winter. There was no conversation to occupy me, and being untroubled by any cares or passions, I remained all day alone in a warm room. There I had plenty of leisure to examine my ideas. One of the first that occurred to me was that frequently there is less perfection in a work produced by several persons than in one produced by a single hand. Thus we notice that buildings conceived and completed by a single architect are usually more beautiful and better planned than those remodeled by several persons using ancient walls that had originally been built for quite other purposes. Similarly, those ancient towns, which were originally nothing but hamlets and in the course of time have become great cities, are ordinarily very badly arranged compared to one of the symmetrical metropolitan districts, which a city planner has laid out on an open plain according to his own designs. You want to take it from here? I've got a couple things to write down. It is true that when we consider their buildings one by one, there is often as much beauty in the 
first city as in the second, or even more. Nevertheless, when we observe how they are arranged, here a large unit, there a small, and how the streets are crooked and uneven, one would rather suppose that chance and not the decisions of rational men had so arranged them. And when we consider that there were always some officials in charge of private building, whose duty it was to see that they were conducive to the general good appearance of the city, we recognize that it is not easy to do a good job when using only the works of others. Similarly, I suppose that peoples who were once half savage and who became civilized by a gradual process and invented their laws one by one as the harmfulness of crimes and quarrels forced them to outlaw them, would be less well governed than those who have followed the constitutions of some prudent legislator from the time their communities were founded. Thus it is quite certain that the condition of the true religion, whose rules were laid down by God alone, must be incomparably superior to all others. And, to speak of human affairs, I believe that Sparta was such a flourishing community, not because of the goodness of each of its laws in particular, seeing that many of them were very strange and even contrary to good morals but because they were produced by a single legislator, and so all tended to the same end. And similarly, I thought that the sciences found in books, at least those whose reasons were only probable and which had no proofs, have, have grown up little by little, the accumul little by little, the, by the accumulation of the opinions of many different persons, and are therefore, therefore by no means as near to the truth as the simple and natural reasonings of a man of good sense concerning the things which he experiences. Likewise, I thought that we were all children before being men, at which time we were necessarily under the control of our appetites and our teachers, and that neither of these influences is wholly consistent, and neither of them, perhaps, always tends toward the better. It is therefore impossible that our judgments sh should be as pure and firm as they would have been had we, had we the whole of our reason from the time of our birth, and if we had never been under any other control hold on it is, it is it is therefore impossible that our judgment should be as pure and for uh, and firm as they would have been had we the whole use of our reason from the time of our birth and if we had never been under any control what does he mean uh sorry th that's following from something he said likewise i thought that we were all children before being men at which time we were necessarily under the control of our appetites and our teachers. Granted, sure, yeah, I've got no problem with that. And that neither of these influences is wholly consistent, sure. And neither of them, perhaps, always tends toward the better. So he's saying that neither, he ap neither appetites nor socialization and discipline neither necessarily leads towards things that are better. Yeah, and that once, like I think, once once you become a man and, and a thinking man, and you have the ability and opportunity um, to like interrogate all your presuppositions and and like kind of create like like you you have to do this a new like do this reckoning with all things because if you just take everything for granted. Um, you won't be as good as one who does do all that interrogation and, and do the examining. Right. And, so um, and, and part of the reason why we need to do that examining is based in the idea that, yeah, children are basically a combination of appetites and discipline. Now, the appetites are... You know, oh, I want to, I want this, I want that, I need to eat, I need to, whatever. And then obviously discipline is like the no, the no of the father, right? And so we are socialists. And, but he's saying neither, neither of these, our natural nature or our socialization is, is beyond uh, reproach. He's saying both are suspect. And so the point is, is like, yeah, you're an adult. Now you feel like your judgment is so well-founded because you feel so confident because, you know, you're an adult. You know how to pay your bills on time. You know, you, you're competent. You know how to, you know how to walk around. You, you don't have to be potty trained. You know what you're doing. Of course your judgment is sound. And of course everyone feels like their judgment is sound. But the point is, is like, is it though? And so anybody who's like, oh, of course it is. Of course my judgment is sound. That person is obviously suspect because... 
they're not thinking about how they are the product of all of those years of socialization. And what were those teachers teaching? They were teaching discipline first, right? Most of the time it's might makes right, it's because I told you so, obey, you know, here's the answers to the problem, not how to think through it. And so um, any, any sort of like, oh, well, yeah, we got socialized, but of course we have our natural self. We just need to excavate our natural self. Maybe if we do enough psychedelics, we'll be our natural selves again. And what they are missing is like, oh, yeah, you, you'll excavate the, 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 that self that has been under prohibition. You'll, you'll liberate the appetites, but that doesn't mean that you actually have sound judgment is, is the point. And so... I think he's he's building up a case here for why his method is necessary. So this is you know at this point we we thought we were getting his method. This is less the principles of his method so far than it is the development of his rationale for why he's going to roll out the method as he does. Yeah. It is true that we never tear down all the houses in a city just to rebuild them in a different way and to make the streets more beautiful. But we do see that individual owners often have theirs torn down and rebuilt, and even that they may be forced to do so when the foundation is not firm and it is in danger of collapsing. By this example, I was convinced that a private individual should not seek to reform a nation by changing all its customs and destroying it to construct it anew, nor to reform the body of knowledge or the system of education. Nevertheless, as far as the opinions which I had been receiving since my birth were concerned, I could, I could not do better than to reject them completely for, for once in my lifetime and to resume them afterwards, or perhaps accept better ones in their place, when I had determined how they fit into, it fitted into a rational scheme. And I firmly believe that by this means I would succeed in conducting my life much better than if I built only upon the old foundations and gave credence to the principles which I had acquired in my childhood without ever having examined them to see whether they were true or not. For though I noticed several difficulties in the way, they were neither insurmountable nor comparable to those involved in the slightest reform of public affairs. For public affairs are on a large scale and large edifices are too difficult to set up again once they have been thrown down, too difficult even to preserve once they have been shaken, and their fall is necessarily catastrophic. It is certain that many institutions have defects, since their differences alone guarantee that much, but custom has no doubt inured us to many of them. Custom has perhaps even found ways to avoid or correct more defects than prudence could have done. Finally, present institutions are practically always more tolerable than would be a change in them, just as highways which twist and turn among the mountains become gradually so easy to travel as a result of much use, that it is much better to follow them than to attempt to go more directly by climbing cliffs and descending to the bottom of precipices. That is why I cannot at all approve those mischievous spirits who, not being called either by birth or by attainment to a position of political power, are nevertheless constantly proposing some new reform. If I thought the slightest basis could be found in this discourse for a suspicion that I was guilty of this folly, I would be loath to permit it to be published. Never has my intention been more than to try to reform my own ideas and rebuild them on foundations that would be wholly mine. If my building has pleased me sufficiently to display a model of it to the public, it is not because I advise anyone to copy it. Those whom God has more bountifully endowed will no doubt have higher aims. There are others, I fear, for whom my own are too adventurous. Even the decision to abandon all one's preconceived notions is not an example for all to follow, and the world is largely composed of two sorts of individuals who should not try to follow it. <laughs> First, there are those who think themselves more able than they really are, Dunning-Kruger, and so make precipitate judgments and do not have enough patience to think matters through thoroughly. From this it follows that once they have taken the liberty of doubting their established principles, thus leaving the highway, they will never be able to keep the, to the narrow path which must be followed to go more directly, and will remain lost all their lives. Secondly, there are those who have enough sense or modesty to realize that they are less able to distinguish the true from the false than are others, and so should rather be satisfied to follow the opinions of these other than to search for better ones themselves. 
OG PMC in the house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he's also not entirely wrong. No, there's nothing wrong with being PMC in a sort of sense, you know. It's the this is the funny thing about it not being a slur is that it only becomes a problem at the point that it creates a new contradiction in the reproduction of capitalism that is is being left out of the analysis of activists. That's where it becomes a problem. But but outside of that He's got a basic point. I know plenty of people who would rather never preoccupy themselves with these kinds of questions, and they do want to be able to take something on authority. And of course, Adorno and Horkheimer are going to be like, well, that's fascism. That's what that is. They've got the fascist personality. And it's like, no, maybe they just, you know, they just know, I, I'm not very good at this, and I'll never get to the bottom of it, and I don't feel called to do this, and so that's the end of the story. It's the progressives who are in this sort of more Kantian, Kantian Enlightenment tradition that say, no, everyone is responsible for figuring, that, for figuring out what's true and what's not, right? Yeah. Of course, I think, Descartes, I, think, uh, I think Kant is split on that one and that our reading in the, uh, the OTM uh, B-side that we were doing shows that Kant's actually split on this. He, on the one side, he thinks everybody can do it. On the other side, he's like, ah, maybe not. But these, yeah. people, but these two kinds of people I mean, are definitely very common, right? Yeah, you, you can't deny it. You come up against it. Um, and to pretend like they're not there is foolish. I, I like how... He says, Dun Dunning Kruger, so long, so before we have a term for it, right? It's like, yeah. He's, he's well aware of this. There's also a point in here, and I'm going to add it to our receipts document we've got going here for Descartes. There's, of course, now at this point, we're not, receipts for what? But the point is, is we're just, we're kind of quote mining for specific things. Um, and there's going to be a point where he is sort of, uh, He's aware of the unconscious in the Zizekian sense. Um, mm. He actually, he just, he because for Zizek, the uh, the unconscious is well. I'm, I'm like holding back. Do I really want to get into it right now? Will this derail us? Suffice it to say, we'll get into it at the point that he brings it up, and we'll just keep going for now. As for myself, I should no doubt have belonged in the last class if I had but a single teacher or if I had not known the differences which have always existed among the most learned. I had discovered in college that one cannot imagine anything so strange and unbelievable but that it has been upheld by some philosopher. And in my travels, I had found that those who held opinions contrary to ours were neither barbarians nor savages, but that many of them were at least as reasonable as ourselves. I had considered how the same man, with the same capacity for reason, becomes different as a result of being brought up among Frenchmen or Germans than he would be if he had been brought up among Chinese or cannibals, and how, in our fashion, the, young, the thing which pleased us ten years ago, and perhaps will please us again ten years in the future, now seems extravagant and ridiculous. And I felt that in all these ways we are much more greatly influenced by custom and example than by any certain knowledge. Faced with this divergence of opinion, I could not accept the testimony of the majority, for I thought it worthless as a proof of anything somewhat difficult to discover, since it is much more likely than a single, that a single man will have discovered it than a whole people. Nor, on the other hand, could I select anyone whose opinions seemed to me to be preferable to those of, of others, as I was thus constrained to embark on the in investigation for myself." Nevertheless, like a man who walks alone in the darkness, I resolved to go slowly and circumspectly, that if I did not get ahead very rapidly, I was at least safe from falling. Also, I did not want to reject all the opinions which had slipped irrationally into my consciousness since birth, until I had first spent enough time planning how to accomplish the task which I was then undertaking, and seeking the true method of obtaining knowledge of everything which my mind was capable of understanding. Among the branches of philosophy, I had, when younger, studied logic, and among those of mathematics, geometrical analysis, and algebra, three 
arts or sciences which should be able to contribute something to my design. But in examining them, I noticed that as far as logic was concerned, its syllogisms and most of its other methods serve rather to explain to, to another what already, what one already, <laughs> most of its other methods serve rather to explain to another what one already knows, or even as the art of Lily, to speak without judgment of one does not know, than to learn new things. Although it does contain many true and good precepts, they are interspersed among many others that are harmful or superfluous that it is almost as difficult to separate them as to bring them as to bring forth a Diana or Minerva from the block of virgin marble. Then, as far as the analysis of the Greeks and the algebra of the moderns is concerned, besides the fact that they deal with abstractions and appear to have no utility, the first is always so limited to the consideration of figures that I that it cannot exercise the understanding without greatly fatiguing the imagination. And the last is so limited to certain rules and certain numbers that it has become a confused and obscure art which perplexes the mind instead of a science which educates it. In consequence, I thought that some other method must be found to combine the advantages of these three and to escape their faults. Finally, just as the multitude of laws frequently furnishes an excuse for vice, and a state is much better governed with a few laws that are strictly adhered to, so I thought that instead of the greater number of precepts of which logic is composed, I would have enough with the four following ones, provided that I made a firm and unalterable resolution not to violate them, even in a single instance. So here we finally get to him laying down some prescriptions. Mm -hmm. So The first rule... Yeah. I just, I like that he takes so much inf inspiration from the maths. Um, but then he's like, he's like, yeah, geometry, what did he say? It exhausts the imagination. What, 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 what is or the, uh, that? Algebra exhausts the imagination. Geometry is kind of ineffective. Algebra exhausts the imagination. Geometry is like, algebra is like too many rules. Geometry is exhausts the imagination. And, and, but... He based, and then he, and then it's logic. So really, like his main three inspirations are geometry, algebra, and logic. And so he's he's like, okay, each one of these is really good for a specific object um, or a specific task. But outside of that, they're just it's more of like an aesthetic appreciation that he has for them. That's something that I'll probably want to get into a little bit more as a sort of thread as we go through this is that it's an aesthetic appreciation, this high modern attitude. This is something that James Scott talks about in Seeing Like a State. The high modern attitude was always very strongly about aesthetics while acting like it wasn't. And part of, the, part of how you know that is like the mountains with the trees on them get referred to as like chaotic. There were people back then who would like, you know, they're, they're aristocrats and they're being pulled in these horse-drawn buggies, they would close the curtains so as to not see the chaos of nature because they wanted to see all their ducks in a row, everything lined up and perfect and looking the same, which is funny because if you go back up when he was talking about, oh, cities, they get so messy, houses, different heights, come on, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, like, that is a very, like, in Descartes, that's a very autistic thing to think and to feel and, and to go through the, the, the chaos of differences like that. Like I legitimately, I can't go inside hardware stores anymore because it's just too much. I get overstimulated. I, I just avoid them. Dude, it, that's how I feel like I have, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like it, it, in a personal instantiation, it's a cute kind of, haha, that's silly. He's an autistic person. But like when you kind of extrapolate that to the, collective level um you're missing human things that that are necessary um like we can't all just be this mechanical mathematized we can't live that way um it it misses so much mm -hmm. yeah and i just but it no go it's yeah like he's he's kind of doing this like i love math it's so cool but he's also like but let's not get carried away with with mathematizing everything right 
So he's still he's still measured in that sense. And I mean, he's really measured throughout it. But what he wants is a philosophy that is based in not math, but the mathematical spirit, right? It, he likes that present at hand sort of evidentiality, right? Where it's like, oh, nothing is more clear and distinct. By the way, there's no two more important words to him than clear and distinct. He loves when a thought is clear and distinct. And nothing is more clear and distinct than these maths or logic. Now, now, really quick, who's the name of the architect uh, who is got one of the main brutalists? Um, Cabousier? Cabou- is, do you know what I'm talking about, how to say it? But is he, did he do that? Um, yeah, I think it's C-O-U-R. No. Is he the guy that did that? Uh, ah, I found it. Corbusier. It's it's C O R B U S I E R. Corbusier, I think, is how you say his name. And yeah, he does all this stuff with concrete. And uh, yeah, what, what what were you about to say about him? Um, I was thinking of that. I think it's in the Czech Czech Republic that there's like a big fucking. Uh, It's not a monument. It's like a thing. It's like a big thing. But I don't think it's the guy I'm thinking of. Well, he definitely built some crazy stuff. I think he built... I think he masterminded a a city that was built in Argentina. And it was kind of like a utopian city. He, He... The reason I bring him up at this point is because he's the extreme radicalization of what Descartes was just saying in that paragraph about how we like to have our cities or about how how disorganized cities get right um, and of course Descartes is laying out a program here or at least ostensibly he's arguing against revolution he's he's arguing for reform and he's saying there's nothing worse than these 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 damn rebel rousers in the government who are talking about changing things, uh, right? He he's kind of like oh those guys, and and he throws shade at those guys because he wants to establish this case that truth can be sought on the individual basis. At individuals seeking truth, should be ready to shed all presuppositions. And so there's this question mark I want to put over this idea that he's just uh, anti-revolution. He could also just as well think that the only way any genuine revolution will ever happen is if enough people shed their presuppositions and actually think for themselves. But but that's never going to happen if his book doesn't get distributed, and his book's never going to get distributed if he doesn't say up front, uh, we don't tear the city down, we start with ourselves. Right, so it's kind of like Jordan Peterson. You start with your room, start with your posture, right? This whole idea of like you start at the individual level, it's kind of stoic, and he will, uh, you know, actually show his hand. He's pretty stoic himself, but the question is, is one between, like, what's his philosophy and what's, what does he actually have to say for this book to even get distributed in this day and age? You know, mm-hmm. but but with all that said, Corbusier Corbusier would be like, no, actually, we should probably tear the city down and and build build something that's nice and he like he didn't even want people crossing paths with one another if like one person is going to work and another person is going to the store. He actually tried to build the city in such a way so it's so compartmentalized that nobody crosses paths unless they're actually on the way to do the same things. But what it did was it made it so nobody wants to be there, and it's like a ghost city, and you never really see other people, and everything's, it kind of sucks. It's only perfect for somebody like that, somebody who actually holds to this ideal. But most people are like, no, I actually want to, I want a little chaos. Yeah, it makes me think both, like, um, obviously it kind of makes me think of Benjamin, and makes me want to go there and think about that, but also, um, I'll... West of Phoenix, Microsoft bought up a shitload of land, a 
like hundreds of thousands of acres, I think. Mm. And they, for probably 20 years, they've been uh, marketing this idea that they're going to build the city of the future. And it's going to be this um, uh, all amenities included, all services provided, blah, 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 city of the future. Um, and it's it sounds it's it sounds horrifying to me because it, it like everything is going to be mechanized everything is going to be utilitarian um but they wrap it up in this cool flashy high-tech package mm -hmm. um and and yeah it's it's just that like that stark brutal functional um horrible thing that that comes along with technological progress um and it's it sucks yeah and it's an aesthetic disposition that is oriented mm. towards the present at hand. It just wants things to be, yeah. it wants things to be there. It like set in order in like this perfection so that we can apprehend it and enjoy it from a distance, right? It's not about the world that you're immersed in and it's not about the kind of knowledge that you embody. It's instead like it is kind of setting the world at a distance and going, ah, now that looks good. And so being like, yeah, it's not even about math, but the aesthetics of math. That's an important kind of point I want to stress. But yeah, let's get to it. The first rule, I'll read for a bit. The first rule was never to accept anything as true unless I recognized it to be evidently such. That is, carefully to avoid precipitation and prejudgment and to include nothing in my conclusions unless it presented itself so clearly and distinctly to my mind that there was no occasion to doubt it, right? So don't try this at home, folks. You might be one of those main two categories of people that should not be trying this out, but it's a, it's a very dangerous thing. D definitely don't, don't try this at home. The second was to divide each of the difficulties which I encountered into as many parts as possible and as might be required for an easier solution. I mean, that's really like the, 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 that principle could probably be called analysis, right? It's the principle of break things down into their parts. The third was to think in an orderly fashion, beginning with the things which were simplest and easiest to understand, and gradually by degrees reaching toward more complex knowledge, even treating it as though ordered materials which were not necessarily... What? Did I misread that? Even treating as though ordered materials which were not necessarily so. Even treating as though ordered materials which were not necessarily so. So, making inferences and educated guesses. But you build up. That's the point. The last was always to make enumerations so complete and review so general that I would be certain that nothing was omitted. I mean, that's, that's, that's the four main principles here. Those long chains of reasoning, so simple and easy, which enabled the geometricians, the, ge the, ge the geometry bros, to reach the most difficult demonstrations had made me wonder whether all things knowable to Ben might not fall into a similar logical sequence. If so, we need only refrain from accepting as true that which is not true, and carefully follow the order necessary to deduce each one from the others, and there cannot be any propositions so abstruse that we cannot prove them, or so recondite that we cannot discover them. It was not very difficult either to decide where we should look for a beginning, for I already knew that one begins with the simplest and easiest to know. Considering that among all those who have previously sought truth in the sciences, mathematicians alone have been able to find some demonstrations, some certain and evident reasons, I had no doubt that I should begin where they did, although I expected no advantage except to accustom my mind to work with truths and not to be satisfied with bad reasoning. I do not mean that I intended to learn all the particular branches of mathematics, for I saw that although the objects they discuss are different, all these branches are in agreement in limiting their consideration to the relationships or proportions between their various objects. 
That's what I was talking about earlier. All of the sci- all of the maths, everything about them is focused on a specific kind of object of analysis and all of the special things about any given math, all the formulas, all the techniques, all the rules, all the axioms, these only hold true when dealing with those specific objects. So any copying and pasting of math into other territory, other regions, is very suspect. He said, I judge, therefore, that it would be better to examine these proportions in general and use particular objects as illustrations only in order to make their principles easier to comprehend and to be able the more easily to apply them afterwards without any forcing to anything for which they would be suitable. I realize that in order to understand the principles, I like how he says without any forcing right here, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of speaking to the idea of not copying and pasting math into other domains of human life. Of course, Heidegger is going to be saying he does do that, though. And so there is some forcing at work, Um, but he doesn't want to. I realized that in order to understand the principles of relationships, I would sometimes have to consider them singly and sometimes in groups. I thought I could consider them better singly as relationships between lines because I could find nothing more simple or more easily pictured to my imagination and my senses. But in order to remember and understand them better when taken in groups, I had to express them in numbers and in the smallest numbers possible. Thus I took the best traits of geometrical analysis and algebra and corrected the faults of one by the other. The exact observation of the few precepts which I had chosen gave me such facility in clarifying all the issues in these two sciences that it took only two or three months to examine them. I began with the most simple and general, and each truth that I found was a rule which helped me to find others, so that I not only solved many problems which I had previously judged very difficult, but also it seemed to me that towards the end I could determine to what extent a still unsolved problem could be solved, and what procedures should be used in solving it. In this I trust that I shall not appear too vain, considering that there is only one true solution to a given problem, and whoever finds it knows all that anyone can know about it. I want to reread that. In this I trust that I shall not appear too vain, considering that there is only one true solution to a given problem, and whoever finds it knows all that anyone can know about it. That is the most mathy thing anyone could ever say about anything. Um, And it kind of goes with where he said earlier, I did not have enough. Wait a second. I want to see if I actually got the correct quote earlier. Um, Let's see if this was the right quote. I did not have enough presumption to hope to succeed better than the others, and when I noticed how many different opinions learned men may hold on the same subject, despite the fact that no more than one of them can ever be right, I resolved to consider almost as false any opinion which was merely plausible. So when he said that earlier, it's kind of getting at the same idea, which is there can only be one correct solution. There could only be one correct opinion. If a lot of people disagree on something, that's because there is a lot of wrong people, right? Now, it's quite reasonable. It is also one of the fundamental axioms of logic. Something either is or is not, right? A is equal to A, right? And if A is equal to B, then it's equal to B, but it can't, it can't be equal to B and not be equal to B, right? This is the law of non-contradiction. And so he's taking that to heart and applying it to everything, right? But he just said he's not going to force what he's taking from math onto everything else. But his approach throughout the method is to always kind of assume, no, there's one solution, um, which is true. Well, it's, except that there could be multiple ways of getting to the solution, even then. 
So e even, even math pros know this, that there can be multiple ways of getting to a, the same solution. But then the thing is, in practical life, there can be multiple solutions to the same problem. One solution might be perfect, but it takes a lot more time and energy, whereas another solution is good enough, right? Yeah, I wonder, I wonder if you can kind of, starting with his position, if, if you can just extrapolate and just be like, well, then therefore you can't mechanize people. Like you have to, um, you have to always uh, treat people as people. Like, like, um, what do you mean? Like you can't, uh, You can't apply this to people because, like, it's just, like, uh, it's like a category thing. Like, like we we're not we're not able to be uh, instrumentalized in this way, and that's a good thing. Like, you can still hold this position that um, there's only one true solution to a given problem. Um, it, then therefore like all the shit that people deal with aren't problems like they don't our problems don't belong to the same category of problems that he's dealing with um yes yeah 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 100 percent. and actually and even heidegger would agree he, he would say yeah insofar as it goes president hand analysis is super useful we can actually make sense of a lot of things but it's like um when you get a real hard on for the tools that you're using and then you take those tools because you like the way they work you way you like how clear and distinct they are you say well that's the model of truth and goodness and that's the model of everything it's the essence of everything and then you go back and you read nature and you read humans and you read everything through that approach you get cartesianism right but remember what is he what is he why does he even? Why, why is he even applying these tools to anything at this point, except for the fact that there's been a complete breakdown in the world, right? There's been a breakdown. Things don't make sense. Everyone's uncertain. Um, he was talking about earlier, like who he he said, yeah, uh, people rebuild their house at the point that it's shaky and falling apart, and that they're they're not like feeling. Well, I forget how he described it, but it like made you think like the person's like insecure in their house, like it's it's causing them anxiety, so they actually feel the need to rebuild it. Um, and that metaphor is a metaphor he was using for why a person interrogates their beliefs, right? So he's saying, yeah, we shouldn't tear down the whole city. It should always start at the individual level, right? So this whole metaphor about revolution versus reform was only being used really to talk about. Why do you really interrogate your presuppositions? And if we go with that metaphor, he was saying the real reason you interrogate it is because you feel at like disease, at disease, like a torn apart. You know, there's tensions and it's all wrapped up, and you just ah, it's a there's a bunch of conflicts and contradictions, and they're not very clear and distinct. You don't really have a very good idea of like what is the problem, but you know that the authorities are wrong. The institutions are wrong. Everything that you're being told is suspect. And so that's why you would do this method. And so, you know, at the same time that I'm going to kind of, I'm going to keep paying attention to all of this through that Heideggerian lens, I'm also going to keep giving the devil his due and saying, no, I think Descartes is onto something because of what he's dealing with, which is we can't even talk about going around the sun in this world, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think that a lot of the people who are on the right side of the political spectrum who like Heidegger um, care too much about that. Like it's, it, I get the the general vibe. They 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 don't lose sleep over the idea that you might not be allowed to say the Earth is round or goes around the sun, right? Like that. Yeah. That they would have. They would have. They, 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 you know, maybe Galileo got off too easy and maybe they should have found Descartes before he was on his deathbed you know um, and whether Heidegger would agree with that or not I don't know 
but it's something to keep in mind. Is like we can be critics of Descartes, but also remember that the critics of Descartes might have wanted Galileo sil- silenced, and might w- mm. might might prefer to live in a world where everybody gets told that everything revolves around us, and God made it just for us, just so we can enjoy it, right? Yeah, yeah, because then then you're apt to stay in your lane. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's a lot easier to keep you in your lane. Okay, so, so yeah, um, he said I'd be, I'm going to go back because I'm going to go back to the part that leads up to that po- part I was just pointing out. So yeah, he said the exact observation of the few precepts which I had chosen gave me such facility in clarifying all the issues in these two sciences, which were geometry and algebra, that it took only two or three months to examine them. I began with the most simple and general, and each truth that I found was a rule which helped me to find others, so that I not only solved many problems, which I had previously judged very difficult, but also it seemed to me that toward the end, I could determine to what extent a still unsolved problem could be solved, and what procedures should be used in solving it. So he might go, okay, I could solve this problem, except it would just require too much time and energy, but I think I have the general idea here. If Basically, he's saying if he knew how to run an algorithm or a logarithm, he would have been able to get his solutions. In this, I trust that I shall not appear too vain, considering that there is only one true solution to a given problem, and whoever finds it knows all that anyone can know about it. Thus, for example, a child who has learned arithmetic and had performed an addition according to the rules may feel certain that as far as that particular sum is concerned, he has found everything that a human lost my place. He has found everything that a human mind can discover. For after all, the method of following the correct order and stating precisely all the circumstances of what we are investigating is the whole of what gives certainty to the rules of arithmetic. What pleased me most about this method was that it enabled me to reason in all things, if not perfectly, at least as well as was in my power. In addition, I felt that in practicing it, my mind was gradually becoming accustomed to conceive its objects more clearly and distinctly, and since I had not directed this method to any particular subject matter, I was in hopes of applying it just as usefully to the difficulties of other sciences as I had already to those of algebra. Not that I would dare to undertake to examine at once all the difficulties presented th- that presented themselves, for that would have been contrary to the principle of order. But I had observed that all the basic principles of the sciences were taken from philosophy, which itself, which itself had no certain ones. It therefore seemed that I should first attempt to establish philosophic principles, and that since this was the most important thing in the world, and the place where precipitation and prejudgment were most to be feared, I should not attempt to reach conclusions until I had attained a much more mature age than my then 23 years and had spent much time in preparing for it. Oh, so he's basically saying he's not going to go try to become a star on on Instagram or YouTube. He's going to instead spend some serious time preparing himself so that by the time he's matured, he's got something to offer that's what he's saying Mm -hmm. good thing Descartes didn't become a YouTuber in his early 20s this preparation would consist partly in freeing my mind from the false opinions which I had previously acquired partly in building up a fund of experiences which should serve afterwards as the raw material of my reasoning and partly in training myself in the method which I had determined upon so that I should become more and more adept in its use. And we're about to jump into part three. I just want to point out, though, like, I'm not just joking about this, oh, he didn't rush off to TheoryTube or Instagram. Um, There's something, I think, a little bit more important there. And on the one side, first of all, I don't want to act like people who do run off to YouTube or Instagram are less, lesser as humans. I do think a lot of people on these things are educating themselves in the best ways that they figured out how to do. And, you know, I, I mean, I am such a child of the attention economy that 
there are sometimes I just literally cannot focus unless I set up a GoPro to time lapse me reading. Not be well on the one side, it's it's allowing me to multitask because I'm making content for the el- for the attention economy while I'm doing it. So it's like, oh, I don't have to worry about producing content because I'm doing it right now as I read. I'm making a beautiful time lapse. Okay. Um, it's also just like, no, it's an actual like instantiation of like, I don't know, the panopticon or something. Like it's the big other is watching me. And because the big other is watching me, oh, now I actually have to focus, right? And it's like, so I'm not saying, oh, I'm better than anybody when it comes to the attention economy. I'm a, I'm a total, it's totally shaped me in these ways. And so, um, but with that said though, I do try to do what he's talking about here, right? 35 is the new 23, you know, that's the, that's the thing that, that's the thing I just made up. Um, but I feel it to be true, you know? So this, this, this preparation, he says, would consist partly in freeing his mind from the false opinions which had previous, he had previously acquired. Okay, so this is what this is like the idea of moratorium. I've talked about it a few times. It's a book that I wrote that I'll never publish, but it's basically just like after my burnout with political activism and 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 the whole influencer sphere and all of these things, just like the 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 realization like, oh, we have no idea what a good way forward is yet. Right, like all of the tools that we're using are copy and pasted from some other historical context, either one that was in the 1920s or one that was in the 1960s, and that and that's basically the left versus the uh, the new left, and then obviously a lot of people just want to kind of combine whatever radical flair they can find from both kind of periods, and then synthesize that into something else, and it's just I don't I I became. I became pretty skeptical about my own fusionist phase and thinking that I really knew I, I had been very confident. I had really thought this fusionist approach worked, but then I realized like I had a certain set of assumptions and a certain kind of framework that I was uh, operating with that was not just like unfounded or like shoddily founded, but also just like very self-congratulatory, convenient, easy, and ubiquitous across across the spectrum it's like everyone kind of seems to agree with all these assumptions and frames yet they seem to be inherent to the actual status quo um, so it's like if we're talking about some kind of radical change then wouldn't we have to come up with something that has a new theoretical conception of the situation and a new and a, and a, and a, and a something that's more, I guess, up to date and kind of like uh, kind of touching on like the main nerves, the main tendencies, the main dynamics of capital in the 21st century, right? And so um, I think what I'm trying to say is that I take a part of this method to be very, very, very relevant to my own life and that Theory Underground is a direct product of me going, I'm not going to be an influencer. I don't have the solutions. And in order to continue my own education, I actually have to force myself through some structures that kind of contain and force focus on various aspects of the problem with other people so that I'm not just by myself, you know. And actually, he says that at the very end of the, the meditations. He says the reason he has to write it to people as though he's going to publish is because he will write it better if he's thinking that he's writing it to other people and then he says because people always write better when they think someone else might look it over and so it's like we don't let ourselves off with lazy self-rationalizing excuse making bullshit if we think we're going to have critical eyes on it and so part of really getting our feet under us and getting the lay of the land um, is not just having fellow travelers, but having having other people that are potentially going to be there to dialogue with over the years so that, for instance, Nance, you could two years from now send me some like 
email or you blog post or you just do some video where you talk about it, you're like, you know, I've been thinking about the that, Dave, you always say this thing and you always say that thing and you always say this thing. And I've been thinking about this for a couple of years here. You know, we've read this and that and the other thing, but you know what? It, it's all fucking bullshit, Dave. Here's the thing. What you're missing is, and then you, you start, you, you, in r- relating it to the same reference points that we've established, we're able to kind of speak the same language. We're not just speaking past each other. It's not just our opinions. And we're kind of able to, oh, okay. And so, yeah, but even if that doesn't happen, in this moment, while we're doing this, it could happen, right? And and because it could happen, we step up our game, right? And it's like he's aware of that, and and so anyway, I just I'm I'm look I'm Cartesian in, in this one fundamental sense for sure, and that is that there, there should be a period in which any person who really wants to understand things kind of goes through an, a sort of agnosticism, um, a suspension of beliefs. A suspension of disbeliefs and an opening oneself up to something that's radically other. And so right now, when it comes to politics, people – there's a meme that goes around where people say, well, I'm not left. I'm not right. I'm some mysterious third thing. And the people who say this obviously just think that that's that, – that must be the – oh, that, what a meme. That's the most absurd thing to say. But it's like I'm very interested in the mysterious third thing. I think that there is a mysterious third thing called – we don't fucking know, <laughs> but we need to figure it I out. I mean, I think, yeah, I, th- I think right now it's a non thing. I think to call it a third thing. Uh, Misframes it, maybe. It's, yeah, um, I, I think it is a non thing. And I think um, we have to get there. Like, we, it, it's it's an undiscovered country. Um, but rather than death, it's it's an actual future that, that we can participate in actively. Um and that's fucking cool. Fuck yeah. The other part is that he wants to build up a fund of experiences which would serve after after this period of moratorium would serve as the raw material for his reasoning. And so that's kind of the, the fund. I mean, it's like a, it's an investment fund, right? He's He's building up his intellectual capital so that he can make some crazy expenditure later. Um, I like that analogy, the raw material for his reasoning. I like it a lot. I just, I want to point out though, that in a sort of sense, that is on the one side, primary texts that actually show you the lay of the land concerning the fundamental fields of the humanities and social sciences. Um, but on the other side, experiences include discussions that might be very frustrating where you don't you're not making sense of what someone else is saying or they're not able to make sense of what you're saying or you're just you're both thinking that you both make sense to one another but you're talking past one another and it's obvious to everybody else whatever it is um, those kinds of experiences do form in us like a sense of the field that we're inhabiting or, or trying to inhabit and so when we're speaking past one another using what we take to be pretty clear language, um, that's usually an opportunity to take a step further back and reflect after the fact on um, not just rhetoric, but how specific framings or specific kinds of jargon or certain kinds of trigger words shut down or close the doors to communication, to understanding. Um, and two, really being able to do anything with anybody, right? Like, uh, time energy in part as a concept comes out of a prior decade leading up to that point of trying to communicate about things like capitalism, labor power, work, um, philosophy, theory, and realizing like you can't talk about these things to mixed audiences very well. Like you pretty much have to have a bunch of people who all get it. Um, and so, like, I erred on the side of a coinage, a neologism that sounds kind of corny on purpose because I know it only it only sounds corny to people who are too too academic. But for everybody else, it's intuitive, right? So there, there's like that class factor baked into it, where it's taking the side of it's intuitive to a regular working class people, and it's also going to be off-putting to a regular like egg-headed person. 
Um, but the that doesn't just come out of nothing. Like it comes out of experiences that led up to that. And so it's like I, I, the whole thing is like if you're going to go through a period of study, you should also be thinking what kinds of experiences are you going to gain while you're studying, right? You if you're if you're building up this this uh, this raw material for taking on the life of the mind and making some kind of a real contribution, then we just have to ask ourselves like, what are the kinds of experiences they might be uncomfortable they might be frustrating they might be they might be huge challenges right like but but what what kinds of experiences can we put ourselves through over the course of a decade or two that whip us into shape and that really like give us a sort of secondhand or intuitive grasp of how other people inhabit these realms regions fields of the life of the mind because we can't just have it all inside of our own heads. We have to be able to have that conversation with other people. Otherwise, your book's never going to – no one will read it, right? So for mm-hmm. right now, that's kind of it. Is I see Theory Underground as the thing that's helping us, hopefully, build up a fund of experiences which will serve as a raw material for our reasoning or, or just anyone's individual reasoning for that matter. And then lastly, he says, and partly in training myself in the method which I had determined upon so that I should become more and more adept to its use or in its use. And so um, it's this idea of like having a method that I'm like really fixated on these last few years. And it's something that I've had a lot of conversations with a few of my fellow travelers about. Um, And it seems to be like the meta conversation that's most lacking in the world of theory today, right? There's very little thought of method. In fact, there's a, I mean, really, continental philosophy, in a sense, comes out of a critique of method, right? It comes out of a critique of Cartesianism. It comes out of a critique of the essentially imperial colonizing um, assumptions behind uh, a lot of this. And so it's like, We still have to have some kind of a method. And and what I like about this approach is he's not saying he's figured out the best method. And he's not trying to convince us to adopt his method. He's mainly saying, this is what I think has helped me, a a dumb fuck, get to where I've made some genuine discoveries. And so for all of us, I think we have to figure out what method we need. And in some cases, that method might have certain countermeasures against your own predispositions, right? If you're a really fast, eclectic uh, kind of thinker, then like some kind of like a slow down, get ordered, you know, principle might be in order. But if you're already crazy principled, ordered, and Descartes just your actual uh, super ego, then I mean, you don't need to worry about it, right? Maybe you actually need something some kind of experiences that are going to really get you out of your element. You know, maybe you should go to Thailand for a few years or something. And so, um, I'm I'm mainly doing this at this point in this conversation because I, I really want to emphasize that I get stuff personally from him. Um, there's a lot of things about theory underground that, uh, resonate here, uh, and that can be applied to broader based political critical projects, but at the same time, um, it is just his method. We're not here to try to copy his method. We are here trying to think, what is our own method? And, you know, in what ways might it come into conflict with this one? And so everyone, this is just everybody's individual task. And anybody who just goes, oh, I know the answer to that, and they just spit out their, their method. It's like, oh, my God, did you really, did you... You just come out with that off the top of your head. It's like it's one of these things that we want to think about for a long time. But the the that piece that is on the website Theory Underground called Three Principles of Study as a Way of Life is my first major development of trying to have a method, right? And it's mainly meant to counter the worst tendencies of the attention economy that have so much shaped me. So Yeah, that's what I got for that part. So, yeah, 
Yeah, I am. I am glad you brought up the three principles because um, outside of theory underground, um, it's just a bunch of people. It's peacocking. People peacock, and and um, I mean, I don't really give a shit about any of that anymore. Like, um, we are in this in this. Pit, position of like our house is crumbling around us the foundation is shaky we all feel it we all know it things are only getting worse um and yeah we we need to do something about it and instead of just picking up our phone and being like hey bestie you know watch me watch me play my fiddle while my city burns like that's what we're all doing constantly yeah. Yeah. um and i don't i don't want to do that um, I mean, and I, I have tendencies where I, I do just want to, I want to get fucked up and, and like, um, go to oblivion where nothing exists and nothing matters and I don't have to deal with anything anymore. Um, but no, having a method kind of forces you like, it's, it's like, you're able to slap yourself and say, don't be a bitch and you're doing it to yourself. <laughs> yeah. So no one's assaulted. No one's offended. It's at no one's expense. It's you doing it to yourself. So it's not like it's not like you're forcing it upon someone else. And that's we need that. We do. You want to take it from here? Part three. Some moral rules derived from the method. In planning to rebuild one's house, it is not enough to draw upon the plant to draw up the plants for the new dwelling, tear down the old one, and provide materials and obtain workmen for the task. We must see that we are provided with a comfortable place to stay while the work of rebuilding is going on. Similarly, in my own case, while reason obliged me to be irresolute in my beliefs, there was no reason why I should be so in my actions. In order to live as happily as possible during the interval, I prepared a provisional code of morality for myself consisting of three or four maxims, which I hear set forth. He built himself a nice little, like, temporary house <laughs> while he tears down the other house. And I really love this. Instead of just going, I don't believe in anything, man. I'm a nihilist. And I also, like, just touch people whenever I want to, however I want to, because I'm a Deluso Guattari and ooh, ooh. Instead, he's like, um, we're going to be clinical about this. I'm going to... Uh, to step out of this house but before I tear that one down I'm going to set myself up a nice little <laughs> intermediary house I love this analogy yeah it's like the people that that say uh, again from like the YouTube atheist debate world and the Google plus atheist world like the people who are always like without God you know I'd be murdering people and fucking kids <laughs> um, and, and it's like, yeah. really, the idea of God is the only thing that keeps you from doing that shit. First of all, I don't believe it. I've ne I've never believed a person that said that. Um, but like, oh my God, like, imagine what, like, of course you need, like, you need a fucking, uh, if nothing else, a temporary dwelling. Um, yeah, of course. But the fact that he's taking that into account and being deliberate about it, um, I think that's probably like, yeah, a lot of other people would get caught out in that situation where they would find themselves not knowing how to react to something. Um, well, yeah, like when w that's why a lot of people go so hard when they first come out of religion. They go so hard in the atheist world because they don't have a safety net. And so they're just like, fuck it. I'm going to go. I'm going to be a toxic fucking asshole to everybody. 100%, 100%. The first was to obey the laws and customs of my country, constantly retaining the religion in which, by God's grace, I had been brought up since childhood, and in all other matters to follow the most moderate and least excessive opinions to be found in the practices of the more judicious part of the community in which I would live. For I was then about to discard my own opinions in order to re-examine them, and meanwhile could do no better than to follow those of the most reliable judges. While there may be, no doubt, just as reliable persons among the Parisians, Persians, or the Chinese as among ourselves, it seemed more practical to pattern my conduct on that of the society in which I would have to live. Dude, 
Dude, Furthermore, <laughs> yeah, he's he's he keeps doing this this cosmopolitan <laughs> thing that is so so progressive. Like he's actually. <laughs> He is mm-hmm. so progressive coming from like the goddamn 1600s. It's like, yeah, he's like, look, I don't, I'm not saying we're better than Persians or Chinese people. I'm just saying I have to live around French people. So I'll go <laughs> ahead and just take their customs to be true. <laughs> but I believe I believe him when he says too. it. I do, too. I don't be- I like I don't I don't care when people say this shit now, when people do this now, it's, it's totally performative now. Right. But I believe him. I don't think, I don't think he was getting like, uh, I don't think anybody gave him kudos for saying that back then. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Like no, nobody was like retweeting him for saying that. In fact, people, (laughs) there were probably people who threw the book out the window and were like, I want my money back because they read that line, you know? Them dirty Chinamen, they can't be as good as us. <laughs> There's no <What>? way. Because <laughs> he, he already said the thing about how, like, if you take a person from France and you raise them in China or in Germany, mm-hmm. they're going to be very Chinese or German, you know? Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, that's, I mean... I don't know. I just to me, to me, there's so many things. Uh, I'd say the, the majority of this is, it comes off like, like, almost as applicable today. That's what when I was getting the food earlier, mm-hmm. you were talking about that. I was like, man, that's the biggest thing that you're struck by by this is like, I think people get so caught up on the way things looked back then. They look at the world and they see, oh, horse-drawn buggies, and they see, look at this guy. He looks like he's wearing some. What is this robe thing going on? What, what kind of a hat is that? We fixate on these little things. But then if you actually get inside the head of a person from back then and you read them, you're like, oh, damn. We're like the same. We're like the same. Yeah. In fact, it's not even been very long. Like, this isn't very long ago. Like, less, less than a microsecond, you know, in the cosmic scheme of things. Yeah. Oh, Descartes. Okay, I promise not to interrupt for a while. Furthermore, it seemed to me that to learn people's true opinions, I should pay attention to their conduct rather than to their words. Not only because in our corrupt times there are few who are ready to say all that they believe, but also because many are not aware of their own beliefs. Since the mental process of knowing a thing is distinct from and can occur without the mental process of knowing that that we know. (laughs) That's what I'm talking about! (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is this is uh I, I know I promised, but I also said <laughs> earlier that I would talk about this when we got to this point. And so mm-hmm. was it Rumsfeld said that there's no knowns, uh no uh known uh, unknowns uh, and no unknown unknowns. Unknown unknown un- unknowns? Yeah, yeah. Well, because he was saying we don't know what we don't know. That was that's how he said yeah. it, and and so saying we don't know what we don't know is like saying an unknown unknown. And then Slavoj Žižek says the one thing that he didn't think that he didn't consider are the unknown knowns, and that is the fact that we know things that we don't know that we know. And Descartes just preempted that by saying, mm-hmm. "Yeah, people know things they don't even know that they know." Where's mm-hmm. that? Where's the quote? Where is it? Can you highlight it? Yeah. Yeah, he says I should pay Maybe attention. The hell. To, I should pay attention to their conduct rather than to their words. Not only because in our corrupt times there are few who are ready to say all that they believe. So that's first. That's very relatable. We live in a time where it seems, yeah, most people are not going to tell you most of the things that they do believe. But more importantly, he says. Many are not aware of their own beliefs since the mental process of knowing a thing is distinct from and can, and can occur without the mental process of knowing that we know it. That's, this, is, this is a philosophy as like living the examined life. It's all about trying to figure out those things that we actually believe that we actually never signed up for. Right, that's what doxa is. That's what ideology is. That's what common sense is. Like all of these, we or when we talk about presupp- presuppositional frames or like the fundamental assumptions, the point is, is like 
yeah, if you signed up for that one after really thinking it through and you, you're like, yeah, I stand behind that, then cool. Um, we can go from there. But if you keep talking and acting in such a way because you fundamentally believe something, but you've actually never thought about the fact that you believe that thing, and you've never worked it through consciously, so you've never actually assented to believing it. You just believe it in this weird, not conscious way. Yeah, that um, that sucks. Um, if you're, I mean, I mean, it could be fine, I guess, but um, if it, it, not if you're trying to live that examined life, and not if you're trying to actually make any sort of a conscious change. All right, now I really am done. But that was that was the part that I'd been thinking about earlier. So, yeah. <laughs> Among a number of opinions equally widely accepted, I chose only the most moderate, partly because these are always the most convenient in practice and since excess is usually bad, presumably the best, but also so that I should stray a shorter distance from the true road in case I should make a mistake. Then I would in choosing one extreme when it was the other that should have been followed. In particular, I considered as excessive all the promises by which we abandoned some of our freedom. Not that I disapproved of the laws which, to remedy the inconstancy of, of vacillating spirits, permit them to make bonds or contracts which oblige them to pres preserve with their intentions, provided the intentions are good, or at least not bad, but because I recognize that nothing is unchanging. And that in my own case, I was proposing to improve my judgment more and more, not to make it worse. It would therefore have been a major violation of common sense if I obliged myself to continue to accept a thing I formally approved after it ceased merit, ceased to merit approval or after I altered my opinion on it. My second maxim was to be as firm and determined in my actions as I could be and not to act on the most doubtful decisions. Once I had made them, any less resolutely than on the most certain. In this matter, I patterned my behavior on that of travelers who, finding themselves lost in a forest, must not wander about, now turning this way, now that, and still less should remain in one place, but should go as straight as they can in the direction they first select and not change the direction except for the strongest reasons. By this method, even if the direction was chosen at random, they will presumably arrive at some destination. Not perhaps they, where they would like to be, but at least where they will be better off than in the middle of the forest. Similarly, situations in life often permit no delay, and when we cannot determine the course which is certainly best, we must follow the one which is probably the best. And when we cannot determine even that, we must nevertheless select one and follow it thereafter as though it were certainly best. If the course selected is not indeed a good one, at least the reasons for selecting it are excellent. This frame of mind freed me also from the repentance and remorse commonly felt by those vacillating individuals who are always seeking as worthwhile things which they later judge to be bad. My third maxim was always to seek to conquer myself rather than fortune, to change my desires rather than the established order, and generally to believe that nothing except our thoughts is wholly under our control, so that after we have done our best in external matters, what remains to be done is absolutely impossible, at least as far as we are concerned. This maxim in itself should suffice to prevent me from desiring in the future anything which I could not acquire, and thus to make me happy. For it is in our nature to desire only that which we imagine to be somehow attainable. And if we consider all external benefits equally beyond our reach, we will no more regret being unjustly deprived of our birthright than we, than, than we regret not possessing the kingdoms of China or Mexico. Thus, making a virtue of necessity, we no more desire to be well when we are sick. Or to, be, or to be free when we are in prison, then we now desire bodies as incorruptible as diamonds, or wings to fly like birds. But I must admit that it takes much practice and frequently repeated, repeated meditations to become accustomed to view things in this manner. And I think that this must have been the principal secret of those philosophers of ancient times who were able to rise above fortune and, despite pains and poverty, to vie with the gods in happiness. Being constantly occupied and considering the limits imposed upon them by nature, they were so perfectly convinced that nothing was really theirs but their thoughts, that that, that alone was sufficient to keep them from any concern in other things. Their control of their thoughts, on the other hand, was so absolute that they had some justification for considering themselves richer and more powerful, more free and happier, than any other man who did not have this philosophy, and who, however much he might be favored by nature and fortune, had no such control over his desires. 
I I would like to problematize where he's saying we don't wish to have perfect bodies and wings to fly. Um, but I think I can do that on my own time. Nowadays we do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We de- we definitely yeah. But yeah, um, I think that's a consequence of of like the lie of modernity and and like post post modernity kind of like right. egging us on. Um, I think probably in his time, yeah, pe- people were um, more rational probably yeah. back then. He is addressing an audience of people who probably at least read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics and some Marcus Aurelius and had a. What you'll get from those two thinkers is a basic sort of sense for prudence. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, which in a sort of sense is like, yeah, you, instead of staring at the n- little narcissist mirror of, of TikTok and, and being told these beauty standards that are complete bullshit, right? You're instead engaging with like these thinkers who are all about like that bitch slap. Psh, stop it. Stop being a bitch. <laughs> yeah. Psh, perfection is wrong. Psh, no such thing. Psh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Finally, I plan to make a review of the various occupations possible in this life in order to choose the best. So practical. Without <laughs> intending to disparage other occupations. <laughs> I thought I could do no better than to continue in the one I was engaged in, employing my life and improving my mind and increasing as far as I could my knowledge of the truth by following the method that I had outlined for myself. I had experienced such periods of great happiness after I had begun to use this method that I could hope for no greater or more innocent joys in this life. In discovering day after day truths which seemed fairly important and generally unknown to other men, I was filled with such satisfaction that other considerations did not affect me. Another reason for my decision was that the three maxims previously considered were based on my plan to continue the search for truth. For as God has given each one of us some ability to distinguish the true from the false, I should not have I should not have been content for one instant to rely on the opinions of others if I had not planned to use my own judgment at the proper time. Nor could I have followed those opinions with a clear conscience if I had not hoped to take advantage of every opportunity to find better ones, if better ones there were. And finally, I could not have limited my desires nor been happy if I were not following a path by which I expected to obtain all the knowledge of which I was capable and, by the same token, all the real values to which I might aspire. Besides, since our will neither seeks nor avoids anything except as it is judged good or bad by our reason, good judgment is sufficient to guarantee good behavior. Judging as best one can therefore implies that one acts as well as one can, or, in other words, that one will acquire all the virtues and with them all other possible goods. Once we are sure of this, we cannot well fail fail to be happy. After thus assuring myself of these maxims, and having put them aside with the truths of the faith, which have always been most certain to me, I judge that I could proceed freely to reject all my other beliefs. And inasmuch as I hope to obtain my end more more readily by conversing with men than by remaining any longer in my warm retreat, where I had all these thoughts, I proceeded on my way before winter was wholly past. In the nine years that followed, I wandered here and there throughout the world, trying everywhere to be spectator rather than actor in all the comedies that go on. I took particular pains in judging each thing to seek out whatever elements of uncertainty it contained, which might cause us to conceive false opinions about it. Meanwhile, I tried to clear my mind of all the errors that had previously accumulated. In this, I did not wish to imitate the skeptics who doubted only for the sake of doubting and intended to remain always irresolute. On the contrary, my whole purpose was to achieve greater certainty and to reject the loose earth and sand in favor of rock and clay. In all these things, I seemed to succeed well enough, for as I was trying to discover the falsity or uncertainty of the propositions I was examining, not by feeble conjectures but by clear and assured reasonings, I encountered nothing that did not lead me to some certain conclusions, even if it were only that the matter was wholly uncertain. And just as in tearing down a building, we usually retain the debris to help build a new one. So in destroying all of my opinions, which seemed to be ill-founded, I made many observations and acquired much experience, which has since aided me in establishing more certain knowledge. In addition, I continued to practice my method, which I had decided upon. And besides conducting all my thoughts according to its rules, 
I set aside a few hours now and then for practice upon mathematical difficulties. In some cases, I even practiced upon some other difficulties which could be made to parallel mathematical ones by rejecting those principles of the sciences in question, which I did not find sufficiently well established, as I have just explained in some of my other writings. Thus, I lived, in appearance, just like those who have nothing to do without the vices, to enjoy their leisure without ennui, and to occupy their time with all the respectable amusements oh, available. Uh, skip the line. But, uh-oh. Thus I lived, in appearance, just like those who have nothing to do, but, oh, I sure did, but to live a pleasant and innocent life, and attempt to obtain the pleasures without the vices, to enjoy their leisure without ennui, and to occupy their time with all the respectable amusements available. But in reality, I never de desisted from my design, and continued to achieve greater acquaintance with truth, perhaps more than I would have if I had only read books or sought the society of men of letters. In any case, nine years passed before I reached my decision about the difficulties ordinarily in dispute among the learned, and before I sought to lay the groundwork of a philosophy more certain than popular belief. The example of several men of excellent abilities who had previously attempted my task and who, in my opinion, had failed, made me fear so many difficulties that I should perhaps not have dared to start so soon if I had not learned of a rumor that I had already completed my philosophy. <laughs> I did not know on what such an opinion was based. If I contributed somewhat to it by my conversation, it must have been by confessing my ignorance more freely than is usually the case among those who have studied a little, and possibly also by presenting my reasons for doubting many things that others deemed certain. I am sure that I did not boast of any doctrines. But I did not want to be taken for more than I was, and so I thought that I should try by all means to make myself worthy of my reputation. Just eight years ago, therefore, I decided to abandon those places where I would be among acquaintances and retired to Holland, where the long duration of the war produced such conditions that the armies billeted there seemed, to, seemed but to guarantee the fruits of peace. There, in the midst of a great and busy people, more interested in their own affairs than curious about those of others, I was able to enjoy all the comforts of life to be found in the most populous cities, while living in as solitary and retired a fashion as though in the most remote of deserts. Dude. <laughs> I love this paragraph. There's so much in it. We can just... We could really tarry with it, but I, I, I just want to at least touch on this. <clears throat> he's like... He's like... Basically living the lifestyle of, of a dandy, of an aesthete, going about his life, just, he said, trying to be a, a spectator, not an actor, in all of the comedies, which is to call life and everything that's going on in life a bunch of comedies, first of all. I love, I love it. And, and he's like, I'm just trying to be a spectator here, you know? And, he, and he's like, from the outside, if anybody's looking at me, they're just going to assume... I'm just like everybody else. But in reality, I'm over here constructing my philosophy. But then he's like, I've really set myself a crazy task. So many people keep failing at this task. I'm taking it so seriously. I'm really taking my time. And then he's like, oh shit, but I had to really, really actually live up to some kind of a reputation that I started to develop. I have no idea how I started to develop this reputation. But people were just saying, Descartes already finished his philosophy. <laughs> And he's like, no, I, I had it. I had not finished it. And in fact, he wasn't even talking about it. He wasn't telling people that he was working on this. So, so how did the rumor get around? I have no idea. Like the, the hero we deserved. He was the, not, not the hero we asked for, but the hero we deserved or whatever. I'm sure that I did not boast of any doctrines, but because he didn't yeah. want to be taken, but because he didn't want to be taken for more than he was, and he already had this huge reputation, he thought, "Well, I better live up to it." <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, back in the day, in the neighborhood, there were always like neighborhood legends of like, "Oh, that's the dude that fucking." did that one thing that was super awesome like like people's reputations just kind of like they grow 
And I guess no one really knows how or where or why or when exactly. Um, but just like as a consequence of daily life, like things that happen, people talk and, and word gets around. And, you know, um, that's, I, well, I don't want to say that's probably what happened, but like I can, I can picture that and that, that makes me happy to picture it that way where Descartes was just hanging out interacting with people and people were like oh that dude's dope and that's how it happened 100 percent. that fancy I, I like dandy that, french guy that 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 fancy frenchy dandy guy um so yeah and something about reputation i i don't want to get too into it right now but something that uh just talking about how he gets this reputation and then he's got to live up to it and how you're talking about back in the day you know people get this reputation for this or that and then it's like it kind of gets its own reality to it but it's one that people can try to live up to or they they, they spend the rest of their life trying to live against it they don't want to confirm it and so um towards the end he talks about the reason why i think i think if i remember this part in part six correctly he actually says that he's gonna publish his main works at posthumously like after he's dead because if he he says that if he if he's putting it all out there while he's alive then he's gonna have to worry about his reputation and if he's worrying about his reputation, then he's not worrying about the subject matters that he's trying to, to learn about. And I really like that. And it's, and I, I almost feel like it's, it's impossible to do that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't know. I think a lot of people want to have a podcast, want to have a YouTube channel, think about publishing a book. But at the same time, they, they realize that any kind, on the one side, if it didn't get any interaction, that'd be discouraging. On the other side, if it gets too much attention, it's going to mess up everything because then they'll be focused on trying to maintain or salvage their, their reputation when they never even got to, to doing the thing that they really wanted to do. And it's like, that's why I, I, I wish that we could just all love the process. You know what I mean? If I wish that we could just idolize being a student and, and let that be the model instead of like, oh, we have to be the genius professor. Instead, it's like, no, I want to be a student and like student as a way of life, you know. Um, because other like, if you're a student and, and you're wrong, then it's like, well, of course I'm wrong. I'm a student. I'm still trying to figure it out. But if you're a professor and you're some great, you know, well-esteen professor, then, you, then you're wrong. And it's like, oh, everyone's like, oh, he's wrong. That, that tells us so much, you know, that, that gets around. And it's like... But yeah, people are supposed to. I mean, really, how are you going to make some great contribution without teaching? Obviously, you have to teach, and you have to be a student. And so, I don't know. Prolonged student period. I'm just. I can't advocate for it enough. Even though, I, I see myself as having at least another, you know, couple of lifetimes ahead of me of doing that. So it's like, I don't know. It's the only solution, I think. So part four, I, I want to say a couple things about the way that this is divided up. I should have said this all at the beginning, but, you know, no time like the present. So part one was basically some scientific considerations. He was talking about his experience um, in academia and uh, what he liked and what he didn't like. Part two was the, those four principles of his method. Part three was his moral rules, which were basically like go with the flow of whoever is looked up to in your society, like go with the people who seem to have it together and, uh, you know, trust them. Because if you're putting all of your own presuppositions into suspension, um, y you probably should just kind of go with custom until you actually have some sense for what you're doing. Um, now... We're getting into the section on God, soul, theology, and metaphysics. And I've seen people who are like Eastern Orthodox bros 
were like, you know, kind of right wing Heideggerian philosopher types or other other approaches um, that are for various reasons anti modern. Um, hating on Descartes because they think that he's actually a liar um, in in these kinds of sections. Like he doesn't believe in God. He's actually an atheist, or his he's a kind of deist. Like our founding fathers were mostly they, this kind of deist that they don't have a lot of positive beliefs. But there's like this. Oh, there's a first mover, and it's good, and it is what it is. You know. And uh, while I while I while I want to keep on the table that he is being a hundred percent with us and that he actually really wants to see a harmonious relationship between mutually respecting of one another's lanes, church and, and state or, or, or church and science actually. Um, but I want to keep that on the table. I also do want us to kind of pay attention in these next three sections for what he does to allow for that interpretation because he's basically the father of thinking about the world and of everything in it as a, a big clockwork mechanism, right? And we're all part of that. Um, does it need a creator? Does that creator need to be the god of Christianity? Um, just keep these kind of questions in mind and let's, let's, let's get into it. I'll take it from the top. Okay, part four. Proofs of the existence of God and of the human soul. I do not know whether I ought to touch upon my first meditations here, for they are so metaphysical and out of the ordinary that they might not be interesting to most people. Nevertheless, in order to show whether my fundamental notions are sufficiently sound, I find myself more or less constrained to speak of them. I had noticed for a long time that in practice it is sometimes necessary to follow opinions which we know to be very uncertain, just as though they were indubitable, as I stated before. But inasmuch as I desired to devote myself wholly to the search for truth, I thought that I should take a course precisely contrary and reject as absolutely false anything of which I could have the least doubt in order to see whether anything would be left after this procedure which could be called wholly certain. So, yeah. If it's questionable, assume it's wrong. Thus, as our senses deceive us at times, we... I was ready to suppose that nothing was at all the way our senses represented them to be. As there are men who make mistakes in reasoning even on the simplest topics in geometry, I judged that I was as liable to error as any other and rejected as false all the reasoning which I had previously accepted as valid demonstration. Finally, as the same precepts which we have when awake may come to us when asleep without their being true, I decided to suppose that nothing had ever entered my mind. Nothing that had enter, entered my mind was more real than the illusions of my dreams. But I soon noticed that while I, that while I thus wished to think everything false, it was necessarily true that I who thought the. That it was I who. Th Sorry, is that wrong? Is that is that is that a bad par sentence? necessarily true that I who thought so was something? Oh, no, no. It's just a clunky way of saying things. He says, but I soon noticed that while I thus wished to think everything false, it was necessarily true that I who thought so was something. Meaning, like, I who thought therefore existed. Since this truth, I think, therefore I am, was so firm and assured that all the most extravagant suppositions of the skeptics were unable to shake it, I judged that I could safely accept it as the first principle of the philosophy I was seeking. Yes, I think therefore I am. I then examined closely that I was, and saw I could imagine that I had no body, 
and that there was no world nor any place that I occupied, but that I could not imagine for a moment that I did not exist. See, I'm fucking this up. I keep fucking up. Sorry, Nance. You're so much. You're, you're just a way better reader than me today, but I'm all over the place. I'm gonna reread it. He says, "I then examined closely what I was." and saw that I could imagine that I had no body and that there was no world nor any place that I occupied, but that I could not imagine for a moment that I did not exist. On the contrary, from the very fact that I doubted the truth of other things, it followed very evidently and very certainly that I existed. On the other hand, if I had ceased to think while all the rest of what I had ever imagined remained true, I would have had no reason to believe that I existed. Therefore, I concluded that I was a substance whose whole essence or nature was only to think, and which, to exist, has no need of space nor of any material thing. Thus it follows that this ego, this soul, by which I am what I am, is entirely distinct from the body and is easier to know than the latter, and that even if the body were not, the soul would not cease to be all that it is now. You remember that song, um, Butterfly by Crazy Town? Yeah. So when I initially listened to this, this paragraph, um, that song started playing in my head. Um, and it was because <laughs> the, you know, the, uh, I can't remember the dude's name now. The I, I had a dream that I was a butterfly, and then I woke up, and I am I the butterfly or am I me? Schwangza or whatever, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's basically this, kind of. Like, yeah. especially when he's talking about the dream, but then, like, the self and me and, well, I am me and I can't deny, blah, 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 blah. Like, that's... I kind of lump those two together. Um, it's definitely related, yeah. And then... Uh, and then the song Butterflies, like just so for like all day yesterday and all day today, I've just been hearing Crazy Town in my head. Um, <laughs> and it's it's kind of funny because it. OK, so. The butterfly thing, but also because it it's it's very. Like, of course, this was groundbreaking, like this was like new at the time, but like these are ideas that I was having when I was younger than I am now. And so it feels juvenile in a way. And it's not like it, it truly isn't. It is profound. It remains profound, but it feels juvenile. Um, and it's like, you have to, you have to work to take it seriously or else you'll just kind of pass over without realizing how profound it really is. Like, this is not just crazy town. Like, this is, this is <laughs> legit. Yeah. But like, on the surface, it appears to be silly. It's, it's, it's hard to imagine, I think, for a lot of us, thinking that just because you can imagine, you just, okay, going, well, I can't imagine not thinking or no, no I can't imagine not existing but I can not imagine not having a body then going therefore I'm probably mostly mental or like I'm, I know I'm essentially inherently this soul ego mental thing and not this physical thing right it's like but why what is your ability to imagine something have like why is your faculty of imagination so definitive for you at this point like oh i can't imagine not existing but i can imagine not having a body therefore and it's like well how are you how are you going to do something fundamental from the capacity of your imagination like i guess that to me cuz i think we're just so used to sticking to what's empirical what's grounded that that seems kind of out there but there's a logic to it though right it's like yeah it does make sense like he's trying to he stripped away everything and he's like the only thing that I really have is that I'm a thinking being huh 
Now, well, no, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that, but I'll keep going. Next, I considered in general what is required of a proposition for it to be true and certain. For since I had just discovered one to be such, I thought I ought also to know of what that certitude consisted. I saw that there was nothing at all in the statement, I think therefore I am, to assure me that I was saying the truth, unless it was that I saw very clearly that to think one must exist. So I judged that I could accept as a general rule that the things which we can see very clearly and very distinctly are always true, but that there may well be some difficulty in deciding which are those which we conceive distinctly. All of that's to say is that his epistemology sort of comes out of this fundamental assumption, I think, therefore I am. Because he goes, well, why? Why does that ring true? Well, it rings true because it's clear and distinct. Okay, well, then clearness and distinctness must be the, the proper criteria of truth. After that, I reflected upon the fact that I... Oh, and by the way, here, actually, in case you want to take any notes or add to the document there, Nance, I'm going to share it to you. So you've got access. Okay. Sent to your Gmail. After that, I reflected upon the fact that I doubted and that, in consequence, my spirit was not wholly perfect, for I saw clearly that it was a greater perfection to know than to doubt. I decided to ascertain from what source I had learned to think of something more perfect than myself, and it appeared evident that it must have been from some nature which was, in fact, more perfect. As for my idea... See, this is all where it's like, when you're actually reading the meditations, whenever he gets to this part, it's like, it's like, what, because you can imagine something more perfect than yourself, then you assume that there must be something more, well, then there really must be something more perfect than myself, because I'm imagining it, that there must be something more perfect than myself. And there's also this distinction between knowledge and doubting, and he's saying, clearly, it's greater, it's a greater perfection to know than to doubt. It's like, yeah, that that idealism is um, like, I mean, I don't know. I've never actually really examined it because it's like, well, that's silly. There's right. a perfect triangle off somewhere in, in on the edge of the universe. That's silly to me. But I've never really taken the time to sit with and understand even what they're trying to say or, or what they are saying. Um so yeah, it's clunky. It's it's unwieldy. It's hard to read. Yeah, I decided to ascertain from what source I had learned to think of something more perfect than myself, and it, and it appeared evident that it must have been from some nature, which was in fact more perfect. As for my ideas about many other things outside of me, as the sky, earth, light, heat, and thousands of other things. I was not so much troubled to discover where they came from because I found nothing in them superior to my own nature. If they really existed, I could believe that whatever perfection they possessed might be derived from my own nature. If they did not exist, I could believe that they were derived from nothingness, that is, that they were derived from my own, def from my own defects. Yeah, this whole paragraph is worth like untangling for a while but this could not be the explanation of my idea of a being more perfect than my own to derive it from nothingness was manifestly impossible and it is no less repugnant to good sense to assume what is more perfect comes from and depends on the less perfect than it is to assume that something comes from nothing so that I could not assume that it came from myself thus the only hypothesis left was that <laughs> This is the only hypothesis yeah. left. <laughs> uh, thus, the only hypothesis left was that this idea was put in my mind by a nature that was really more perfect than I was, which had all the perfections that I could imagine, and which was, in a word, God. <laughs> to this, I added that since I knew... Okay. All right. 
uh, let's be proper Straussians here. So, uh, I say Straussian because he Strauss wrote that piece called uh, uh, Fuck, what is the name of this? Do you, uh, writing Under Persecution? Persecution and the Art of Writing by Leo Strauss. Okay. So, this, now, the suspicious way of reading texts that assumes that the author is hoping that you're smarter than to take them at their word, um, that approach existed before Leo Strauss, but Leo Strauss is the person who's kind of famous for it. Um, and in the world of uh, progressive, liberal, Democrat academia, um, Leo Strauss is the, the quintessential neoconservative and the mastermind of the war on terror. Okay, so I don't know uh, how much of that's true or not. Like Tony from One Dime uh, at the two-day marathon event said that he thinks that that is uh, wrong and it's basically a conspiracy theory. Um, but there's, there's, there, he's he's definitely a conservative. He definitely believes in natural right, um, natural law, human nature, some of these things that obviously post-structuralists don't. And so, um, now I, I only say all of that as a sort of quick bio sketch. But what, what matters about him in this context is that, yeah, he's kind of the one who's known for this, this approach to reading that, 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 that reads things this way. And it's, it's the, 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 the piece that I'm kind of referencing throughout all of this is persecution and the art of writing, something that maybe one of these days we'll do an exegetical of because it's fantastic. So with that all out of the way, though, I just, yeah... Uh, one of the things that he says is that there's all kinds of things. Let's let's go with Plato's Republic. There's all kinds of things where it's like um, there is an art. The whole thing is making the mo like it's making sense and it's rigorous as fuck, and the whole thing is so rigorous. But then there's like this moment where it's like, how do we get here? We just went through several absurdities that do not follow from one another at all. And this is basically the art of esoteric writing. So the way that you... So esoteric means you're writing to an in-group. Exoteric means you're writing to an out-group. And all great authors supposedly were doing both at the same time, at least in this tradition of reading. And so... Even if you don't think that an author is doing that, it's good to always kind of keep it in mind. When you get to a part where you trip up and laugh because it's so absurd. Because, like, guess what? You can believe in God and not say that we've already removed all options from the table and the only remaining hypothesis left was that this idea was put into my mind by a nature that was really more perfect than I was. Right? Like that... So it's just like everything up until this point is like, yeah, that follows, that follows. Oh, that makes sense. That's very reasonable. That's very reasonable. Oh, totally rigorous, rigorous, rigorous. And then all of a sudden he, he says this paragraph and it's like, what? So the point is, is this is one of those things we got to kind of keep, you know, keep paying attention to because does his method actually hinge on this paragraph? Do you think people are going to be more impacted by his method that he's led up to this paragraph with or by this paragraph, right? And so obviously if you're the censor, if you're the uh, – if you're working for the, sta the, the church state and you're, you're looking over this, you go, oh, okay, absolutely. Yeah, that follows. That makes sense. And if you're an idiot who's just looking for the part where it says God is the only thing that makes sense – then you, you're going to go to this paragraph and you're going to be like, ah, I'm satisfied. And then Descartes doesn't have to worry about you dragging him out of his house, 
tarring and feathering him, putting him in the stockade, hanging, drawing, and quartering, torturing, whatever. No, he doesn't have to worry about that because he's done his little thing that you've got to do. Which is why there's actually some contemporary authors who like do like what seems like cynical woke shit where I actually have to wonder if like their Twitter presence, for instance, is like, are they just doing this? Right? Like, and it makes it hard because it's like, I want people to just tell you what they actually believe. But I think that if the person cares more about you drawing your own conclusions than about you taking their beliefs on faith in their expertise or their authority, and they really don't care about their honor in, in this broader sense, and they really do care about the method impacting you then they really might do that kind of a thing that that like my ego is always going to have a problem with it like just I have such a hard time like the idea of like something like that it just runs so counter to me but but I can get it though yeah but this shit about his nature and, and, and the idea of something more perfect than his nature and then also nothingness I like this all of this stuff here is just like I don't know I want to come back to it if we have time but I'll just keep reading so um, to this I added that since I knew some per perfections which I did not possess I was not the only being in existence I will hear you use freely if you will pardon me the terms of the schools and that it followed of necessity that there was someone else more perfect upon whom I depended and from whom I had acquired all that I possessed. For if I had been alone and independent of anything else, so that I had bestowed upon myself all that limited qu quantity of, va of value which I shared with the perfect being, I would have been able to get from myself in the same way all the surplus which I recognize as lacking in me and so would have been myself infinite, eternal, immutable, omniscient, omnipotent, and in sum, I would possess all the perfections that I could discover in God. So, if solipsism was true, then he wouldn't be able to imagine things more perfect than himself. And he also has lacks. He also has nothingness. He also has imperfections. Um, and so solipsism is not true because he has an idea of something more perfect? I don't know if we're supposed to believe him or not, but, but, we'll, but it's, uh, we'll keep going. For following the reasoning which I have just explained, to know the nature of God as far as I was capable of such knowledge, I had only to consider each quality of which I had an idea and decide whether it was or was not a perfection to possess it. <clears throat> I would then be certain that none of those which had some imperfection was in him, but that all the others were. I saw that doubt, inconsistent, incon inconstancy, sorrow, and similar things could not be part of God's nature, since I would be happy to be without them myself. In addition, I had ideas of many sensible and corporeal entities, for although I might suppose that I was dreaming, and that all that I saw or imagined was false, I could not at any rate deny that the ideas were truly in my consciousness. Since I had already recognized very clearly that intelligent nature is distinct from corporeal nature, I considered that that competition that composition is at an evidence of dependency and the dependency is manifestly a defect jeez okay i want to so since i had already recognized very clearly that intelligent nature is distinct from corporeal nature so he's setting apart mind from matter i considered that that composition is an evidence of dependency and that dependency is manifestly a defect. Does composition in this sense mean like the fact that something's made up of something? That's the only, yeah, I, I think. Okay. And so is that kind of like saying, well, 
the world is made up of things and they're all composed in such and such a way. That means that that's all yeah, dependent uh, on something and that dependency is manifestly a defect. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's like how people want to discount contingency. Like people want to pretend that contingency is a bad thing. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, and it's this, it's this very mindset, I think, that is implicated there. Um, yeah. Because it's... Because contingency was not planned on, was not premeditated, was not, uh, and therefore it's it's outside of the order of things. Well, because yeah, because it's not directed by God's will, right? Yeah. Like at that point, c- contingency, um, it's it's as a consequence of of something else, so it's not moved by the prime mover, so therefore it's defective. Okay. He said that from this calling it, saying that things that are dependent are a, have a defect or are defected. He says, from this, I judge that it could not be a perfection in God to be composed of these two natures, and that consequently he was not so composed. Right? So if matter is de- the composition of matter is dependent on mind and dependency is a defect then clearly god is not going to be corporeal will just be mental but if there were in the world bodies or even intelligences or other natures that were not wholly perfect their being must depend on god's power in such a way that they could not subsist without him for a single moment. So on the one side, like it, it is worth thinking, like how could an actual genius believe these things, right? That's always worth thinking. And then not just, oh, like how can they? So we give ourselves a high five for not being, for not thinking this way, but also so that we can try on like the the radical exercise of like what are the conditions of possibility for being able to think that this is all like the most rigorous thing that you could possibly say right like to be able to do that work would be a worthwhile endeavor um but with setting that aside for the moment um whether he is a, a devote a, a, a devout religious uh, man or not we do I, I, I think it's very clear that he wants her to be um, a, uh, he wants the church and science to be able to coexist and maybe he wants science in the long run to be able to displace um, religion um, but at least to have that working relationship where they both stay in their lanes there is nothing that's going to be more useful towards that end than to draw a really, really, really hard line in the sand right here. And that's what this paragraph is. This is, he couldn't be more clear. It's like, no, all things physical, all things of the world, those are dependent on God, but God is not of the world. So we can really put God over here as the first mover, but the things of the world, this is the domain of science, right? Like there's the domain of science and there's a domain of God and God, oh, absolutely. Science and everything that it studies, it owes everything to God because God makes it all possible. But he's officially established these lanes, which means that the priest shouldn't be coming over to tell the scientist how Genesis actually works which would be evolution right and for yeah and he it, has to do it in this in this overdone kind of absurd way for the church to accept it exactly and and so so what are the conditions of possibility for someone being able to genuinely think this because if Descartes doesn't genuinely think this I guarantee you there were some really really ecstatic priests who read this shit and were like yes yes he fucking nailed it and the answer is, I think that, you know, theology was one of the main three branches of the university itself, right? And so 
this is the way okay. that theologians talk. <laughs> this is the way that they think. <laughs> what? Well, it makes me want to, like, like I look at it and I'm like, oh, that's 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 absurd. It's not just silly. It's not just from my perspective wrong. It's it's that's fucking absurd. That that would be as absurd to me. Like believing that would be just as unbelievable as if my dog stood up, put on pants, and started smoking a cigarette. Like that's just. <laughs> That's absurd. That's cartoon world shit. It makes me really want to like find the things that I that I hold um, that are just as absurd as that. Like I know I hold some beliefs that are that are wrong. Um, and and it, this makes me want to like discover them. Yeah, and it, you know, part of it might just be that when you have a master signifier quilting everything else for your perception, interpretation, understanding, etc., um, that, y yeah, you try to reverse engineer everything, but that master signifier is still in place. And so if God is that master signifier, then you're working your... Yeah, you can you can go down to the very bottom and, and doubt everything, but you're out, you're ultimately building back up to this point, right? So, yeah. But does Descartes really believe this? Um, functionally, it doesn't matter with the death of the author. Functionally, what he actually does by creating these two lanes is he makes it possible for science to get underway. If it wasn't for this work and then the meditations. Um, Arguably, science would have never really gotten on its way. And then those, or, those orthodox bros would be happy. They'd have everything yeah. they want. Yeah. At this point, I wish to seek for other truths and propose for consideration the object of the geometricians. This I conceived as a continuous body or a space infinitely extended in length, breadth, and height or depth, divisible into various parts which can have different shapes and sizes and can be moved or transposed in any way, all of which is presumed by geometricians to geometricians, I don't know, to be true of their object. I went through some of their simplest demonstrations and noticed that the great certainty which everyone attributes to them is only based on the fact that they are evid evidently conceived, following the rule previously established. I noticed also that there was nothing at all in them to assure me of the existence of their object. It was clear, for example, that if we posit a triangle, its three angles must be equal to two right angles, but there was nothing in that to assure me that there was a single triangle in the world. When I turned back to my idea of a perfect being, on the other hand, I discovered that existence was included in that idea in the same way that the idea of a triangle contains the equality of its angles to two right angles, or that the idea of a sphere includes the equidistance of all its parts from its center. Perhaps, in fact, the existence of the perfect being is even more evident. Consequently, it is at least as certain that God, who is this perfect being, exists as any theorem of geometry could possibly be. What makes people feel that it is difficult to know of the existence of God, or even of the nature of their own souls, is that they never consider things higher than corporeal objects. Yeah, so what makes people, what makes many people feel that it is difficult to know of the existence of God or even of the nature of their own souls is that they never consider things higher than corporeal objects. So it's funny because it's kind of like what Heidegger is saying is like people take these things, these, these they, they take, they take present to hand analysis to be yep. being right. And so, but then we, we start conflating kinds of being and then we end up at a point where we see ourselves this way or whatever. Um, and it's all it's all messed up. And it's like Descartes saying the same thing. He's saying people are taking corporeal objects as their point of departure, and that's why it's hard for them to imagine God existing. But God exists not like how trees exist, but like how triangles exist, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like I think that the, there's something really powerful and intuitive about that idea. It's like there is 
this weird fact that nature is mathematizable, but at the same time, it's never it's never perfect. And so that gives you like this strong sense that like perfection is this thing that exists in the mind. And then you go, okay, but is that just existing in my imagination or is my mind grasping actual objects that are more real than all the stuff of nature, right? So yeah, like you say that you, you, this idealism thing, it's like really easy to like disregard it, but it's also, it's, it's getting at something that I, I think we just don't take seriously enough. And it's like, yeah, mathematics mm-hmm. is not, you know, oh, memorize these formulas and rules. It's supposed to be pure contemplation of pure objects, right? Like, I think that's a really exciting thing to think about. And I wish that math was taught that way, you know? So yeah, people who don't do that, who don't, who, who just think about corporeal objects, they are so accustomed never to think of anything without picturing it. A method of thinking suitable only for material objects. That everything which is not picturable seems to them unintelligible. This is still true to this day. And just wanted to point out, this is what Hegel is calling picture, picture thinking in the phenomenology of spirit. In the preface, he's just dunking on people stuck in picture thinking. And the perfect example of people stuck in picture thinking is right here, right? People just, oh, if, if, if you can't draw it on a graph or like somehow make it relatable to them, using metaphors to stuff in the real world, well, then it's unintelligible. So is, is he doing this, though, a couple paragraphs earlier, where he's like, I can't imagine not thinking, therefore it must be God. Like, is that is that the same? Um, or does the fact that it's already an abstraction, do, does that change it in any way? Yeah, I don't know. It's weird because he, he he did use his ability to imagine not having a body as reason enough to think that the mind is uh, independent of it. Because he couldn't, he can't imagine not, he can't imagine not existing. Is that what he says? I mean. Not, he 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 can't imagine not thinking. Um, okay, therefore, right, thinking right. must that's be right. um, the thing. Whereas he can't imagine not having an, a a body. And I get that it like it's already an abstraction. Like he's not like that. That's already shit that you can't picture. But he does make a, a mighty leap um, based on this inability to imagine it. Um, But I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you're already in fuzzy territory. So, if he is uh, himself doing this, then, like, right after, if he's doing the very thing that he's, if he just did the very thing that he's critiquing, uh, that would add to this. The, ex, the the esoteric. Yeah, that would. Yeah. Yeah. He says, this is also manifest in the fact that even philosophers hold it as a maxim in the schools that there is nothing in the understanding which was not first in the senses, a location where it is clearly evident that the ideas of God and of the soul have never been. It seems to me that those who wish to use imaginary imagery to understand these matters are doing precisely the same thing that they would be doing if they tried to use their eyes to hear sounds or smell odors. There is even this difference, that the sense of sight gives us no less certainty of the truth of objects than do those of smell and hearing, 
while neither our imagery nor our senses could assure us of anything without the cooperation of our understanding. So, yeah, without the cooperation of understanding, even what you see and what you smell wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to make sense of it, right? Well, of course, that makes sense. But what is Context. He, yeah. I think there's a lot more to this paragraph, but I, I want to keep going. Finally, if there are still some men who are not sufficiently persuaded of the existence of God and of their souls by the reasons which I have given, I want them to understand that all the other things of which they might think themselves more certain, such as their having a body or the existence of stars and of an earth and other such things, are less certain. For even though we have a moral assurance of these things such that it seems we cannot doubt them without extravagance, Yet without being unreasonable, we cannot deny that, as far as metaphysical certainty goes, there is sufficient room for doubt. For we can imagine, when asleep, that we have another body and see other stars and another earth without there being any such. How could one know that the thoughts which come to us in dreams are false rather than the others, since they are often no less vivid and detailed? Let the best minds study this question as long as they wish. I do not believe they can find any reason good enough to remove this doubt unless they presuppose the existence of God. The very principle which I took as a rule to start with, namely, that all those things which we conceived very clearly and very distinctly are true, is known to be true only because God exists and because he is a perfect being and because everything in us comes from him. From this it follows that our ideas or notions, being real things which come from God insofar as they are clear and distinct, cannot to that extent be, fail cannot cannot to that extent fail to be true. Consequently, though we often have ideas which contain falsity, they can only be those ideas which contain some confusion and obscurity, in which respect they participate in nothingness. See what? That is to say, they are confused in us only because we are not wholly perfect. It is evident that it is no less repugnant to good sense to assume that falsity or imperfection as such is derived from God, as that truth or perfection is derived from nothingness. But if we did not know that all reality and truth within us came from a perfect and infinite being, however clear and distinct our ideas might be, we would have no reason to be certain that they were endowed with the perfection of being true. To me, this just feels like another pair, like he, he had his paragraph that would have thrown, that threw us off, right? That, and then he had a couple paragraphs to kind of be sensible again. And then he's like, all right, all right. But if anybody wasn't convinced, let me just try again. Um, doubt is always, you can always doubt everything. At the end of the day, Everything is, you can't ever know anything unless God exists behind everything to make it so that you're not being deceived because, the, you know, because there could be an evil demon, uh, you know, showing us what we think yeah. is real. There, we could be in the matrix. We could be in a, in a jar in some scientist's lab, just like a brain in a vat. But whatever it is, um, like, if that's the reality, then we're fucked. And because we just have to kind of bank on not being fucked and go, well, there must be a God behind everything because we do have the capacity to know what's true. We, we know we do. Therefore, God must be ensuring that. Yeah, and I, th I think like without a God, you can, you can still like extract from all of that like this. Um, go along to get along. Like, well, even if, I am deceived, like, I can't do anything about it, so I might as well, as he was saying earlier, um, in, you know, in unfamiliar territory, do as, do as those who are respected and blah, 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 when in Rome, do as the Romans, like, I think you can, you can take that out of that and leave the God behind, like, 
because he comes out and says it like go like just do what makes sense when you when you don't know where you are so even if um so yeah i don't even think the god shit matters if he does believe or doesn't believe i think it's very interesting i think it's very historically interesting but like i'm caring less and less and less about the god shit Get like going through this like at like at first i was like damn he's smoking in the, he's smoking some something and now i'm kind of like yeah whatever it doesn't matter like he's saying shit that still rings true that still should be said like um yeah well and just wait just wait for like the next chapter which is on science like it's actually you can see it down there at the bottom part five some questions of physics you never got this far right no i think um i think i might have started this section yeah so so but i definitely definitely didn't finish it so this is just like in terms of rhetoric and style and even whether he's religious or not or whether he's for the church or not um all of these things we we can never be sure but we do know that he wants to get his point across and so putting his theology section right before his physics section is crucial so what he's what he what he might yeah though he will lose the naive atheist who wants a philosopher to say all the things that they want he is making potentially making a sacrifice here um, in these few paragraphs to really do what he does in this next paragraph Mm -hmm. and the last chapter will really I think prove all of this this reading whether it proves it or not it, it makes it highly plausible Okay, after the knowledge of God and the soul has thus made us certain of our rule, it is easy to see that the dreams which we have when asleep do not in any way cast doubt upon the truth of our waking thoughts. For if it had hap- for if it happened that we had some very distinct idea, even while sleeping, as for example, when a geometrician dreams of some new proof, his sleep does not keep the proof from being good. As for the most common error of dreams, which is to picture various objects in the same way as our external senses represent them to us, it does not matter if this gives us a reason to distrust the truth of the impressions we receive from the senses, because we can also be mistaken in them frequently without being asleep, as when jaundiced persons see everything yellow, or as the stars or 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 as the stars and other distant objects appear much smaller than they really are. For in truth, whether we are asleep or awake, we should never allow ourselves to be convinced except on the evidence of our reason. Note that I say of our reason and not of our imagination or of our senses. For even though we see the sun very clearly, we must not judge thereby that its size is such as we see it. And we can well imagine distinctly the head of a lion mounted on the body of a goat without concluding that a chimera exists in this world. For reason does not insist that all we see or visualize in this way is true, but it does insist that all our ideas or notions must have some foundation in truth, for it would not be possible that God, who is all perfect and wholly truthful, would otherwise have given them to us. Since our reasonings are never as evident or as complete in sleep as in, in as in waking life, although sometimes our imaginations are then as lively and detailed, and detailed as when awake, or even more so. And since reason tells us also that all our thoughts cannot be true, as we are not wholly perfect, whatever of truth is to be found in our ideas will inevitably occur in those which we have when awake, rather than in our dreams. Come, come, my lady. Come, come, my lady. You my butterfly. Yeah. Sugar, <laughs> baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I just have to say the sentence about the chimera 
the lion mounted on the, the head of the lion mounted on the body of a goat. We can imagine it without chimeras actually existing. He ends this chapter with that and mm-hmm. a paragraph about the priority of reason and literally says that imagination can't be trusted. I think that's only what three paragraphs, four paragraphs after saying that like he makes a bunch of deductions on the basis of his imagination. <laughs> so yeah, keeping 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 that in sight. Um, do you wanna jump into this one? I'm gonna be right back. Gotta get, get some clean water. Part five. Some questions of physics. I would have been glad to continue my exposition and exhibit here the whole chain of other truths which I deduced from these basic ones, but for the fact that to do so, I should have to speak of many questions which are in dispute among the learned. As I do not wish to embroil myself with them, I think it would be better to abstain, so I shall give only an outline of these views, and let wiser people judge whether the public should be informed in greater detail. I have always remained true to to the resolution I made, never to suppose any other principle than that which I have just used to demonstrate the existence of God and the soul, and not to admit anything is true which did not seem to me clearer and more certain than the demonstrations of the geometricians previously seemed. Nevertheless, I have not only succeeded in satisfying myself in this short time on all the principal difficulties usually treated in philosophy, but have also discovered certain laws which God has so established in nature, and the notion of which he has so fixed in our minds that after sufficient reflection, we cannot doubt that they are exactly observed in all which exists or which happens in the world. Finally, in considering the implications of these, I seem to have discovered several truths more useful and more important than anything I had previously learned or even hoped to learn. Since I have tried to explain the most important of these laws in a work which certain considerations prevent my publishing, I see no better way to proceed than by summarizing its contents. I intended to include in it all that I thought I knew before writing it concerning the nature of material things. But I found myself in the same state as painters who cannot equally well represent in a two-dimensional painting all the various faces of a solid body, and so choose one to bring to light and leave the others in shadow so that they can be seen only while viewing the selected side. Therefore, fearing that I would not be able to put into any discourse all that I intended, I undertook solely to describe at length what I thought on the subject of light, and took that occasion to add something concerning the sun and the fixed stars, since they are almost the only sources of light, of the sky, since it transmits it, of the planets, the comets, and the earth, since they reflect it, and in particular of all the objects on earth, since they are either colored or transparent or luminous, and finally of man, since he is the observer of it. I even elected as a painter might do to place my object somewhat in shadow, so that I I could express my opinions more freely without being obliged to accept or to refute the opinions commonly held by the learned. So is this Therefore, big, is this a big metaphor? Yeah, I mean, hmm. <laughs> I, I think it is. It's pretty. Yeah. It's pretty bold. If it if it truly is, um, that would be very very bold to be like right after just being like, oh, and by the way, that was all bullshit, basically. Right. Um, com- commonly held. By the learned, therefore resolved, therefore resolved to leave. I, I'm assuming, therefore resolved to leave this word world for them to dispute about, and to speak only of what would happen in a new one, if God should now create somewhere in imaginary space enough matter to make one, and if He agitated the various parts of this matter without order, making a chaos as confused as the poets could imagine, but that afterward He did nothing but lend His usual support to nature allowing it to behave according to the laws he had established. So, so I first described this matter and tried to picture it in such a way that nothing in the world could be clearer or more intelligible except 
what has just been said about God and the soul. I even expressly supposed that this matter had none of the forms or qualities concerning which one disputes in the schools, nor in general anything that we do not know so naturally that we cannot even pretend to ignore it. Furthermore, I showed where the laws of nature and, without basing my reasons on anything more specific than the infinite perfections of God, I tried to demonstrate everything which might be doubtful, and to show that nature is such that even if God had created several worlds, there would have been none where these laws were not observed. After that, I showed how the greater part of the matter in this chaos would, in consequence of these laws, become arranged in a manner which would make it similar to our skies, and how nevertheless some of these parts must compose an earth and some planets and comets, in others a sun and fixed stars. And here, enlarging upon the topic of light, I explained at considerable length its nature when contained in the sun and the stars, how from there it traverses in an instant the immense reaches of the heavens, and how it is reflected from the planets and comets toward the earth. I also added several things concerning the substance, situation, movements, and all the diverse qualities of, how, of these celestial objects until I thought I had said enough to show that there were no phenomena of this world which would not, or at least could not, occur similarly in the world I was describing. Thence I went on to speak particularly of the earth, how, even though I had expressly supposed that God had given no weight to the matter of which it was composed, all its parts would tend exactly toward its center, how the disposition of the celestial bodies and stars, principally the moon, would cause an ebb and flow in the water and air on its surface, similar in all respects to the tides of our seas, and in addition a certain current, as much of water as of air, from east to west, such as we find in our tropics, how mountains, seas, springs, and rivers could naturally occur, metals come to be in mines, plants grow in the fields, and, in general, how the whole genus of mixed or composite objects would be formed. Among other things, since outside of the stars I do nothing but fire which produced light, I strove to explain quite dearly the whole of the nature of fire, how it is produced and maintained, how sometimes it has heat without light and sometimes light without heat, how it can produce different colors and different objects and many other qualities, how it melts some objects and hardens others, how it can consume things entirely or convert them into ashes and smoke, and finally, how by the violence of its action it turns ashes into glass. For as this transmutation of ashes into glass ashes into glass seemed as admirable as any that occurs in nature, I found a particular pleasure in describing it. I did not wish to infer from all this that the world had been created in the manner I proposed, for it is much more likely that God created created it in the beginning in the form it was to assume. But it is certain, and this is an opinion commonly held by theologians, that the action by which the world is now conserved is precisely the same as that by which it was created. Even therefore, if God had given the world in the beginning no other form but chaos, and had only established the, established the laws of nature and given his concurrence for the world to behave as it usually does, one can believe, without injustice to the miracle of creation, that all material objects could have become, in time, such as we see them at present. Their nature is much easier to conceive when one pictures their gradual growth in this manner rather than considering them as produced in their completed state. From the description of inanimate objects and plants, I passed to that of animals, and particularly of man. But I did not as yet know enough to speak of these in the same style as of the rest, in showing the causes of their existence, in showing from what origin and in what manner nature must have produced them. I was therefore satisfied to assume that God formed the body of man, just like our own, both in the external configuration of its members and in the internal configuration of its organs, without using in its composition any matter but that which I had described. I also assumed that God did not put into this body, to start with, any rational soul or any other entity to serve as a veg vegetable or sensitive soul, beyond kindling in the heart, one of those fires without light which I had already described and which I considered to be entirely similar to that which heats grain when it is stored before it is dry, or which warms new wines when they are allowed to ferment before being separated from the grapes. 
Examining the functions with which such a body would have, I discovered everything that can exist without thinking, everything except that which is contributed by the soul, that part of us distinct from the body whose essence, as we have previously said, is only to think. These functions are the same as those in which the unreasoning animals resemble us, and do not include any of those which are dependent on thinking and which belong to us as men. These human qualities I discovered somewhat later, when I supposed that God created a rational soul and joined it to the body in a certain fashion which I described. In order to show how I treated this matter, I wish to insert here the explanation of the function of the heart and the arteries. As the first and most general function found in animals, it will serve to indicate what the reader should think of all the rest. Those who are not well versed in anatomy will find less difficulty in understanding what I am going to say if they will take the trouble before reading this to have the heart of some large animal cut open before them. <laughs> For the heart of an animal with lungs <laughs> is quite similar to that of man. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> let's fucking go. <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> I'm glad you laughed at that part. Yeah, I uh, I remember like I <laughs> I, read, I read that and I was like, oh my god, dude. <laughs> but you know, he didn't. He couldn't just say, "Hey, everybody, pull up on Google an image of a heart." You know? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, "It'll help you to go get a heart." Acquire one. Yeah. Put it on the table. Just go to the go to the butcher and have them chop it up. <laughs> yeah. I, that would be funny to go to uh, to the butcher and be like, "Do you have a heart?" That, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> like they're like they're, they start asking you questions about how you want it, how, how you're gonna prepare it, and you're like, "Oh no, I just need to put it on the table because I'm reading Descartes' method." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's nice. It's nice to read this. It's it's cool to see. It's it's funny. Uh, Alenka Zupancic actually made this comment about Quinton Miasu, about how he's doing this whole thing in defense of science and talking about science, science, science. But actually, he doesn't really seem to ever talk about science. He kind of just uses science and its claim to having an ability to talk about facts that are, you know, uh, f you know, out in in the the real world or whatever. Like he he kind of references it and uses it as this referent, but he we don't ever get like science from him. Um, and nothing that you read in After Finitude gives you like this sense that Miyasu's like really reading science, and so. Um, which is we, personally that obviously doesn't invalidate anything he's doing with his philosophy, but um, it is it's an it's a point that Zupanchis is keen on, and one of the nice things about Descartes here is his chapter on the physics he's just like I'm gonna give you like the essentials like of of what's going on like he's he started with light planets. And he just kept zooming in, and now he's inside of the body, and it's 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 beautiful. He's like moving through like the most essential forms of knowledge that you can be most certain about um, that science had developed at the time. Obviously, he's read a lot of science outside of what he's giving us here, but he's giving us the most certain picture that he can give us. But the whole thing starts with what? He's like, look, some of my conclusions. He really gets into the wheelhouses of some other academics, and they're not going to like it. And uh, they know what they're talking about. I don't want to start a fight, so I'm not going to talk about the real world. I'm just going to talk about imagination world. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's having his cake and he's eating it too. But goddamn it, he earned it. He did. Yeah, he earned it more than anybody. All right. Um, animal with lungs is quite similar to that of man. Let, let them then observe the two chambers or ventricles which it contains. First, the one on the right side connects with two very large tubes 
the vena cava, which is the principal container of blood and resembles the trunk of a tree of which all the other veins are branches, and the vena anter- arteriosa, misnamed since it is really an artery which starts in the heart, then divides into several branches and spreads throughout the lungs. The left ventricle has two similar tubes, at least as large as those just described. The arteria venosa, likewise misnamed, since it is purely a vein coming from the lungs where it is divided into a number of branches interlaced with those of the vena arteriosa and those of the windpipe, through which enters the air we breathe and the aorta, which, starting from the heart, sends its branches everywhere throughout the body. I should suggest also that the reader observe the 11 little membranes which, like so many little valves, open and close the four openings in these two ventricles. Three are at the entrance to the vena cava, where they are so disposed that they cannot stop the blood that it contains from flowing into the right ventricle, but prevent any of it from flowing back. Three at the entrance of the vena arteriosa are disposed in precisely the opposite fashion, permitting the blood in the heart to pass to the lungs, but not allowing the blood in the lungs to return. So also there are two at the entrance of the arteria venosa, which permit the blood to pass from the lungs to the left ventricle and prevent its return, and three at the entrance to the aorta, permitting the blood to leave the heart, but not to return. There is no need to seek any other reason for the number of these membranes other than the fact that the opening of the arteria venosa being oval because of its location, can be conveniently closed with two, while the others are round and can be more readily closed with three. I should like the reader to notice also that the aorta and the vena arteriosa are much harder and firmer than the arteria venosa and the vena cava, and that these last two are enlarged near the heart, forming two sacs called the ears, or oracles of the heart, composed of a flesh resembling that of the ears. Notice also that there is always more heat in the heart than in any other part of the body, and that this heat is capable of causing any drop of blood which enters the ventricles to expand immediately, just as any liquid does when it falls drop by drop into some very hot vessel. After that, I need say nothing more to explain the functioning of the heart, except that when its ventricles are not full of blood, some necessarily flows into it. The right ventricle is filled from the vena cava and the left from the arteria venosa. Since these two vessels are always full and their entrances opening toward the heart cannot then be closed. The portions of blood in each ventricle cannot fail to be very large since the openings are very large and the vessels from which they came full of blood. And as soon as these portions enter the heart, they become rarefied and expand because of the heat there. This dilates the whole heart and pushes upon and closes the five valves at the entrance of the two vessels from which the blood comes, preventing any more blood from entering the heart. As the blood continues to expand, it pushes upon and opens the six other valvules, which are at the entrance to the other two vessels through which the blood leaves and thus inflates all the branches of the vena arteriosa and the aorta at almost the same instant as the heart. A moment later, the heart and these arteries are all deflated because the blood which has entered them has cooled. The six valvules close and the five of the vena cava and arteria venosa reopen, permitting two more portions of blood to enter and dilate the heart and the arteries the same as before. And since the blood which thus enters the heart comes through the two sacs called auricles, It follows that the condition of the latter is the opposite of that of the ventricles, and that the former are deflated when the latter are inflated. For the rest, so that those who do not appreciate the force of mathematical demonstration and are not accustomed to distinguish between good and bad reasons should not make the mistake of denying this without examining it, I must warn them that the motion which I have just explained follows necessarily from the mere disposition of the parts of the heart, visible to the naked eye, from the heat which one can feel with their fingers, and from the nature of the blood which one can learn by experiment, just as the motions of a clock follow from the weight, location, and configuration of its counterweights and wheels. But, 
If one asks why the blood in the veins does not become exhausted by thus flowing continually into the heart, and why the arteries do not become over full, since all that passes through the heart goes there, I need only point out what has already been written by an English doctor who has the glory of having broken the ice in this matter. He was the first to show that there are many small passages at the ends of the arteries, by which the blood received from the heart enters into the small branches of the veins, whence it returns again to the heart, so that its path is nothing but a perpetual circulation. This he proved very adequately by the common experience of surgeons, who, having applied a tourniquet to the arm, not too tightly, above the spot where they open a vein, make the blood flow more abundantly than it would without the tourniquet. On the other hand, quite the contrary occurs if they tie it below. Between the hand and the opening, or even if they tie it very tightly above. On the other hand, quite the contrary occurs if they tie it below, between the hand and the opening, or even if they tie it very tightly above. For it is obvious that a tourniquet, which is m moderately tight, can prevent the blood which is already in the arm from returning toward the heart through the veins, but cannot hinder that which is continually, continually coming from the heart through the arteries. Because the arteries are situated below the veins, and because their walls are stiffer and less easy to compress, and also because the blood comes from the heart with greater pressure than it has when returning through the veins. Since this blood leaves the arm through an opening in one of the veins, there must necessarily be some passages below the tourniquet, that is, toward the hand, by which it comes from the arteries. He also proves his contention about the circulation of the blood by certain small membranes so disposed in various places along the veins that they do not permit the blood to flow from the middle of the body toward the extremities, but only to return from the extremities toward the heart, and further by the fact that all the blood in the body can be lost in a very short time when a single artery is cut, even if it is tightly constricted close to the heart and cut between the constrictions and the heart, so that there is no imaginable way that the blood which escapes comes from another source than the heart. There are several other considerations which prove that the real cause of this movement of the blood is the one which I have given, such as, first, the difference between that which comes from the veins and that which comes from the arteries, a difference only to be explained by the fact that the blood is rarefied, as though it were distilled, in passing through the heart, and is therefore thinner, more active, and warmer when it has just come from there and is in the arteries, than just before it enters and is in the veins. Careful observation shows that this difference is more apparent near the heart, and is not so noticeable at points far removed from it. Then the hardness of the membranes of which the vena arteriosa and the aorta are composed shows well enough that the blood passes through them with greater pressure than through the veins. Furthermore, why should the left ventricle and the aorta be larger and broader than the right ventricle and the vena arteriosa if it is not that the blood of the arteria venosa, not having been in the lungs since it passed through the heart, is thinner and becomes more rarefied more readily than that which comes directly from the vena cava? And what could doctors tell by feeling the pulse if they did not know that as the nature of blood changes, it can be rarefied by the heat of the heart? more or less strongly and more or less rapidly than before. And if we examine how this heat is communicated to the other parts of the body, must we not admit that it is through the blood which is warmed passing through the heart and spreads this heat through the whole body? From this it results that if the blood is withdrawn from any part of the body, heat is withdrawn by the same token. Even if the heart were as hot as glowing iron, it could not warm the hands and feet as it does unless it continually sent new blood to those parts. We also recognize from these considerations that the true purpose of respiration is to bring enough fresh air into the lungs to condense the blood which was rarefied in the right ventricle before it returns to the left. To take blood which has almost been converted into vapor and reconvert it into blood. If this were not done, the blood would not be suitable for the nourishing of the heart's fire. This is confirmed by seeing that animals that have no lungs have only one ventricle and that unborn children who cannot use their lungs while enclosed in their mother's wombs have an opening through which blood flows directly from the vena cava into the left ventricle and a tube by which it passes from the vena arteriosa into the aorta without passing through the lungs. Then, how could digestion take place in the stomach if the heart did not send heat there through the arteries? 
together with some of the most fluid parts of the blood which help to dissolve the food which is placed there. Is it not easy to understand that the action which converts the liquid part of these foods into blood if we consider that the blood is distilled possibly more than 100 or 200 times each day when passing through the heart? And we need say nothing more to explain nutrition and the production of the several humors of the body, except that the force of the blood expanding while passing from the heart to the ends of the arteries brings it about that some, some of its parts come to rest in certain organs of the body taking the place of others which they expel and that certain parts of the blood come to rest in certain places rather than others according to the location shape or size of the pores encountered just as sieves with holes of different sizes serve to separate different grains from each other the most remarkable aspect of all of this is the production of animal spirits which are like a very subtle wind or rather a very pure and lively flame which continuously rises in great abundance from the heart to the brain and thence through the nerves into the muscles where it produces the movement of all parts of the body. The most agitated and penetrating parts of the blood compose these animal spirits and no other reason need be sought why these parts go to the brain rather than elsewhere than the fact that the arteries which conduct them are the straightest of all. According to the rules of mechanics which are the same as the rules of nature when several objects tend to move toward a place where there is not room enough for all, as is the case when parts of the blood leave the left ventricle and tend toward the brain, the weakest and least agitated of them must be turned aside by the strongest, which thus are the only ones to arrive at their destination. I had explained all these things in sufficient detail in the treatise which I previously intended to publish, and I continued by showing what the nature of the network of nerves and muscles of the human body must B, to enable the animal spirits within to move its members, as one sees when, when freshly severed heads still move and bite the earth, although they are no longer alive. Jesus, dude. What? Where was it? Can uh. As one sees when freshly severed heads still move and bite the earth, although they are no longer alive. <laughs> oh my god. Oh shit. <laughs> Is he, this is, uh, about, is he talking about human heads here? I mean, maybe. <laughs> Fucking how many people he's have he <laughs> How many people have he, has he seen get beheaded, you know? You gotta wonder. I mean, that was like the thing back then. Like, I'm sure it was fairly common or someone to be aware of the fact that human heads can blink and bite and shit when they've been chopped off. Like, yeah, they didn't have HBO and Disney Plus. They needed something to do. Yeah, if you can't watch it on Game of Thrones, you have to go do it. This is the uh, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> the the laws of uh, the laws of humans are like the laws of mechanics as are the laws of nature. If you don't get to go exercise your will to power, you will uh, go crazy. So you just got to have a good movie or a gladiator show. Do it for you. Yep. Um, I, sh I showed what changes must take place in the brain to cause wakefulness, sleep, and dreams. How light, sounds, odors, tastes, heat, and all the other qualities of external objects can implant various ideas through the medium of the senses, and how hunger, thirst, and the other internal passions are communicated. I explained what must be understood by that animal sense, animal sense which receives these ideas, by memory which retains them, and by imagination which can change them in various ways and build new ones from them, and thus distributing the animal spirits in the muscles move the parts of the body in response to the objects which are presented to the senses and the passion, passions which are in the body in as great a variety of ways as our own bodies can move without the guidance of volition. This will hardly seem strange to those who know how many automata or machines can be made by human industry. Although these automata employ very few parts in comparison to the large number of bones, muscles, nerves, arteries, veins, and all the other component parts of each animal. 
Such persons will therefore think of this body as a machine created by the hand of God, and in consequence incomparably better designed and with more admirable movements than any machine that can be invented by man. Here I pause to show that if there were any machines which had the organs and appearance of a monkey or of some other unreasoning animal, we would have no way of telling that it was not of the same nature as these animals. But if there were a machine which had such a resemblance to our bodies and imitated our actions as far as is morally possible, there would always be two absolutely certain methods of recognizing that it was still not truly a man. The first is that it could never use words or other signs for the purpose of communicating its thoughts to others as we do. It is indeed conceivable that a machine could be so made that it would utter words and even words appropriate to physical acts which cause some change in its organs, as, for example, if it was touched in some spot, that it would ask what you wanted to say to it, if in another, that it would cry that it was hurt, and so on for similar things. But it could never modify its phrases to reply to the sense of whatever was said in its presence. And even the most stupid men can do, as even the most stupid men can do. The second method of recognition is that Although such machines could do many things as well as, or perhaps even better than men, they would infallibly fail in certain others, by which we would discover that they did not act by understanding, but only by the disposition of their organs. For while reason is a universal instrument which can be used in all sorts of situations, the organs have to be arranged in a particular way for each particular action. From this it follows that it is morally impossible that there should be enough different devices in a machine to make it behave in all the occurrences of life as our reason makes us behave. That's pretty, pretty cool. Dude, that paragraph is so cool. I mean, I just, just hearing somebody from when, what's the date? So he, he, he published this in 1637. And, he, and he's over wow. here doing thought experiments about robots, about artificial intelligence. It's just mind-blowing to me. So why did he feel the need to do this right here? Why... Is this just something he was interested in talking about, or does this follow... Is, is this placed very deliberately. I mean, it definitely feels like he's swinging for the fences. Um, it follows from him saying such persons will therefore will therefore think of this body as a machine created by the hand of God and in consequence incomparably better designed and with more admirable movements than any machine that can be invented by man. Um, what kind of people is he talking about? Uh, the kinds of people... Where is it? I lost the place. I explained what must be understood by that animal sense which receives these ideas by memory which retains them and by imagination which can change them in various ways and build new ones from them and thus distributing the animal spirits in the muscles and move the parts of the body in response to the objects which are presented to the senses and the passions which are in the body in a great in as great a variety of ways as our own bodies can move without the guidance of volition. This will hardly seem strange to those who know how many automata or machines can be made by human industry, although these automata employ very few parts in comparison to the large number of bones, muscles, nerves, arteries, veins, and all the other component parts of each animal. So is he just saying, like, yeah, we draw a lot of inspiration from the mechanical aspect of nature when we're making our own inventions, which are always a simplification in a sort of sense. The Yeah, I think, I mean, it could be protective, like uh, preempting anybody making the argument that he's claiming we are machines. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking about this, this next paragraph, right? Yeah. He, he kind of has to sit here and do this because he's 
inevitably going to be accused of that, right? Yeah. Because he really, I mean, he his his treatment of the human body was very mechanistic. The world, I mean, he, this is the the last one was like, hey, the soul exists, God exists, God is the guarantee of the soul, and then this chapter is the one that says, yeah, but everything else is mechanistic. Like outside of the soul stuff, everything is mechanistic. Hmm. I'll, I'll read for a bit. Um, are we at the end of that paragraph? Life is our reason makes us behave. Uh, behaving on all the occurrences of life is our reason makes us behave. Yeah. By these two methods, we can also recognize the difference between man and animals. For it is a very remarkable thing that there are no men, not even the insane, so dull and stupid that they cannot put words together in a manner to convey their thoughts. On the, con <laughs> on the contrary, there is no other animal, however perfect and fortunately situated it may be, that can do the same. And this is not because they lack the organs, for we see that magpies and parrots can pronounce words as well as we can, and nevertheless cannot speak as we do, that is, in showing that they think what they are saying. On the other hand, even those men born deaf and dumb, lacking the organs which others make use of in speaking, and at least as badly off as the animals in this respect, usually invent for themselves some signs by which they make themselves understood by those who are with them enough to learn their language. And this proves not merely that animals have less reason than men, but that they have none at all, for we see that very little is needed in order to talk. Furthermore, we notice variations among animals of the same species, just as among men, and that some are easier to train than others. It is therefore unbelievable that a monkey or a parrot, which, one, which was one of the best of its species, should not be the equal in this matter of one of the most stupid children, or at least of a child of infirm mind, if their soul were not of a wholly different nature from ours. So, uh, he's basically just saying, like, humans are essentially different. That's all he's trying to say. There's something essentially different. And the smartest parrot put up against the dumbest human, it, it's not going to change it. That, that the dumbest human is still going to find a way to communicate with us in a way that goes way beyond anything else. And there was this part of me that wanted to be like, well, Descartes never had a dog. Right, because like a dog can really communicate, but I yeah, well I don't know, I don't know if he had a dog or not. But he, the the point is, is that the dog doesn't communicate to us much more that's going on inside beyond, I'm hungry, I want to play, I want to go on a walk, I want belly rubs, right? Like it's, and I think almost any animal can probably communicate those things. Like almost any animal could probably say, I'm hungry. Almost any animal could probably say, I want belly rubs, if they like belly rubs. Um, and so I think that he knows that, uh, but his, he's thinking like, yeah, outside of animal appetites and, yep. and, and, and saying things in that Chinese box experiment kind of way, the Chinese room experiment kind of way, like you've learned certain outputs get you certain inputs and you want these inputs so you give these outputs. Outside of that, does seem that yeah uh, humans are able to communicate a lot more and a person who is born without the normal functions of a, a human body they will find a way to communicate mm -hmm. you know note also that we should not confuse speech with the natural movements that indicate passions and can be in and can be imitated by machines as well as by animals. Nor should we think, like some of the ancients, that animals speak, although we do not understand their language. For if it were true, they would make themselves understood by us as well as by their fellows, since they have several organs analogous to our own. It is another very remarkable fact that although there are many animals that show more industry than we in some of their behavior, these same animals show none at all in other ways. And so the fact 
that they do better than we do does not prove that they are rational, for on this basis they would be more rational than any of us and would surpass us in everything. It proves, on the contrary, that they are not rational and that nature makes them behave as they do according to the disposition of their organs, just as a clock composed only of wheels and springs can count the hours and measure the time more accurately than we can with all, with all our intelligence. Okay, so yeah, a clock has a crazy capacity to be like on the dot in a way that we don't, and a cheetah has an amazing ability to run at speeds that we could never run, um, but that has nothing to do with rationality, I guess. I then described the rational soul and showed that it could not possibly derive from the powers of matter, like the other things I have spoken about, but must have been specially created. I showed also that it would not suffice to place it in the human body as a pilot in a ship, unless perhaps to move its parts, but that it must be more intimately joined and united with the body in order to have feelings and appetites like ours, and so constitute a real man. For the rest, I elaborated a little on the topic of the soul on account of its great importance, because next to the error of those who deny God, which I think I have sufficiently refuted, there is none which is so apt to make weak characters stray from the path of virtue as the idea that the souls of animals are the same nature as our own, and that in consequence we have no more to fear or to hope for after this life than have the flies and ants. Actually, when we know how different they are, we understand more fully the reasons which prove that our soul is by nature entirely independent of the body and consequently does not have to die with it. Therefore, as long as we see no other causes which might destroy it, we are naturally led to conclude that it is immortal. Hi, 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 yeah! We are almost done. We have made it pretty far. We've got one section remaining. Let's pause for a moment and just talk about it. He has a soul. Hey, buddy. Damn it. Hey, buddy. Hey, bud. Oh, damn it. <laughs> yeah, so... All, yeah, what were you going to say? All this talk of dogs not having souls is upsetting. Very triggering for Nance. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I, if dogs don't have souls, then they can't go to heaven. And dogs can go to heaven... We so they must all have dogs souls. do. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't be dogs. No. They wouldn't be dogs if they didn't go to heaven. That's the point. Duh. I, I like his treatment of the soul as consciousness and his like early kind of grappling with unconsciousness is again like that's sufficient like I'm okay with that I'm okay to take all that and just you know say okay you're, you're talking about the same thing uh, you're just calling it the soul or either because you believe it's a soul or because you're doing this esoteric thing one way or the other it it doesn't make a difference. Like he's talking about this quality that we do recognize, like that mm -hmm. that is there. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. I guess cooler um, than people who would want to dismiss it. Dismiss it would make it out to be. Hundred percent. Yeah, and you know. This is this is historically and philosophically interesting also because this division and then these distinctions all become something that different philosophers in different ways 
like get excited and like run with right like so so this is kind of like a catalyst for like all philosoph for, for all philosophizing right and of course he comes from a world and he de- he never really dismantled all of his presuppositions and he did so probably with the intention of building it back something kind of like we already see it and and you know even even outside of that there's the fact that uh you know, here he is in his little hut by the wood stove doing these meditations, um, saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just suspend everything I know. And it's like, yeah, but you also know a bunch of things that you haven't examined that you also learned through your schooling system, that you also learned through all of those disciplines. And that brings error, but it also brings a tremendous amount of privilege that only comes through decades of time spent diligently studying and applying oneself to like primary texts which he does and so it's really easy for a philosophy um, newbie to to read this and go yeah I don't need the classics I don't need to care about the medievals I don't need to care about literature I don't need you know I, I basically just go see he was able to just kind of discount it all and then move on and it's like yeah I know but he this is this is all the thought of a truly cultivated mind or soul, as he would say. And it does, you know, it's the same thing for him. Truly mm-hmm. cultivated in the sense of like bred in the finest institutions and equipped with like the best learning. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I I like it though. I, I really like doing this. I like taking a break from uh, all of the 20th century stuff that we're normally preoccupied with at Theory Underground and just focusing on something that's a bit more um, canonical, like without doubt, you know? Like back from, yeah. a, back from a time when every philosopher, like th- there's few philosophers where it's every philosopher read that philosopher, right? And Descartes through Kant, that's basically it. That's like the, the window where it's like almost anybody who's a serious philosopher really focused on getting their Descartes, Leibniz, Spinoza, Kant down. And I left out Hume and Locke. They belong in that list as well. And so it's like um, there's, a, there's a lot of others who could go in there, but like I'm ta- that's the main six. And uh, that's that's modernity, right? Like that's the main thinkers of modernity, mm-hmm. and they're all responding to Descartes in their own ways. And uh, sometimes they disagree with him on all these stupid pedantical things. When in reality, those pedantical things that they're disagreeing with him on might actually just be little bone, look, exoteric bones he was throwing to the political situation, and then they these philosophers who are uh, arguing with him on such basis, um, they don't tell you this, but they are drawing from all the rest of his stuff, the, 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 the richer stuff that he does. And I think it's quite easy to do that without giving credit where it's due. And so he gets made into like this, this clown, this sort of uh, scarecrow that everybody attributes the dumb things he says to or the things that are, oh, now we're so, we know that that's wrong. So, oh, he said that. Ha, ha, ha. We can write him off. Where it's like all of this other stuff is, it's about method. Nothing he said about um, negation and being and perfection and, um, or sorry, nothingness and perfection and all of that, like, and therefore God or whatever. None of that stuff is actually him actually describing his method. And this is his discourse on method. That was actually... Um, you you could say it's an application of it, but it's hard to even see it as an application of it. And so, anyway, I just I, I love that we're doing this because it allows us to have this meta conversation to get it started, the meta conversation on interpretation and on writing um, under persecution. So yeah, yeah. I'm gonna grab a frosty beverage real quick. Hmm. Great idea. So while Nance goes and gets some frosty beverage, I will begin. 
and this is the last section of the discourse on method. If you've made it this far, it's been about four hours. Um, if you've been listening double speed, you're crazy, but so am I. So it's good. I'm in good company, I guess. Um, but yeah, double speed, it was only two hours. So right on. Um, not only have you gotten to hear this classic work of philosophy in that amount of time, but you've also gotten to hear a sort of meta-analysis of ourselves uh, and our readings of this text and um, the, the, the really important and difficult interpretive questions that should be on the table whenever you're reading uh, an author that is truly great. And a truly great author is very conflicted and very, uh, well, or at least the interpretations about that author are going to be very conflicted. And obviously, if, if all of the greatest authors really are writing in a mode that's both esoteric and exoteric, it's written for inside and outside, well, then you would think there would be a lot of disputes over interpretation. Of course there would be. What you all don't realize is that Nance and I spent the last three months um, reading this and preparing to do this exegetical analysis, um, planning like, like a long-term chess game, everything that we would say in advance um, so that we could both be doing an exoteric and an esoteric exegetical reading as we went through this. <laughs> <laughs> Got you, bitch. Got you. <laughs> okay, part six: some prerequisites for further advances in the study of nature. Three years ago, when I had completed the treatise containing all these matters, and when I was beginning to review it for purposes of publication, I learned that people to whom I defer and whose authority over my actions is hardly less than that of my own reason over my thoughts, had disapproved of a hypothesis in the field of physics that had been published somewhat earlier by another person. This is his reference. This is him vague posting about Galileo Galilei. He is refusing to name any names. He is dealing with this in the most careful manner possible. He says, I do not want to say that I had accepted that hypothesis, but at least before their censure, I could not imagine that it was prejudicial to religion or to the state, and therefore I could see no ground for not professing it if reason convinced me of its truth. So he refuses to say he agreed with it, but he also just straight up says, I do not want to say that I had accepted that hypothesis. Yeah, well, that you could have. You, you're just saying you don't want to say whether you accepted it or not. So it's like, yeah, I just I love I love how coy he's being here. Yeah, it's it's like I, uh, I I can't I can't remember almost like when you say like oh well to the best of my recollection I can't say say one way or the other like. <laughs> yeah. Um. Like, but oh. and and it. it it calls attention to the like to the framing of like, I mean, I can't say what I want to say, so right. I don't want to say. <laughs> exactly, and and now th there's two things here. On the on the one hand, he's going to be talking about censorship, and truth, and freedom, and progress in the sciences, and on the other side, on, on the other side, he's saying, I need to keep doing what I'm doing. This stuff's getting in the way of me being able to do what I'm doing. And as long as this stuff's getting in the way of me being able to do what I'm doing, I can't really publish unless I'm going to get embroiled in a bunch of bullshit. Therefore, I need patronage. There is actually, mm. it's all, the quilting point is actually he needs his leisure time. He actually needs his time energy. That is actually the quilting point of this whole thing. Like and subscribe is basically it. <laughs> Yeah. So I do not want to say that I had accepted that hypothesis, but at least before their censure, I could not imagine that it was prejudicial to religion or to the state. And therefore, I could see no ground for not professing it 
if reason convinced me of its truth. This circumstance made me fear that there might be other opinions of mine in which I was misled. Despite the great care I had always taken not to accept any new ones which were not very certainly demonstrated and to write of none that might prove disadvantage, disadvantageous to anyone. So the framing of this whole thing has been, there's something I wrote that I'm not going to put out. So first, I'm just going to tell you all about my method. Right? Because he's trying to, conv he, he's more interested in people going, wait a minute. Are you telling me that someone has made a bunch of discoveries and that those are not being allowed to be put out there? And he's literally presented everything in such a way so as to be like, yeah, he tells you a lot of the stuff that he did, but he doesn't tell you how he did it, which would leave any inquisitive mind wondering, okay, but how does he get to that conclusion, right? Oh God, I just, I, this is why I love the discourse on methods so much more than the meditations. Like he, the whole thing is about the meditations, but it's actually like the problem he's feeling is to me more of a relatable problem than the problems he's dealing with in the actual meditations themselves. Because I feel, yeah, I feel uncertain about things all the time. I would love to be more certain about things. Yeah, I can be skeptical and yeah, we can challenge presuppositions. Sure. But also what can we actually talk about? Like, I feel like I'm surrounded by people all the time who can't really tell me what they are actually thinking and who argue things on the basis of not what they actually believe, but on the basis of what they think they need to say in that situation. And that's because yeah. of the situation. It's relatable to the situation that he's writing in, right? But he's, he's at this point, when he says that he... Uh, tries not to. He says that uh, he's, he's like, yeah, I don't I don't accept things that I don't take to be certainly demonstrated. Right. So obviously he has at this point spent the entire fucking thing proving that. Right. He doesn't like he's if anybody associates him with anything at this point, they're going to associate him with being the guy who likes things to be clear and distinct and who doesn't just jump into believing things. Right. So he's officially backed that claim up. And then the other one, which is he doesn't like to write things that might prove disadva disadvantageous to anyone. Right. The, and, and you know what? It's proven by the mere fact that he had to write this piece. He's not able to publish the piece that he wants to write. So so what this should tell people is especially people who are like, oh, my God, Galileo's fucking up everything because he's he's talking about physics that go against the church. This should be making people think like, look, this Descartes guy doesn't want to hurt anything. He, he doesn't want to hurt anyone. Think about it, you know. This occurrence was not enough to make me change my resolution to publish the treatise, for although the reasons for making it were very strong, for, for, were very strong, my inclinations were always much opposed to writing books, and I was quick to find other reasons to excuse myself for not publishing. So he's basically just like, look, if that, the Galileo getting arrested wasn't the only reason I didn't publish it. The fact is, is I hate to publish books, and I'll take any opportunity to let myself off the hook of writing a book. And so I took other reasons as my reasons for not publishing. These reasons on both sides are such that not only have I some interest in relating them, but the public may also have some interest in learning them. This is another thing that's very specific to the, the time frame that I set this up in, basically being, um, you know, what, 67 years after the printing press, we had Martin Luther's theses, and then... Like 15 years later, we had Machiavelli's The Prince. And then almost 100 years later, we have Descartes with his discourse on method. At this point, when he says the public, what he's talking about is something that was created by newspapers, uh, or at least books, and, uh, and, and nations, right? Because na the, the printing press created the nation in, the, in this modern sense. And, uh, and this idea of there being a public is something that was created by that printing press as well. And he's writing in the common tongue, making his appeal 
to the public right here. He's not writing it to a king. He's writing it to the public, which is the exact same move that Machiavelli made as, as well, except that Machiavelli, he addresses it to the, to the prince, but he writes it in the common tongue, which was a huge departure, a huge rupture, because you don't write it in the common tongue unless you're trying to talk to the common people. So here's the considerations he wants uh, the public to think about. I have never entertained any pretensions about the products of my thinking. When the result of the application of my methods was merely my own satisfaction concerning some speculative questions, or perhaps the regulation of my own behavior by the principles which it showed me, I did not feel obliged to write of them, for when it comes to morals, everyone is so convinced of his own good sense that there might be as many reformers as individuals if others than those whom God has established as sovereigns over his peoples, or to whom he has given enough grace and zeal to be prophets, were permitted to attempt reforms. He uses the word reform in the same way that uh, people would say revolution nowadays. He really, any changes against the status quo were considered kind of revolutionary. And so that's what he's talking about when he says reforms here. So even though my speculations pleased me very much, I believe that other persons and their own speculations, which perhaps please them even... Wait, what? So even though my speculations pleased me very much, I believed that other persons had their own speculations, which perhaps pleased them even more. As soon, however, as I had achieved some general notions about physics, and when testing them in various critical problems, I noticed how far they might lead and how they differed from the principles accepted up to this time, I thought that I could not keep them hidden without gravely sinning against the rule that obliges us to promote as far as possible the general good of mankind. For they have satisfied me that it is possible to reach knowledge that will be of much utility in this life, and that instead of the speculative philosophy now taught in the schools, we can if instead we can find a practical one, by which, knowing the nature of behavior of fire, water, air, stars, the heavens, and all other bodies which surround us, as well as we now understand the different skills of our workers, we can employ these entities for all the purposes for which they are suited, and so make ourselves masters and possessors of nature. Now that's the, that's the quote, yeah, right there. And we'll go over it in a little bit. This would not only be desirable in bringing about the invention of an, inf of an infinity of devices to enable us to enjoy the fruits of agriculture and all the wealth of the earth without labor, but even more so in conserving health, the principal good, and the basis of all other goods in this life. So that's the, that's the quote right there. As soon, however, as I had achieved some general notions about physics, and when testing them in various critical problems, I noticed how useful they might be. That's basically what he says. As soon as he realized how useful physics might be, he says he thought, wow, I can't keep this hidden. To keep this hidden would really fuck over everybody, because the fact is, is this shit can really speed things up and give us like everything we want at like it, at, at, and there's like a, a kind of contradiction through the paragraph on the one side he's saying it'll free up leisure we'll be able to have all of the good the fruits of agriculture and the wealth of the earth without labor right we'll be able to have the fruits of agriculture and all the wealth of the earth without labor but earlier in the paragraph he had also just said our workers. <laughs> so there's a little contradiction yeah. here. He wants, he's not saying I want to free up our workers. He's saying I want to, he, but he is at the same time saying that we could have all of these things without labor. So there are definitely two ways of reading that. And that might be a contradiction he's not thought through at this point. But yeah, would you say we've achieved his dream of, uh, of securing uh, an infinity of devices? Somebody says. Instead of that, that instead of that speculative philosophy now taught in the schools, 
And by the schools, he means the medieval schools. We can find a practical philosophy, one which, by knowing the nature and behavior of fire, water, air, stars, the heavens, and all other bodies which surround us, as we as well as we now understand the different skills of our workers, we can employ these entities for all the purposes for which they are suited, and so make ourselves masters and possessors of nature. This would not only be desirable in bringing about the invention of an infinity of devices to enable us to enjoy the fruits of agriculture and all the wealth of the earth without labor, but even more so in conserving health, the principal good, and the basis of all other goods in this life. Hmm. I mean, billionaires have it. Except for the ones that just got killed by the fucking rinky dink submarine at the bottom of the fucking ocean. Yeah. I, I, t- I, I, I could take billionaires way cooler places than the bottom of the ocean with. For sure. With, with Theory Underground. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I don't know why they're out there risking their lives when they could be risking their reputations instead, you know? (laughs) Come on. But, uh, but we also do, yeah, without a doubt though, we have this infinity of, uh, if I guess, you know, in, in in a very broad sense, every app is a device. Every software is a device. Well, and I mean, with with the internet, um, I guess the infer- the internet is an infinite device in that it, um, like it flattens out all possibilities because it itself contains all all possible things and all possible notions. Um, and so yeah, sure, the the internet is the infinite device even though it it kind of makes a lot of things impossible yeah. um so yeah i think we achieved his his uh nightmare rather than his dream this is the this is the quote that heidegger is invoking in his own critique of his own earlier work when he does his the question concerning technology there's a crucial turning point in that essay when he says just at the moment that we consider ourselves masters and possessors of nature this mode of seeing the world to exploit its potentials comes up behind our back and makes us into human resources. And I just think it's one of the best, it's one of the best quotes ever. And it really like thinking Descartes and Heidegger, I think most people just think Descartes and Heidegger up until being in time, they read being in time and then they run off to go do other things. Oh, they run off to read Arendt, Derrida, Foucault, Levinas, Baudrillard, Lacan, Zizek, etc. And it's like, cool, they're all doing really cool things. But this basic point here is one really worth thinking about. This is the this 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 is the the vision, right? Like the the vision of modern science. Modern science would have developed if Francis Bacon and Descartes and Galileo We're okay. I, I okay. I, I don't. I don't even know if I can say that. I. I, I kind of want to be able to say like if, if there was no censorship, if there was no, and science was just doing its thing, it would have just developed the way it developed. But instead, it got sold to people on the basis of look what we can give you, right? This is the this is the vision that gets rolled out in defense of science, and it needed to be defended. 
And I almost said that, but then I remembered, like, I think this tremendous sense of satisfaction that Descartes keeps talking about that he gets from philosophy and science and mathematics, that satisfaction, there's this Lacanian part of me that's always wondering, like, what is his drive? And I think that his drive is straddling these two worlds and trying to speak out both sides of his mouth and trying to make it so that scientists are able to do what they do and and whether he's trying to keep the church preserved or if he actually thinks it's going to get, you know, displaced. Whatever it is, he's I think his drive is is wrapped up in the whole thing and then I have to think that the same is true for these other moderns. Machiavelli is one of the moderns too. He's just like like the, one of the earliest. Um, and Machiavelli talks about the need to uh, for the for the sovereign to to reduce fortune to the best of his ability, and 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 basically capitalize on the things that can be controlled. And his manual, of the prince, is about how to control, as opposed to um, you, oh, being idealistic and hoping that things will go, f- hoping that fortune will go your way. It, we don't hope about fortune at all. We try to reduce the percentage of our life that is up to fortune and uh, uh, and expand the part of our life that is controllable. That's that's what he thinks. And it's really part of this ethos of this period. And Francis Bacon, he's a bit more, uh, a bit more hardcore in how he goes about it. Let's see if I can just find the quote off the top of my head. Uh, quote, nature, the rack. Do you know what I'm talking about when I say that? Does that? Oh. Does that ring a bell? The rack. Okay. Here I will, I, will, I will read it. My only earthly wish is to stretch the deplorably narrow limits of man's dominion over the universe to their promised bounds. Nature will be bound into service, hounded in her wanderings, yeah. and put on the rack and tortured for her secrets. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, like, it is. It is. Like, we fucking chop up things and dissect them and act as if all things are there for the taking for us to you know examine and and to possess in this way like but also it's not all that like uh I like, I like gadgets and gizmos and and thingamajigs. Yeah. You know, I I like I like to vacuum my floor because I have a really fancy Dyson vacuum and and I like doing it. It makes me feel like I remember being a kid, seeing fancy vacuums and thinking like, oh man, I want a fancy vacuum for no other re- reason than that it's fancy. And I have a fancy vacuum now, and I oh, yeah. regularly vacuum my floor and I enjoy it. Like, dude, I get so much enjoyment just from having one of those little uh, dust devil things around, so that I can go. Zzz, <laughs> zzz, 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 zzz. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but look, uh, th- it's it's tr- it's true. On the one side, where we are in hi- in this sort of wonderland that they created, and uh, or that they were fighting to create, and at the same time, and of course, we love it or aspects of it at least but also on the other side of it is yeah it has made us into human resources it has reduced all time energy and creative powers into nothing more than labor power um and it's kind of nuts to think that it took Heidegger really to point out that it's it's not just oh, it's not just like this vision of like, let's bound her to the rack and no, it's actually like this idea like the fundamental reality is this way, right? Like fundamental truth and the good is that which is repeatable. 
fundamental truth and the good is that which does not change. If we can figure out what doesn't change in an entity, then we can get down into its essence and extract its hidden potentials and reuse them in whatever ways we want. It's like magic. It really is. I just, I don't see any difference. And so, I mean, someone would say, well, magic's just all in your head and it's woo, woo, woo. And it's, but science, no, science gives us like, it's repeatable. It's like, okay, so what if our, what if our definition of magic that we're operating with is some fairy tale nonsense and it's not, it's missing the real point. What if the real point is, you know, this, this exploiting the hidden potentialities of nature by whatever means possible and trying to find repeatable ways of doing so, so that you can predictably keep doing so and growing your power. And, and it's kind of crazy. Bacon literally says, my only earthly wish is to stretch the deplorably narrow limits of man's dominion over the universe. So he's saying man's dominion over the universe is measly. It's not a lot. It's very small. Our power, not big. But he wants to expand that to their promised bounds. Like he feels like he's on a cosmic mission to give us the ability to put our arms around the whole universe. And it's like, I think we all feel it sometimes, you know, like, yeah, maybe, maybe that is what we're, what we're a part of is something that is going to do that. I mean, that's definitely. I mean, that's there, and and that is. That resonates. I think for me, it's it's hard to, even get that far because it's like, oh, we're we're doing all this, we're doing this magic, simply so we can come up with better ways to churn out waste, like. So we can have plastic, so we can have landfills, so we can have, so I can have a, a, a desk that has, you know, a few thousand dollars worth of cameras and equipment, like just shit, just meaningless shit. Like we're not even doing cool shit with our, with our, <laughs> yeah. like, like we're torturing nature and ex ourselves so we can come up with more fucking waste. Yeah. That's like, that preoccupies me and and that comes down to social organization and politics um more than like this um you know cosmic question which i would love to sit and think about that but i have a hard time even getting there beyond the the political yeah and i'm saying that we feel that sometimes like Star Trek for sure is, yeah Star yeah Tre Star Trek is us feeling that sometimes uh, Avatar yep. is us feeling that sometimes Star Trek is the positive version Avatar is like the oh no but it's just more colonialism and yeah it's it, but it's also interesting like um, if we weren't seeing the negative effects of it hurting ourselves hurting our families hurting beautiful parts of the world if we could gentrify development in such a way so that we didn't see those things then we'd be stoked we'd be flying our cars we would be playing with our gadgets we'd be saying thank you Descartes and Bacon and right like and so it's almost like saying yeah but if we could just get our politics right then we can keep on doing exactly what we're doing we just won't see it we won't see what yeah. we're actually doing and we won't feel what we're actually doing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So that's just like to me this question of whether it's like at bottom a mode of world disclosure that is the issue or if it is at bottom capital and the relations of production and the political apparatuses that are necessary for the reproduction of the, those relations. Um, I guess I'll just say for now it remains kind of a big question mark because I think that there's other things on the table as well, not just those two, and that those two are essential for, for really figuring out what's whatever this elephant is, right? But... Um, 
I mean, uh, I, 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 we, 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 in previous conversations, Nance and I have talked about how. Well, I'm, I think I'm formulating it now as I fundamentally use Marx to think base, and I fundamentally use Heidegger to think superstructure, and the two are obviously dialectical, and so this being the fundamental mode of world disclosure in capitalism, right? Like that, that it's just okay, yeah. for sure. Um, but then that feels too easy for me, and I think there's a lot of ways of complicating it, but that's kind of besides the point. So for right now, I just wanted to really draw everyone's attention to that this paragraph is the juicy one, the one that Heidegger invokes in the question concerning technology, um, but it's also prophetic in the truest sense of the word. There's nothing more prophetic. Like him talking about AI, that's based as fuck. But him talking about us having an infinity of devices to satisfy our, uh, our desires and to make us lords and masters and possessors of nature. And that all of this is ultimately to conserve our health as the principal good and the basis of all other goods in this life. Like that is the most prophetic thing in the world. And could, could there be anything more obvious after COVID? Right after the whole world was like, oh my God, we better lock the fuck down. Science has gotten to this point now where it's like we're inventing the very things that we then are having to, like, okay, I mean, like, we're doing the research to create the viruses that are plaguing us. Right, because we're trying to stay out ahead of nature. We're trying to evolve these things faster than they evolve so that we can stay out ahead of them. And uh, it really is because health is more important than anything else. If, it, and it, it is kind of like Nietzsche coming along and saying life is the ultimate good. It's like that basically just gets taken. Descartes agrees with him. Like Nietzsche tries to build an eth uh, like a morality out of it. But it's just taken for granted that life is the ultimate good, that health is the ultimate good, and uh, that everything that we do, all of our labor, should be towards setting up a system that will preserve or conserve health forever, right? And so, you know, this idea that um, this is all a sort of push for immortality, you know, using science for immortality. That's obviously something that's popular to talk about from a variety of perspectives, and it's also right here. And honestly, I think it's based. Um, I don't think any amount of Eastern Orthodox bros or third worldist anarcho primitivists is going to get me to believe that, or that they actually want to go back to a time when, when we didn't have these things. Um, in any serious way, like that kind, of, that kind of wanting to go back to a time, like a time before Descartes. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, even Amish people are dissatisfied. That's why they they go on Rumspringa, and half of them never come back. I mean, not to say all of them are dissatisfied, but uh, there, there's no returning to anything. Like we. You just can't. It's not, not a thing that can be done. Nobody wants to do it. Nobody can do it. And it's just, it's, it's like, uh, it's aesthetics. You can want to like have the aesthetics of something, but you can't take that seriously. Yeah, but libidinal economy doesn't need it. Doesn't need it, the thing that's being taken seriously to be plausible and in fact the more impossible it is the more it might work at the level of libido because oh now you're desiring an impossible thing and even just even pushing in that desire in that direction requires you to engage your death drive because you're going against all the mainstream currents in your society and that's fun and so <laughs> you know I do think that's what's going yeah. on for Eastern Orthodox bros and third world as anarcho primitivists but uh, anyway, all right. 
This is the juicy shit, though, and it's just going to keep getting better, but we won't stop every time it gets great. I just really wanted to dwell on that paragraph because it was this paragraph that originally made me aware that the discourse on method even existed. Like, this was never assigned in any philosophy course I was ever in. It was just a, a professor who would give a lecture in a course that I was also teaching, and that professor used to always... I was kind of a TA, all right? I wasn't a teacher, but I had my own discussion sections for that course, and there was this one lecture he would give every semester, and he always used a quote from this paragraph, and so there we go. For the mind is so dependent upon the humors and the condition of the organs of the body that if it is possible to find some way to make men in general wiser and more clever than they have been so far, I believe that it is in medicine that it should be taught, that it should be sought. It is true that medicine at present contains little of such great value, but without intending to belittle it, I am sure that everyone, even among those who follow the profession, will admit that everything we know is almost nothing compared with what remains to be discovered, and that we might rid ourselves of an infinity of maladies, of body as well as of mind, and perhaps also of the enfeeblement of old age, if we had sufficient understanding of the causes and of all the remedies which nature has provided. It was my intention to devote my whole life to the pursuit of this much-needed service, and I had found a method which, it seemed to me, should infallibly lead me to it unless I was prevented either by the brevity of life or the paucity of experiments. I judged that the best precaution against these two dangers would be to publish faithfully to the world the little which I had discovered and to urge men of ability to continue the work of contributing, each one according to his inclinations and abilities, to the experiments which must be made. I hoped that each one would publish whatever he had learned so that later investigators could begin where the earlier had left off. In this way, mankind would combine the lives and work of many people and would go much further than any individual could go by himself. I noticed that experimentation becomes more necessary in proportion as we advance in knowledge. In beginning an investigation, it is better to restrict ourselves to our usual experiences, which we cannot ignore if we pay any attention to them at all, than to seek rarer and more abstruse experiences. The reason for this is that these latter are often deceiving when the causes of the more common phenomena are still unknown, as the circumstances on which they depend are almost always so particular and so minute that it is very difficult to discover them. My own procedure has been the following. I first tried to discover the general principles or first causes of all that exists or could exist in the world without taking any causes into consideration about God as creator and without using any evidence save certain indications of the truth which we find in our own minds. After that, I examined what were the first and commonest effects which could be deduced from these causes. And it seems to me that by this procedure, I discovered skies, stars, and earth, and even on the earth, water, air, fire, minerals, and several other things which are the commonest of all and the most simple, and in consequence, the easiest to understand. Then when I wanted to descend to particulars, it seemed to me that there were so many different kinds that I believed it impossible for the human mind to distinguish the forms or species of objects found on earth from an infinity of others which might have been there if God had so willed. It thus appeared impossible to proceed further deductively, and if we were to understand and make use of things, we would have to discover causes by their effects and make use of many experiments. In consequence, reviewing in my mind all the objects which had ever been presented to my senses, I believe I can say that I have never noticed anything which I could not explain easily enough by the principles I had found. But I must also admit that the powers of nature are so ample and vast, and that these principles are so simple and so general, that I hardly ever observed a particular effect without immediately recognizing several ways in which it could be deduced. My greatest difficulty usually is to find which of these is the true explanation, and to do this, and to do this, I know no other way 
than to seek several experiments such that their outcomes would be different according to the choice of hypotheses. For the rest, I have now reached the point, it seems to me, where I see clearly enough the direction in which we should go in this research. But I also see that the character and the number of experiments required is such that neither my time nor my resources, were they a thousand times greater than they are, would suffice to do them all. In proportion, therefore, to the opportunity I shall have in the future to do more or fewer of them, I will advance more or less in the understanding of nature. So hold on. It's a confusing way to say it. In proportion, therefore, to the opportunity I shall have in the future to do more or fewer discoveries, I will advance more or less in the understanding of nature. So he's basically saying uh, he needs to be able to do experiments, he needs to be able to do his research, and <clears throat> it requires time and resources to do that. And the more time and resources he has, the more he's going to be able to benefit humankind through its understanding of nature. And so this is um, an implicit call for freeing up his time energy. So I'm going to actually copy it and paste it into the document under the part that is titled Leisure and Labor. But since then, other reasons occurred to me which have, made my, which have made me change my mind. I still think that I should continue to write everything that I consider important as soon as I discover its truth, and do so with as much care as if I intended to publish it. If, the, if in this way I will have additional opportunities to examine my ideas, for doubtless we always scrutinize more closely that which we expect to be read by others than that which we do for ourselves alone. And frequently the ideas which seem true to me when I first conceived them have appeared false when I wished to put them on paper. Yeah, writing something out can really help. And knowing that you're doing it for other people helps even more. Which is, there's a sort of principle in all of that that has to do, that, that is why exegetical readings that are not done with the intention of sharing them don't really count at Theory Underground. Of course they count for you in a sort of sense. But when you know you're going to put it out, it changes the way that you read it. So actually, that's why I need to let Christopher know that these, so these time lapses that he's doing on his Instagram don't count as exegeticals. Because he, called, he said, my first exegetical, and it was actually a time lapse, where you can see that he's reading it out loud, but it's all sped up. It's not a real time lapse. He took the video, and then he made it short so that it looks like a time lapse. And if you listen to it, you can actually hear it being fast forwarded. The thing is, is if, if no one's going to hear you reasoning it out, out loud, then the principle that applies for writing for other people that Descartes talking about here, it's lost. But also time lapsing is based and, and it's, it's its own thing. It's its own thing that also matters. Also, I would thus lose no opportunity to benefit humanity if I am capable of it, and if my writings have any value, those into whose hands they fall after my death may use them as may be most appropriate. But I decided that I should never consent to have them published during my life, for fear that the opposition and controversy which they might arouse and the reputation which they might possibly bring me would cause me to waste time which I plan to use in research." God damn, I love that. And I'm putting that into the, uh, I'm putting that right into the exact same piece with leisure and labor. It's like when people are like, oh, well, wh what does the PMC have to do with this, this uh, time energy theory stuff, Dave? You should be doing that instead. It's like, yeah, except that almost everything that we want to do, we can't do because of the current situation. The first situation being we don't have time energy. The second situation being the main people who are either responsible for change making or think themselves responsible for change making don't really think about these kinds of distinctions. <clears throat> or, or don't think that, or very consciously think that uh, we should be kept busy and not be allowed to think. Mm-hmm. 
For although it is true that each man is obligated to do as much as he can for the benefit of others, and that to be of no use to anyone is really to be worthless, yet it is also true that our interest should extend beyond the present time, <clears throat> and that it is well to avoid things which may bring some profit to the living when it is done with the intention of profiting our descendants still more. Now, I hate to point out the Nazi in every sentence, but he did just say that if you're not of use to others, you are worthless. He says, for although it is true that each man is obligated to do as much as he can for the benefit of others, and that to be of no use to anyone is really to be worthless, yet it is also true that our interest should extend beyond the present time, and that it is well to avoid things which may bring some profit to the living when it is done with the intention of profiting our descendants still more. And I totally agree with that as far as it goes, but obviously worthless to who? Worthless for what? You know, those are the kind of the questions that it raises, but, but he's right as far as that goes. Like, obviously, if you're not of use to yourself or anyone else, you're going to feel worthless. And that's not just because of ideology. It's like you're not doing it. You're not, you're not caught up in equipmental totalities, right? Um, now, we might, we might be able to talk about there might be other ways of living life that have nothing to do with use value, right? And I think Baudrillard would say that's the point of symbolic exchange, of potlatch, of that's, that's uh, Bataille's kind of point going with all of this stuff about excess and sacrifice. The point is that pure use value and equivalence is not actually the, uh, the measure of value, except for in this strict sort of monetary sense. And outside of that strict monetary sense, there is a bigger domain of human exchange that is being rendered imperceivable because we've just been taught to see everything as money and use and exchange, right? So I want it to be understood that the little I have learned thus far is a mere nothing compared to what I do not know and yet do not despair of learning. For it is much taught, is, it is, for it is much the same. With the. Those, yeah, okay. It says tile, but for it is much the same with those who gradually discover truth in the sciences as with those who beginning to be rich find it less difficult to make important acquisitions than they formerly did when poorer to make much smaller ones. Or perhaps we should make the comparison with army chieftains or generals whose forces usually grow in proportion to their victories and who need more skill to maintain themselves after a defeat than they do to win cities and whole provinces after a victory. For to try to conquer all the difficulties and errors which stand in our way when we try to reach the truth is really to engage in battle, and to reach a false conclusion on an important issue is to lose the battle. After such a loss, much more ability is needed to reinstate ourselves in our former position than is required to make great progress when we have already acquired well-tested principles. For myself, if I have thus far found some truths in the sciences, and I trust that the treatises contained in this volume will convince the reader that I have, I can say that these are only the results and consequences of five or six principal difficulties which I have surmounted. These I count as so many battles in which fortune has been on my side. I would even go so far as to say that I think that two or three further victories of equal importance would enable me to reach my goal. And I am not so old that I cannot look forward to enough leisure in the ordinary course of nature for this purpose. But I feel the greater obligation... Leisure is the sole criterion of him being able to actually achieve his purpose, he's saying. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, it's beautiful. I'm going to snip that and drop that one over here as well.
but I feel the greater obligation to make good use of the time remaining to me, the more hope I have of being able to do so effectively, and I would no doubt find many occasions to waste time if I published the foundations of my physics. Dude, this is how I feel about publishing the Time Energy book, about organizing the tour, about doing the app. It's all a distraction from the real book that I'm trying to write. But at the same time, it's not because it's a book about time energy ultimately. And so I actually, I mean, so it, just navigating, living in a lot of different situations and trying to use my time energy to write a book about time energy is forcing me to theorize time energy and not, you know the kinds of complications that we run into when we're trying to automate processes or learn new skill sets um, or ultimate or when when everything I'm trying to do is being frustrated by various things and then I have to take a step back and really think about it all of that stuff ultimately is um, probably for the best it's probably important for this text and that's why if I was Descartes and I actually had all my leisure time yeah I wouldn't ever theorize time energy right because I would be focusing on other objects of consciousness but instead I'm focusing on that very object which I lack and which I could participate in just little bits here and there and I'm able to get a lot when I do but when I don't I can get a lot from when I don't either because there's something to exhaustion itself you know mm -hmm. For although my principles are almost also evident that to hear them is to believe them, yeah, and although there are none that I do not believe I can demonstrate, nevertheless, as they could not possibly agree with all the various opinions held by men at large, I foresee that I would, that I would often be distracted by the opposition which they would arouse. He doesn't want to be distracted. You want to read from here? One might argue that this opposition would be useful. Partly to show me my mistakes, partly so that if there were anything worth while in my ideas, others would learn a bit. And as many can see more than one, they would assist me immediately by their insight. But while I recognize that I am extremely likely to make mistakes, and while I rarely have much confidence in the first thoughts that come to me, nevertheless, my experience of the objection of, of the objections that may be raised against me does not lead me to expect much profit by them. For I have often been favored with the judgments both of those I took to be friends and of those whom I took to be indifferent, as well as of a few who were moved by malignity and envy to convey what the affection of my friends would conceal. Yet it has rarely happened that an objection was offered which I had not foreseen, except when it was very far-fetched, so that I have hardly ever met a critic of my opinions who did not appear to me to be either less rigorous or less equitable than myself. Nor have I noticed that the arguments carried on in the schools have ever brought to light a truth which was previously unknown. For when each person tries to win, he is more concerned to make his views prevail by appearing to be right than he is to weigh the evidence for both sides. Those who have long been good trial lawyers do not therefore make better judges afterwards. As for the advantages which others might derive from hearing my ideas, they could not be so very great, especially since my ideas are still in a stage where much more has to be done before they can be applied to practice. And I think I may say without vanity that if anyone can accomplish, accomplish this, it should be myself rather than any other person. Not that there may not be many minds incomparably superior to my own, but that we never understand a thing so well and make it our own when we learn it from another as when we have discovered it for ourselves. This is so true in this instance that although I have often explained some of my opinions to very intelligent people who seemed to understand them very distinctly while I was speaking, nevertheless, when they retold them, I have noticed that they have almost always so changed them that I could no longer accept them as my own. I said, I should also like to take advantage of this occasion to request posterity, never to request posterity, never to believe believe that any ideas are mine unless I've divulged them myself. I am not at all surprised at the extravagances attributed to the ancient philosophers whose writings we do not possess, nor do I judge in consequence that their ideas were unreasonable. They were the wisest men of their time, so I presume that their ideas have been badly reported. We notice, also, that it has rarely happened that one of their disciples has surpassed them, 
And I feel sure that the most devoted of the contemporary followers of Aristotle would consider themselves fortunate if they had as much knowledge of nature as he had, even on the condition that they would never have any more. They are like the ivy, which has no tendency to climb higher than the trees which support it, and often grows downward after it has reached the top. Damn. For it seems to me that followers also decline. That is, they make themselves somehow less wise than they would be if they abstain from study when they are not satisfied to understand what is intelligibly explained by their author, but insist on finding in him the solutions of many problems of which he says nothing, and of which he has perhaps never thought. Just the same, their manner of philosophizing... Dude, Marxists. Marxists yes. are the perfect <laughs> example of this. Like, oh, we could come up with a Marxist explanation of this, of this, of that. And it's like, these are literal subject matters or objects that are, are not even... That his entire method's not developing to try to understand, right? So yeah, this, this talking about the degeneration with followers, it's, it is also just look at... this. This is the, uh, like, Freud, Marx, Husserl. He okay, Heidegger was a, a follower of Husserl, and Wittgenstein was a follower of Russell. And so we've got a couple of modern examples where it's like, it's not necessarily true that the followers aren't able to surpass their mentors. But then again, if you look, every great thinker had mentors, right? And so... Um, but I think this, this is not only true, but it's also the reason to not celebrate mas masters so much as mastery as, a, as an ideal worth working mm -hmm. towards. And to see ourselves, all, we're all students of mastery, and we can all take on the role of master as a performative function to help ourselves do something. But that... But but yeah, this this uh, this influencers and followers thing, ultimately it's yeah. uh, it's a disaster. Just the same, their manner of philosophizing is very convenient for those who have only very mediocre minds. For the obscurity of the distinctions and principles which they use enables them to talk of all things as bravely as though they understood them. And to defend all they say against the deepest and cleverest thinkers, as there is no way to convince them. In this they appear to be similar to a blind man who wishes to fight on even terms with one who can see, and so brings him to the back of some very dark cave. These people, I may say, are interested in my abstaining from the publication of my principles of philosophy. For since these are very simple and evident, I would be doing much the same to them as though I opened some windows and let the light of the light of day enter into that cave where they had retired to fight but even the best minds need not wish to know my principles for if they want to be able to talk about all the things and gain the reputation of being learned they can accomplish this more easily by being satisfied with the appearance of truth which can be found without much trouble in all sorts of matters than by seeking truth itself truth can be discovered only little by little and in a few subjects so that he who pursues truth is often obliged to admit it to admit his ignorance when discussing a subject which he has not investigated. But if they prefer the knowledge of a little truth to the vanity of seeming to know everything, as is no doubt preferable, and if they wish to pursue a plan similar to mine, it is not necessary for me to tell them anything more than I have already said in this discourse. For if they are capable of going further than I have gone, they will be still more capable of finding for themselves everything which I think I have found. This is especially true because I have always proceeded in a natural order, so that it is certain that what remains to be discovered is more difficult in itself and more recondite than what I have so far encountered. They would also experience much less pleasure in learning, in learning it from me than in discovering it for themselves. In addition, they would thus acquire the habit of discovery by seeking easy things first, and pass gradually and by degrees to more difficult ones, a habit which will prove much more useful than all my information could possibly be. As for myself, I am persuaded that if I had been taught in my youth all the truths of which I have sought since sought demonstrations, and if I could have learned them without difficulty, I might never have learned any others, or at least I would never have acquired the habit and ability that I believe I possess, always to find new truths in proportion to the efforts I make to find them. In a word, 
If there is one task in this world that cannot be finished as well as by another is by the one who started it, it is this one at which I am working. It is true that as far as the related experiments are concerned, one man is not enough to do them all, but he could not usefully employ other hands than his own, unless those of workers or other persons whom he could pay. Such people would do, in the hope of a gain, which is a very effective motive, precisely what they were told. As for those volunteers who might offer to do it out of curiosity or the desire to learn, besides the fact that they or that ordinarily they are stronger in promises than in performance and that they make nothing but beautiful proposals of which none ever succeeds, they would infallibly expect to be paid by the explanation of some difficulties, or at least in compliments and useless conversation, which would necessarily consume so much of the time needed for investigation that the assistance would be a net loss. This is literally academia today. Yeah. <laughs> if you if you're not t if you're not p expending tremendous amounts of mental energy towards uh, figuring out how to keep people happy with compliments or talking the way they want you to talk, basically that will make them happy, then uh, then you're fucked, right? It's just like. There's a lot more effort that gets put into how to talk than what's actually to be done. So, As for the experiments which others have already made, even if they were willing to communicate them, which those who call them secrets never do, they are for the most part so complicated with unneeded details and superflu superfluous ingredients that it would be very difficult for the investigator to discover their core of truth. Besides this, he would find almost all these experiments so poorly explained or even false, because those who perform them force themselves to make them appear conformable to their principles, that if some of them were useful, they could not be they could not counterbalance the time that would be lost in picking them out. So even if there were someone in the world who could be recognized without question as capable of making the greatest and the most beneficial discoveries, and even if in consequence all other men attempted by every means to aid him in the accomplishment of his designs. I do not see that they could do anything except contribute to the cost of the necessary experiments and see that his leisure is not interrupted by the importunities of anyone. But I am not so presumptuous as to promise anything extraordinary, nor do I indulge in such vain fancies as to imagine that the public ought to be much interested in my plans. Finally, I am not so base in spirit that I would be willing to accept from anyone whomsoever a favor which it might be thought I had not deserved. All these considerations taken together made me decide, three years ago, that I did not wish to publish the treatise which I had on hand. And I even resolved never during my lifetime to permit others to read any paper of such a general nature that they might understand the foundations of my physics. But two other reasons have occurred since which have obliged me to submit herewith some detailed essays and to give the public some account of my doings and my plans. The first reason is that if I did not do so, several people who knew of my previous intention to publish several essays might suppose that my reasons for abstaining were less honorable than they really are. For although I do not care too greatly for reputation, I might even say that I dislike it insofar as I consider it destructive of peace of mind, which I esteem above all things. Nevertheless, I have never tried to hide my actions as though they were criminal. Neither have I made much effort to remain unknown. Partly because I would have thought I was doing myself an injustice, partly because that would have produced a certain disquiet unfavorable to that perfect peace of mind which I desire. I have always tried to remain indifferent to having or not having a reputation. But since I could not avoid having some kind, I thought I should at least do my best to avoid a bad one. The other reason which has obliged me to write this is that I observe a constantly greater retardation in my plan to enlighten myself because of an affinity of experiments which I must do so that it is impossible for me to succeed without the aid of others. And although I do not flatter myself enough to hope that the public would be much interested in what I am doing, nevertheless, I do not wish to be so remiss in, up in upholding my own interests as to give occasion to those who survive me to reproach me someday on the ground that I might have accomplished many much better things than I did if I had not been too negligent to explain how others could contribute to my designs. This part is, is a little like, okay, dude, we, 
We get it. <laughs> this, uh, this, you know, thinking about the, oh, are humans really pleasure-seeking animals uh, when we clearly get jouissance from tension and, and destabilizing um, that? And here he's, twice he talks about the importance of his peace of mind in this paragraph he really wants that pleasure. He really wants that homeostasis, that equilibrium, that peace of mind. But he's also contorting himself in social niceties and the kind of discourse of everything about this, in the, the perfection of this document speaks to the fact that he's spent innumerable amounts of time worrying about his reputation. Mm -hmm. So he, even even the whole like, well, I don't really care about it much at all. But and then it, da, 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 yeah. da, 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 and then he's all, but it would be better that I at least you know. And so he does. But I, that it was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I thought that it would be easy to choose some topics which would not be too controversial, which would not force me to divulge more of my principles than I wish to, and which would not demonstrate clearly enough what I could or could not do in the sciences. It is not for me to say whether I have succeeded, and I do not wish to influence anyone's decisions by speaking of my own writings. Nevertheless, I should like to request the reader to examine them. In order to add to the opportunities of judging, I also request all who find some obje objections to my ideas to take the trouble to send them to my publisher. <laughs> <laughs> He will inform me, and I shall try to have my replies published at the same time as the objections. By this means, the reader, seeing both together, will more easily judge, judge of the truth. For I do not promise ever to make lengthy replies, but only to admit my mistakes very frankly if I recognize them, or, if I cannot recognize them, to say simply what I believe to be required for the defense of what I have written. But I shall not go on to explain any new material for fear of engaging in an endless chain of tasks. If some of the matters I deal with at the beginning of optics and meteorology should at first should at first sight appear offensive, because I call them hypotheses and do not try to prove them, let the reader have the patience to read all of it with attention, and I hope that he will be satisfied with the result. For it seems to me that the arguments follow one another in such a way that, just as the last principles are demonstrated by the first ones, which are their causes, so these first ones are reciprocally demonstrated by the last, which are their effects. And one must not suppose that I have here committed the fallacy which logicians call circular reasoning. For as experience makes most of the effects very certain, the causes from which I deduce them serve not so much to prove as to explain them. On the contrary, the truth of the hypotheses is proved by the actuality of the effects. And I have called them hypotheses only to let it be known that although I think I can deduce from them the first truths which I have previously explained, I expressly desired not to make the deduction. For there are certain people who imagine that they can learn in one day all that another has thought in twenty years, as soon as he has only spoken two or three words, and who are only the more subject to error and less capable of truth, as they are more penetrating and lively of spirit. I should like to prevent these people from building some extravagant philosophy on what they believe to be my principles, for the fault might be attributed to me. <laughs> As for my real opinions, that's keep my name out your mouth. Yeah, that's exactly what that was. <laughs> <laughs> As for my real opinions, I do not apologize for their novelty, especially since I am sure that anyone who attends to the argument will find them so simple and so conformable to common sense that they will seem less extraordinary and strange than any other opinions that can be held on the same subjects. I do not claim, either, that I am original in any of these ideas, but only that I have never accepted them because they were maintained by others, nor because they were not so maintained, but only because reason persuaded me of their truth. <clears throat> and if the invention described in optics cannot immediately be built, I do not think it is therefore faulty, since much skill and practice are necessary in order to make and adjust the machines which I have described, without their having any defects. 
I would not be less astonished to find it successful on the first attempt than I would be if someone could learn to play the lute excellently in a single day, for the sole reason that he had been given some excellent sheet music. And if I write in French, which is the language of my country, rather than in Latin, which is that of my teachers, it is because I hope that those who rely purely on their natural intelligence will be better judges of my views than those who believe only what they find in the writings of antiquity. And those who combine good sense with studiousness, whom alone I wish for my judges, will not, I am sure, be so partial to Latin that they will refuse to accept my reasons because I explain them in the vulgar tongue. For the rest, I do not wish to speak here in detail of the progress in the sciences which I hope to make in the future, nor to commit myself to any promise to the public which I am not sure of fulfilling. I shall therefore only say that I have resolved to employ as much of my life as remains wholly in trying to acquire some knowledge of nature, of such a sort that we may derive rules of medicine more certain than those which we have had up to the present. My inclinations are so far removed from any other plans, especially the, those which can be useful to some only by harming others, that if circumstances force me to employ those plans, I do not think I would be capable of carrying them to a, a successful conclusion. The declaration I am here making will not, I well know, procure me any worldly advantages, but I have no desire for them, and I shall always consider myself more obligated to those by whose favor I shall enjoy uninterrupted leisure than I would be to those who offered me the most honorable office on earth. Boom. We did it, everybody. Tight, 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 yeah! That's my two buttons on this, <laughs> on this <laughs> soundboard, man. I need... If I had my leisure time, I would really do something with this soundboard, but oh well. Obama! <laughs> I never even added that. Oh no. Chiquito banana, chiquito. All right, so that's an outside reference to something else. Um, <laughs> anybody who's actually watched all of our exegeticals will know what that was a reference to. The declaration I am here making will not, I well know, procure me any worldly advantages, but I have no desire for them, and I shall always consider myself more obligated to those by whose favor I shall enjoy uninterrupted leisure than I would be to those who offered me the most honorable office on earth. That's how I feel. I will always feel like um, it is the people who contribute towards me being able to have some relative time energy so I can theorize time energy um, it'll always be them as opposed to anybody who's like oh, would you like to sit on this board would you like to be on this committee would you like to get published by this prestigious publisher would you like to be a part of this conference you know all of this other stuff and so and it I just I think that it's the most underground theorist sentiment right I think that he he's kind of special He's not one of the schoolmen. He was educated like the schoolmen, but he's not one of them because he actually, he said it at the beginning. He actually, and I would like to quote that part that he said at the beginning, if we could remember any of the words from that part, but he basically said he didn't have to work. He said after school, he was able, I think he says something about his privilege. Um, yeah, he, I can't remember the words, but he, he calls out the fact that he, has free time basically let's see if I look up the word leisure um, uh, nope the first time he mentions leisure in the whole thing was when he's alone in that warm room and he had the whole day to himself and he didn't have and he had perfect peace of mind it's like it's like this idyllic day that he ha he achieved but that's not where he talks about how after school he had all this time. Um, let's see. He revered theology. Finally, when it came to other branches of learning, since they took their cardinal principles from philosophy, I judged that nothing solid could have blah, blah, blah. 
This is why I gave up my studies entirely as soon as I reached the age when I was no longer under the control of my teachers. I resolved to seek no other knowledge than that which I might find within myself or perhaps in the great book of nature. I spent a few years of my adolescence traveling, seeing courts and armies, living with people of diverse types and stations of life, acquiring varied experience, testing myself in the episodes which fortune sent me, and above all, thinking about the things around me so that I could derive some profit from them. For it seemed to me that I might find much more of the truth in the, in the cogitations which each man made of things which were important to him, and where he would be the loser if he judged badly, than in the cogitations of a man of letters in his study concerned with speculations which produce no effect, and which have no consequences to him, except perhaps that the farther they are removed from common sense, the more they titillate his vanity. Since then he needs so much more wit and skill to make them seem plausible. That, by the way, is the critique I have of Lacanians in general. I, 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 uh, I, I think that that is a thing. When you, <clears throat> when your entire life, you've just been kind of speculating, and all that matters is your ability to make the nonsensical seem plausible, and you get like your, you get your thrills from doing that. Um, well, that sucks. And then obviously that's useless. Um, and so when, uh, when there's a sort of sector of academia where it's almost like they put a big old sign out in the front yard that says, everybody who gets their enjoyment that way, come over here. Like inside that house is Lacanians. And so it's like, uh, I, I, I told Mikey this, this point blank the other day. I don't care about Lacan. I don't care about Lacan's Lacan. I don't care about Dwayne Roussel's uh, Lacan, Todd McGowan's Lacan, Slavoj Žižek's Lacan. I, I care about Michael Downs's Lacan. His is mm-hmm. the only Lacan I give a fuck about. Now, Michael Downs gets a lot from all of these other people, and I like Todd a lot. I like Dwayne. I think he's a great guy. Uh, Dwayne Roussel, fantastic guy. Um, I meant to say, Russ Sprigula, great guy. You know these there, there's there, these Lacanians are awesome. Alenka Zupanchich, total total badass. But there does seem to be a lot of people just getting enjoyment from keeping shit vague and obscurantist and and I think that there's like if you live a very fragile life and you have a lot of leisure. And you've been super privileged, and the things that you do. What, how does he say it here? He says that he. So it's the opposite of of this. He wants to learn from the people whose whose cogitations, which is to say their mental processes, which each man made on things which were important to him, and where he would be the loser if he judged badly. Like he thinks that people who've got skin in the game and they can actually lose something. You know, that's the people that he wants to learn from, not from people who are doing stuff where it's completely removed from consequences. And it does seem like the the only kinds of consequences that exist in academia are reputation based, right? They're not outside of reputation, ego games, rhetoric and persuasion. Um, it's not a whole lot, and so I love everything I've learned through Mikey about Lacan and. I love that he's learning from that constellation of thinkers I just la- listed out. But as far as like the rest of them goes, and as far as like that being like the primary area that I'm going to be preoccupied in, no, absolutely not. I, I'm, I'm here for Mikey's Lacan, and I think that if you're wasting, okay, are you wasting your time? I don't know. I just feel like if you if you spend a lot of time in secondary literature, um, so that you can kind of know who's who in these social circles in this Lacanian world um, you're just barking up the wrong tree man like there's just nothing fundamentally there that's gonna alter reality I don't think except for some of the basic things that I've gotten so far and then Mikey will probably reveal additional levels to this as time goes on and maybe eventually I'll be at the point where I could actually say, oh, 
see that th those Lacanians are doing real work and then those other ones are not but it's I, I don't know I don't know and I don't think most of them give a fuck because most of them are doing like literary criticism film criticism like their projects are not fundamentally about trying to free up time and energy for everybody or they wouldn't just be focused on that they would also be focused on capital and not just the three volumes but where it's at now and how it's changed and all of these other thinkers that are necessary for understanding it, including everything involved and implicated in critical media theory, professional managerial class consciousness and ideology. But the reason that I'm so sworn to, to Mikey at this point is because he writes in American Standard English. And so I want to take the last paragraph, if you'll go to the very bottom. I'll take the very last paragraph... and reread it, I just, I swapped a couple things out here, and now I'm imagining that it's Michael Downs who's, who wrote this, right, and I, I, I don't idolize the man, because, I mean, he's a flawed person, fuck, fuck Mikey, man, me and him, we argue all the time, we got our fights, but I, I idolize the, the, the idea of trying to just come out and say it, in as many ways as you can, to just get the point across, and not hide behind vagaries, right? Like, that's something that makes him stand out from the Lacanian crowd, which is just one part of the larger theory academic crowd. But, but okay, now imagine that Mikey's saying this. Um, it's the part that, the second to last paragraph, it's the last half of that paragraph. I'm just going to read it. And if I write in American Standard English, which is the language of my country, rather than in theory speak, which is that of my teachers. It is because I hope that those who rely purely on their natural intelligence will be better judges of my views than those who believe only what they find in my writings, only what they find in the theory world. And those who combine good sense with studiousness, whom alone I wish for my judges, will not, I am sure, be so partial to theory speak that they will refuse to accept my reasons because I explain them in the vulgar tongue. And I see really like most social justice stuff that's focused on, oh, isn't that like a, isn't that an ableist metaphor that you just used? Oh, we should, we should, don't say that you're blinded to the, that someone was blinded to this fact. We got to get that out of our vocab because that's offending somebody. Um, I see this kind of, this is the creation of Latin out of the vulgar tongue. Right. This is why I don't think it's pointless to make comparisons from the PMC to the priest class. Right. Mm. Because the, the priest class has always maintained the distinction between the lang the elite language and the vulgar tongue. And here we have like this amazing experiment where there's no kings supposedly in, in the United States. And, uh, Oh, fuck the king. We were, we're allowed to say that. We're allowed to blaspheme. We're allowed to do treason. Um, to Well, okay, as long as you're not like a Snowden. But you know, for the most part, you can say, fuck the king, fuck God. But you can't, you can't say that's retarded. Right? Like, that's the point, is that, that we have, like, this ultimate freedom. And then, of course, what happens is... Well, we're going to focus on reestablishing that there is a strong distinction between a vulgar tongue and the uh, and the more genteel way of speaking. And so, this uh, I, I I don't know. It's just like it, it only really clicked uh, on reading this for like the third time. But the vulgar. Tongue. I mean, of course, we, we know that there's such a thing as vulgar speech. People who say, Jesus fucking Christ, ah, shit. Okay, that's vulgar. Um, but what we forget about is that there used to be, that used to be more than a metaphor. It used to be that there's people who just speak the vulgar tongue, and then there's people who just speak primarily in Latin. They might use a little of the vulgar tongue to get around town. But it's basically, there's the slave tongue, there's the yep. servant tongue, and then there's the tongue reserved for thinking. Yeah, and the vulgar tongue was always a local. It was always a local language or dialect or vernacular. 
because it is of the people rather than of those priestly or the imperial, like how whatever metaphor you want to use, yeah. but it is this multi-tiered um, thing of like, those are the people, those are the proles, those are the fucking, you know, the losers, the guys who have to work for a living, and we are the elite who can travel and move freely about the empire or the uh, Christendom or or whatever. Um, yeah, and it it kind of became like vulgar used to be this like language of the people, and then it became like, oh, don't be vulgar. Like, oh, I got to scratch my ass, or, or oh. I farted or oh, oh you're a bitch like that's vulgar that's nasty that's dirty it's unclean it's unseemly <laughs> yeah which, um which, which yeah is, the, which instead of it being unholy it goes against health right health is the primary yeah. value <laughs> so it's yeah um yeah yeah s- s- sterility sanity uh health safety um wholesomeness yeah don't hang out with that uh with that libertarian he's dangerous yeah and you know fuck most people who call themselves libertarians but that is <laughs> you know um that's not that's not safe that's uncouth that's yeah, it's, there's... it's not that they're wrong and worth engaging with or arguing with or having principled disagreements with. No, 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 no. It's just, oh, they're just not safe. Oh, they're just toxic. They're just yep. toxic, dude. Or they're kind of weird, man. They're kind of, I don't know. <laughs> they're kind of weird, man. Yeah. This is, uh, Just something to be thinking about, I guess. But that's... I, I just do a thought experiment, I suppose. Not you, Nance. But also you. But really everybody. Just be thinking about it. What would it be like to live in a world where you didn't speak the language of the people who look like you, but they have fancier clothes and they know how to present their bodies and perform their gender in a very sophisticated way, right? And I would say, like, yeah, the, the gender becomes gender with the ruling class. Like, otherwise, there's just people just doing what they do. But with the ruling class, we get ever-refined, ever-more-sophisticated ways of articulating ourselves. And, oh, this is, a, this is at the level where, yeah, being a woman really just means coquettishness, right? When Alenka is talking about that in What is Sex?, so like, yeah, there, there's nothing beneath the mask except for an anxiety of trying to perform in a specific way, and it's just like if you read Pride and Prejudice or any of these like ancient kind of literary works, that that anxiety of of performativity and of oh, does so and so know that I know that so and so knows that I know that so and so knows, it, and this whole referentiality of just socialite anxiety that only could possibly be experienced by people who've never had to work, who've never even thought of working, and who've always just kind of presumed, well, of course, the work just gets done by that kind of people, whether it's based on race, whether it's based on class, whether it's ba- it doesn't matter. And everyone, of course, progressive, like in the last couple uh, decades especially, oh yeah, it's it's always because of race to them. It's like, sure, that's also, that's one of the legitimation narratives for having other people do everything for you. But the point, this is the point from uh, what we've done with Dr. Adolph Reed Jr.'s um, piece on the color line, right? The color line then and now. And that is, no, these are a script, there are ascriptive hierarchies for function that function as legitimation narratives for saying yeah of course they do that kind of work and of course we don't and what the PMC has always done in especially in the last hundred years is it focuses its debates on which ascriptive hierarchies for making that distinction are fair and which ones aren't fair right 
yeah, rather than rather than uh, even questioning whether or not we should have these hierarchies, they they want to talk about, oh well, can we morally support this hierarchy, um, or or not? Yeah, it's and it it's a bait and switch. Like that's that's all it is, and I mean. Yeah, I guess the first step to changing it is coming to terms with the fact that it's a very real thing. Sadly, nowadays there is no one vulgar tongue, and there's a lot to be done on this front from thinking about critical media theory, because to say like should we speak in the common vernacular should we talk about how one speaks well how one what one what one which who which what public and so this is of course where the social justice response will come you're just essentializing um, the blue collar vernacular uh, as blue collar but in reality it's just fucking predominantly this white male cis hetero like uh, stereotype that you're saying is the worker when in reality workers are brown workers are black they're gay there's whatever there's a variety of workers obviously and I think it's more complicated than that it's not just that there's not a common vernacular that we can speak um, or that Oh, oh, people we, think we've, of this common vernacular as being like an, an, it, it's a it's actually white, but it, we, we've been thinking of it as blue collar. No, it's more complicated because of the boutique consumer uh, identi- identitarian yeah. phenomenon that the internet is facilitating, so that we all develop super niche ways of talking. So that there's actually yeah, the, the idea of a public, which is something that he's assuming, and that any anybody in a world with newspapers assumes. That's the thing that's gone. That's what we're truly scared of. We're scared of a time that doesn't have newspapers and that everyone doesn't read it, right? This is why Marxists print their own newspapers. I just found out that the IMT also prints its own newspaper. Swole is supposed to go sell this newspaper called Fight Back in the streets of Ontario. Who the fuck wants a newspaper? <laughs> why is this? And it's I mean, every- as, as a curio, sure. I'd buy it, but but as anything other than um, a novelty, like it, it, and that is a novelty. Like, yeah, I think we need to come to terms with the fact that we've been balkanized, rather than like trying to um, pretend it hasn't happened. Like, we need to figure out a way to deal with facts rather than trying to change facts. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I would, I would buy the shit out of a Marxist newspaper but i wouldn't read it (laughs) yeah i would i would put it somewhere that we could all talk about it and point at it yeah yeah um i don't read the newspaper i i get updates i and and it's it's schizophrenic my phone is schizophrenic and it's making me schizophrenic too but my phone tells me random things whenever it feels like it I don't check my phone. I get alerts. I get alerts on my watch. Your phone checks you. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and and that's that's a condition we need to to deal with rather than like trying to pretend that that we still maintain some dominion over the world of information. We don't, folks. We're fucked. Like, <laughs> come up with come up with a new strategy. That saying that it's fundamentally a novelty is like when post. post so McLuhan is saying the te- the television is fundamentally making distance obsolete. Now we're able to see everything everywhere all at once, and we're all going to become the global village. Postman turns right around and says, "Ah." You forget that, that that what it's done is it's made the whole world, the other, entertainment. It's yep. actually made it's made all of the destruction being seen in Vietnam entertainment. You consume it, you get mad about it, you feel terrible about it, but you feel terrible about it as entertainment, right? So the revolution will not be televised, right? And so we all get that now. But then when people think of the newspaper, it's still the model 
that we, we, we have like this idea of truth telling to the public and that journalists serve that interest and all of this stuff that goes with that is metaphors that have been lifted from a bygone era when the newspaper actually served that function. And so what function does it serve now? Novelty. Or in mm-hmm. my case, in my case, fire starter. It's really good for getting a fire started. <laughs> Dude, this sunlight is absolutely killing me. It's like, I kind of want to hide down here, like the window. I have to get like a curtain over this thing because. All right, we should. You're fighting the sun, dude. You're, you're fighting the sun. Yeah, it's, it's going after me for sure. I, I should defend myself. All right. Well, what do we want to say before we close this thing out? Descartes, a pimp. Don't sleep on Descartes. Um, and I, I don't like the fact that I just said the word pimp because in my, in my liberal leanings, I don't like that word. It's a gross word. It glorifies the sex trade and the sex trade is one that I support, but it's also one that's very problematic and that oftentimes it is made, it, it, it's constituted or it's, there's women that are sex trafficked and that's not a good thing. And so we shouldn't use pip pimp as a cool word to mean cool shit. But also, I was listening to Ice Cube earlier today, and Ice Cube's a pimp, and also Descartes a pimp. <laughs> and actually, he, want, he wants to pimp nature. I think that's the whole yeah. point. <laughs> that's the whole point yeah. here. <laughs> and now that you've, now that you've done your... Uh, I don't want to call caveats. it... caveats? No, I don't want to call it virtue signaling. I want to call it like a... What, what's like a... <laughs> Like a like a like a priest has a bunch of hand signs they have to make before they do a thing, <laughs> like a sacrament or something. Now that you've done your yeah, now that you've done your liberal left progressive sacrament um, to preserve any possible future um, in the neo feudal uh, <laughs> wasteland that we're going to be in, um, I, I I would say yeah, I agree obviously, and also pimp means the opposite of pimp. That's 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 a simple solution. You know, pimp means the exact opposite of pimp. If you say pimp means cool, then you're using it in the sense where it means the opposite. And I've got no problem with saying that's fucking sick, dude. And someone goes, well, sickness is bad. And it's like, yeah, weird thing about language where we take things and use them as the opposite. I don't know. Yeah, that's badass, dude. I think that's going back to this whole thing about the vulgar tongue. People who know that they are vulgar in the sense that they know they're seen that way and they know that they're treated that way Mm will always try to talk in a different tongue anyway and that's why Mm -hmm. dialects emerge that's why you have Spanish Creole you have French Creole you have English Creole all of these different Creoles come from slaves trying to find their own way of using the uh, the master's language but then skirting it and bending it and, and literally like I ain't got no means the op if you take it literally it means the opposite of what it says but no i ain't got no time for that no that's you were just everyone knows what it means right and slang slang has a thing for doing that for it's like oh yeah it's opposite day because i'm still using the master's language right and uh, it's 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 esoteric in a way i mean not in a way it is it is it's it's meant to be it's meant to cause a breakdown for the eavesdropping master. It's meant to throw them out of a ready to hand circumspective relation with what's being said. And so, um, it's funny that even though we don't have a real vulgar tongue, there's this push for all of us to find our own unique ways of speaking that will help us set ourselves apart from the people who think themselves better than us. And then of course the people who think themselves better than us, they try to sit there and, Oh, well, you all say this word. No more of that. Stop saying that, or you don't deserve to be out of the blue collar class. And it's like, or or you won't you don't deserve to have Medicare for all because you said retarded. It's just like yeah. I, I don't even I, I don't even say that word outside of using that word t- 
to reference someone who says that word. I just, it's not a, it's not yeah. a part of my vernacular. It is a part of other people that I've met. Right? It's a couple of my family members. They might use it still. But most of the people in my family don't use it. And I grew up in a household that said don't do that because for Christian reasons, it's just not respectful. But it's like, you know, I just it's so weird to me that uh, that we're still there. That that's still where activism's focused on, and it's like I thought we got over that in like 2014, 2015 to 2016. I really thought we were over it, and then 2017, 2018, 2019. I was like, well, maybe I just need to give myself over to it. And then by the time 2020 rolled around, I was like, oh, you know what? All these people who want me to give myself over to this fucking PMCification of everything that sets me apart from regular working class people in my life. Um, it was a dupe. It was a bu- it, it was mm-hmm. it was a bait and switch. They told me, "Oh, you play our game, you'll at least get your Medicare." No, 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 no. They they couldn't tell the difference between Cory Bush, and and, uh, and 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 a Bernie, and uh, yeah. or, or 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 in the case of like a Kimberly Crenshaw or a Judith Butler, they couldn't tell the difference yep. between a Bernie and a Biden. Yeah. Yeah. That's the uh, the piece that will be in the uh, under, the the volume, of the coming the forthcoming volume of Underground Theory, um, the Finkelstein piece, goes into that. He's got the receipts on all the stuff that Kimberly Crenshaw and Judith Butler and all of them were doing in the media, right at the decisive moment when, at least a little hope for something like Medicare for All was just fucking, got the, got the night of. Long knives treatment. That it, yeah. Yeah, man. Shit like that's really discouraging. Um, and on one hand, because it's like, oh, anytime there, it seems like things are going to change. Something bad always happens. But then that kind of makes me feel like, well, that's not where change happens anyway. So focusing on that, um, you've already lost. If, if that's where your focus is. And I don't, I don't like that mindset. I don't, I don't think that's a hundred percent right. I think it's mostly right, but. It's the American in me wants to believe that <laughs> the political fucking process is still somehow worth being invested in. Yeah, because for me, the whole time I was I was doing the Bernie thing, I was still based in Marx mm-hmm. and surrounded by Marxists who would roll their eyes and say, well, that's never going to happen. And then I was surrounded by liberals who said the exact same thing. And I just felt angry at both sides of to both sides of me. It's just like I've got Marxists on one side being like, oh, it's not Lenin. And then I've got people on the other side going, Oh, he's a white male though, and he's old, and so it's just like getting that for like eight years, basically, was my experience. Like eight years of people being that way, and it's just like, um, no, I, I say eight years. Okay, really, it's not eight years. It starts really in 2015 and goes through 2020, so that's only like that's not that many years, right? How many years? Yeah, five been? years. Five years and some change, maybe. Yeah. Well, it felt like a hundred years, and uh, and so then then there's this part of me that doesn't like that narrative you just went through, because it it's one that I think that that oh yeah well that's not where change happens anyway is one of the things that some people used while I'm trying to make an inarguably positive change occur mm-hmm. right. Uh, or at least what I took to be one. And so, um, but then I'm like, well, but they were all right in a sort of sense. So am I just mad at them for being right? But then it's like, but they're also wrong. And so it's like, I don't know when it, when it comes to some people making some basic positive change, I don't, I don't like to poo poo it cause I don't have any great solutions either, you know? Right. Um, but as far as what, so there's, there's this, there's this conflict in you where on the one side you're American and you go, well, yeah, but our political system change can be achieved through it. And then this other part of you that's like, nah, man, 
And I just have to say, like, that part of you that says, nah, man, versus that part of you that's like, yeah, no, it's possible. Um, th- I want to bring that back to the part when you said that these problems, I was talking about Heidegger, in framing Francis Bacon, Descartes, and you're like, it's political. I yeah. just want to, I want to bring it back to that because I was like, that's the American answer. You, you, <laughs> that's your American <laughs> answer. <laughs> of course, it, you know, it was, it was, it wasn't just an American answer everywhere that every, anywhere the people have made trans major transformations that's operative. But I just, I don't know. I just don't even know if what's called political today is political in any sort of a sense that maintains more than a vague analogy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, I don't know. It's like, do we, are, do we have like this sort of dogmatic faith in, in a politics? We're just like, we can't, we can't, we, we haven't formalized what that would be yet. We haven't tested it. We have no idea of what it is and we lack a method for being able to figure that out and all that we have instead are a bunch of sort of ontic fucking ossified instantiations of what politics supposedly is you know maybe yeah well i i spent a long time being like just an anarchist who was like, yeah, whatever, dude, it's all bullshit, nothing matters. But that ultimately was was not satisfying. Like, I, I moved on from that position. Um, and I've, I guess I've since moved on from where I moved. Um, but it's not like I went back there. Like, that's still un, like not, not, not a satisfying position. Um, but yeah, I, I don't... Again... I don't have a third position. I have a non-position at this point. Yeah. Which Descartes thinks is a great position to have as long as you can build a nice little house. So I think what we need right now is probably just a nice little house. Like a, we'll call it like an apartment, like a rental. A rent. We need a <laughs> rental unit in the meantime, right? Um... So as far, your your final thoughts were don't miss don't sleep on Descartes he's a pimp sorry for saying pimp then we talked about all the things we talked about <laughs> it was a good way to elaborate on the vulgar tongue shit um, outside of that I guess I want to say that uh, this is my first time truly going through it all in one sitting I've listened to it in its pieces. Um, and then I've re-listened to parts. I th- like in, in total, I have been over it two times already listening to it, but it's something else going through it with someone else because I don't currently have the discipline to sit in one place for six hours and actually read this and talk about it. And so, Nance, I want to thank you for making this possible. You actually... You've unlocked it as a capacity. And maybe if we do it a few more times, we'll each have the ability to do it on our own. Um, but then again, maybe doing it on your own is a thing of the past. And part of the new internet moment is that you'll always be able to find somebody who's down to read difficult things for a long time. You know, um, I hope so, because I think that uh, this exegetical approach is innovative and using mixed media in a way that kind of defies the original form or its uh, intention. Master's tools. Yeah. We're, we're taking what McLuhan says, you're using the format. The format goes against the medium. He talks about that when he talks about, he uses the example of someone tap dancing on the radio. It, it, it exists. You can find it. You can listen to people tap dancing on the radio. You can imagine what they're doing. But it's a format that is going against the medium. And the same thing is true of educational television. 
right? It's pretty hard to get outside of your mode you go into when you watch a television, which is that of entertainment. And so we're trying to, yeah, use the master's tools um, to build ourselves a nice little apartment it's a digital oasis, and it's a place where we can survive while we develop ourselves an arsenal of uh, things that will hopefully prove useful for building a new, a new thing, you know, eventually. So that's what Theory Underground aims to be. I think that's what you and I have done here. And I look forward to releasing this to, uh, if not the, just the people uh, at Theory Underground. Um, wait, I'm saying that wrong. If not to the larger YouTube uh, channel than just to the people at the at Theory Underground. I'm not sure how it's going to be, but for sure this is going to get uploaded and immediately shared with people who are in the Being in Time course because right now we're reading Chapter Three and it's getting into Section B where it is all about Descartes. And the only thing I wanted to say about Descartes in relation to Being in Time as a way of closing out this stream is to say that. The focus that Heidegger takes is that of Descartes' focus on substance. It's really a substance ontology that he's doing. And he has conflated the kind of substance that we see in the corporeal with the kind of substance that was attributed to God. And so there's a complete conflation of kinds of being, right? So he, but, but, he, but Heidegger points out that Descartes' fixation and is on privileging that which remains, that which stays, that which is repeatable and stays present, stays present at hand, right? So it's like, uh, yes, the world has this sort of skeleton that we can get down to, but there's also something, um, there's some kind of an emergent something that goes above and beyond the what can be seen and taken as present at hand. And the definition of substance is that which needs nothing from anything else. Yet Descartes still believes that all of the substances that we can see on this earth do need something from something else. And they need, it's God. God is the ultimate you know, bookend for all of the other substances, which is kind of undermines that definition of substance because obviously they're not self-standing if they still need God. Um, but the thing is, is everyone, once they've made this division between mind and matter, it becomes kind of easy to go, oh, well, God is maybe over there and doing whatever. And maybe God's not even necessary as a security for, for all of these other substances. You know what? We're going to focus on satisfying our pleasures with these in, this infinity of devices that we've unlocked, this Pandora's box that we've opened, and uh, forget about anything else. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll just pursue pleasure. And this now, of course, there's something good to that. There's something bad in that. There's also something. Um, said to be bad in all of that that is probably not actually bad and that's just by superstitious traditionalists but the the grain of truth I think here from Heidegger is that to reduce everything in the world that is not God or in my thoughts alone to substances um, and to see them all as self-standing entities that are being uh, probed into to have not just, oh, now we understand their essence. No, no, no. We want to understand their essence so that we can extract the hidden potentialities, right? It is obviously um, quite the colonizing imperialist, high modern problematic thing that one could say that it is. Um, and I want to say I'm torn. I'm really torn on that because just because those are bad words or those words have negative associations doesn't mean that I'm going to go, oh, therefore that's all bad then. Hi. Hi. We're almost done. Cool. And just wanted to say hi. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that, um, for instance, we don't know, like what if humans really just are the sort of 
uh, tendrils of, of future capital that aims on in framing the whole universe, right? It would be an unreasonable expectation that would bring nothing but misery to assume ourselves anything other than that, if that's what we actually are. The sex organs of the machine. Yeah. Yeah, the sex organs of the machine. Exactly. And so, if that's actually what we are, then to resist it is to give ourselves misery for no reason. Outside of death drive, outside of jouissance, outside of moral superiority, a sense of righteousness. But, you know, are you trying to be an ascetic monk who punishes, who, who self-flagellates and, 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 you know, fasts for months on end or, 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 or trying to get to the fundamental truth of what, what's real? So, like, for me, it's actually on the table. Are we fundamentally colonizers? As a species, is that in our species being to try to possess the earth, to try to become lords and masters of it, to try to get out into space and to just keep doing it? Are films like Avatar supposed to make us feel bad about who we actually are? Or are they supposed to make us aware that that's not actually who we are and that we actually have some other capacity that we should be honoring, dignifying, cultivating? To me, that's a real question. It's not an easy to put back in its box question. And uh, I don't know. I think most of my friends would come down heavily on the side of, yeah, no, uh, we have some higher capacity. We have something better beyond all of that, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, because you want it to be that way, mm -hmm. right? It's very, very just so. It's very just so. But then, of course, Heidegger's later project is to say that uh, this mode of inframing that reduces everything to that substantive ontology that is about extracting potentialities and whatnot. No, no, that, that whole equipmental analysis and everything, this is just the essence of the modern epoch, but there's been other epochs, and all of these other epochs have their own fundamental modes of world disclosure. And then that would mean, if that's true, there's a lot of other modes of world disclosure that are possible, right? So I don't know. Those are big questions I put on everything. Um, but from a strictly Marxist standpoint, if we were to take Heidegger out of it completely, there's no problem here. For Descartes, for inframing, for technologization, everything's equipment, right? Like that. It's, it's, you, you could argue against those things from a Marxist standpoint, and obviously people do. But I'm just saying the ontology is... Oh. Hmm. It still sees the world as this thing to extract so we can create for ourselves something that will satisfy our appetites and preserve our health. Basically, Marx is just like, well, how can we do Descartes without fucking ourselves? Right. Yeah, that's a big conversation. I I I I kind of wanted to quilt everything with that because I I knew by just focusing on this sort of Heidegger versus Descartes thing, it kind of it's kind of more oh okay hmm got to think about that. But as soon as you bring in Marx and and make that claim, that's a uh, it ups the ante, and mm -hmm. and so if if Marx has a fundamental disagreement with the discourse, it, I I would think it would just be dialectical and historical materialism, right? Descartes doesn't have to think about history; he doesn't have to think about things and their relationality. So he just sees things as discrete entities, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think that that's I see that more as an expansion on that project. I don't see it as a fundamental change in the the basic vision, um, hmm. but it's a, it's a bigger conversation, and I just wanted to uh, open a can of worms here that we won't be able to unravel right now, so that we all have to think about it, and the fact that it tripped Nance up means that you all have to come back for more in the future, because you'll probably write something about it eventually, you know? Hell yeah. You get the last word, man. 
Chiquita bananas, motherfucker. And now, a quick message from our sponsors. Just kidding. This will be neither quick nor from any corporate or state sponsorship. What follows is a description of Theory Underground, a thank you to its patrons, information about the upcoming tour, and three brand new courses that you might want to enroll in. Stay for the whole thing to get promo codes to save on those courses or information about the financial aid scholarship. Theory Underground is a philosophy lecture course gated social media site and publishing house by and for working class intellectuals and renegade academics. The subject matters dealt with at Theory Underground are the most important yet neglected for understanding ourselves, the world, and ways of possibly changing it. Because we have no corporate or state sponsors, only a small band of patrons, Everything in this first year of operation helps immensely. Special thank yous to Bert, Nance, Marilyn, Carl, and Adam for your help in the $50 per month patron tier. If you want to help but the $50 tier is too much, consider donating towards meals and gasoline via Venmo or PayPal. The gasoline is for our countrywide tour of the US, where we aim to meet with supporters of this effort and do events to draw in new people who do not necessarily belong to marketing demographics predetermined by the attention economy. We will be giving lectures, leading discussions, and promoting several brand new books. Our goal is to only go to towns and cities where we have personal invitations from at least one person. We are doing this underground style, which for the hardcore punk scene in the US meant coming for long enough to get to know the area and do multiple events. Not this modern treadmill of a new city each night in an attempt to maximize fame and profit. If you are interested in being a host, guide, or volunteer, then please fill out the form at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash us hyphen tour hyphen 2023. In an attempt to utilize the resources made publicly available, we will be using libraries for most of our events. So if you have a local library card and can reserve a space for us, we would most appreciate it. Alternatively, some of you might have access to pretty epic venue spaces. Just let us know ahead of time. Now for the courses. The three upcoming courses are What is Sex, Digital Literacy and CMT, Critical Media Theory, and Being in Time. All courses at Theory Underground are available after the fact on demand, but some people get a lot more out of doing it live with a cohort. If you are looking to think deeply about the devices we have become reliant on while experimenting with new ways of reclaiming your attention span and relationship with yourself and others, then check out Digital Literacy and Critical Media Theory, a course that is structured to combat the attention economy while strategically using some of its tools to help us gain a freer relationship to our devices. If interested, an introduction to this course will be shared at the end of this video. Just make sure to click on it. The lectures for this course take place on the second Sunday of every month for six months, starting in May. If you sign up at Tier 3, you also get access to the Recovery Group component, which also meets once per month. Enroll with promo code CMTEARLYBIRDYT before May 13th for 20% off. If you are frustrated by the discourse revolving around gender ideology, left and right, then join us in thinking deeper about sex. Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal is joining up with Theory Underground to teach Alenka Zupanchik's What is Sex? One of the most succinct and cutting edge works of theory dealing with the topic. Zupanchik is one of the Slovenian circle's most incisive critics of both naive progressivism and reactionary tendencies when it comes to thinking about the relationship between sex, culture, and subjectivity. If interested, watch Three Reasons to Read What is Sex, which will be shared on screen at the end of this video. What is Sex begins in May and goes through June, meeting for four lecture sessions and, surprise, you will actually get to meet Alenka Zupanchik herself. Use promo code WHATISSEXEARLYBIRDYT before May 7th for 20% off. And just so you know, everybody, don't stress the capitalization. I just make it that way so it's more readable. It's not case sensitive.
Being in Time is one of the most notorious, profound, and difficult works of philosophy from the last 200 years. Its deconstruction of modernity and fundamental challenge to scientism is a prerequisite rite of passage for any thinker who wants to seriously engage with continental philosophy, social theory, or world change. In this course, you will learn about what Heidegger means by being, being in the world, Dasein, being unto death, and so many other crucial developments. But more important than all these buzzwords is just taking on this work itself and wrestling with the text. Doing so will rapidly accelerate your reading comprehension abilities and simultaneously challenge some of your most deep-seated presuppositions. As before, an introductory video to this course is shared on the end screen of this video or can be accessed from the links in the description. Being in Time Division 1 starts in June and ends July 22nd. Division 2 begins August 19th and goes through October. To sign up for Division 1 today, use the promo code BEINGINTIMEEARLYBIRDYT before the end of May for 20% off. If you feel obstructed by the cost of these courses, then we have good news. But before getting into the financial aid info, why are there even price tags at all? Much less tiered pricing. First, because some people just want to audit, whereas others want constructive critical feedback or even one-on-one -on -one sessions. The tiers exist so that you can get the value you are seeking while compensating me, Dave, fairly for the time and energy required. Second, the prices set for these courses aim to make Theory Underground sustainable, meaning that it will bring in enough to pay for the costs of the operation, including my personal bills since I want to be a co-earner in the household when my soon-to-be wife and I start a family. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> Thirdly, People tend to take the things they pay for more seriously, and we want you to get the most out of this experience. With those reasons aside, we do not seek to exclude anyone who is struggling just to get by. We have a financial aid scholarship option for people who are currently between jobs or who live in a country on a cheap currency, like many of you who watch from Thailand, India, Mexico, or Poland. To name a few of the residents of some of the people who have already received financial aid scholarships in the last couple of months. Because I know what trying to study theory under the stresses of housing insecurity and poverty is like, the scholarship was set up during the first month of operation. Simply fill it out at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash scholarship. Last but not least, stay tuned for the Theory Underground app coming soon to an app store near you on your phone. Yeah, and seriously, thank you for listening or watching to this point. And uh, yeah. Thanks. We look forward to taking these courses with you. Bye.